My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases, they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen, but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And, as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange. But if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try, so I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you, just in case they were leaving, so we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed. I've lived in the same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died, and her best friend still lives next door. I'm not sure how long she has left, but this house has always been spooky. It's always cold, it's really old, and I have had a lot of weird experiences for years. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, and my cat staring at random corners. My front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs, and I heard somebody aggressively pacing back and forth in my room, opening and slamming my drawers closed. After a while, you get used to it, 
and you just accept the flow of things. For a while, the activity died down, and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now I'm back, and the activity has spiked. A few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day. I was up at about 4 a.m., facing the wall, trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at a low volume, and the music was playing. But I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting all the air out of her lungs, almost like wheezing. I freaked out, and when I looked, there was no one there. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I heard footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought it was an actual intruder. But nobody was there. I'm scared that perhaps I'm manifesting something. I've never heard a woman before in this house, and the wheezing was so clear. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm scared of losing my sanity. And maybe I am. But my house has always been spooky. And this sudden spike has no real explanation. I'm going to try to smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little bit safer. Hopefully, it works. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. 
Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot, above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty and no one found them for months afterwards, in this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Cat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe... She was one of the ones that never made it out. So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. 
One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it had to be strong. And that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic. So one day, I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife just in case. I open the thing up and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bold and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment, and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that, and we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted, but they don't believe in ghosts or souls very much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happened around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can definitely tell what different sounds you hear. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it in my roommate's room, so I know it isn't some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own, too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, though, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with them, though, the worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff on the couch. Still, I just want to know what I'm living with. Is that too much to ask? Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door, and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because, obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it, for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. 
I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around attics now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious, and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. Just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me, and left me forever. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it? well enough to fool both my sister and I. To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows? In this story, user Mischievous Dagger tells about the haunted house they lived in when they were growing up. Growing up, I always had to move from one place to another. There was this apartment in particular that terrified me. I was about seven or eight when weird stuff started happening. Basically, things would go missing, things got moved, I would hear footsteps in the hallways. 
Once, my dad heard somebody or something small running. He thought it was my sister and called her, but nobody answered. When he came to check on me and my sister, he found us both fast asleep. We always shared a room. One time, my mom baked a cake at night. I don't know why she decided to bake it at night, but she did. At night, we heard muffled chewing sounds. It wasn't my parents, as they had gone to sleep hours before that. Their room was in front of mine, and I would have seen them coming out. The next day, we found half of the cake gone. Another time, my dad bought a GPS. He was very happy with it and put it on the table. The next day, it was gone. My sister and I didn't touch it because my dad was very strict, and we used to be scared of what would happen if we touched his things. My mom was home all day, but she's a busy woman and couldn't have cared less about a GPS. It was gone for a week. Then one day, my dad called my mom asking her where she'd found it. It was right where he had left it, and my mom had never touched it. This freaks me out the most, though. I had a saint. A paper with a saint on it. We call it a saint here. No matter how many times I got rid of the saint, it always came back. I ripped it apart so many times. I shredded it. But it always returned whole to my desk. I no longer live in that house, but every time I walk by it, I get this feeling of dread. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them, because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits, or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in. But I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. 
it wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took, and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered... Just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours. But for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away she knew something wasn't right, and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from, and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom, and she said, No, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it, like, enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave, and apparently I even said, You aren't welcome here. Being a 14-year-old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left, 
and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed, and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered. You know, the portal mirror. With the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared, or stop running, or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep, or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research, and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment, that I created like I said with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. This story comes to us from Reddit user Pineapple Juice. I believe I've told a story from them before, but here are some more tales from their haunted house. I was about nine when this happened. My mom, my sister, and I moved into this old house that was built before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about when it was in its glory days. Everybody in our town said the place was haunted. And that just put signals off in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually shrugged it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched, and I never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it. I begged my mom not to move us in, but yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something like that, but that it skipped a generation. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom, and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men and women and children out of the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich and I saw a shadow man in the hall. I remember that I said hi and then continued making my sandwich. For some reason, I turned and the shadow man was maybe a foot away from me. It took me a moment, but then I ran to my room. Another time, I was sleeping in the living room. I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a man's hand. My parents are divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room. I made a joke that the ghost should move it. A moment passed and then the paper shot across the table and just stopped right on the edge. I jumped up and ran. Another time I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. And not like skin tone and hair color. She was translucent and gray with gouged out eyes and what I assume was blood going down her face. She had a dress on and a coat. I stayed frozen before I finally jumped up and moved past her. My sister shrugged it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was over at my grandparents' house. He saw the same exact thing, but he shrugged it off until he heard about my story. What made it so much weirder is that what he described is the same girl from the window 
and the girl that was in my room. There are lots of little stories about this house, but hopefully you enjoyed those. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall, but it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. Most people would be thrilled to move out of a haunted house, but for Reddit user Kate the Girl Who Dreams, moving out of her haunted house was different. Here's her story. So my boyfriend and I had been living in this house for a few years. He had gone overseas for a little while and then returned. A few months later, and we started to pack our bags for the move into a new place. When we finished packing up the boxes and clothes, my boyfriend did something I didn't expect him to do. He put his hands together and thanked the ghosts for helping us, and then said his goodbyes before leaving the room. He said he felt sad, and it would have been a lie if I had said I didn't feel the same way. For years, activity in that house had rather frightened him. It upset him as well, and a few times it was so bad that he cursed at them within the room as activity occurred, which is why his last action in that room surprised me. I felt that they had been heavily misunderstood, the spirits or whatever. Throughout the years, they had told me a lot about themselves. I had gathered a lot of EVPs and photos from the house. It was a love-hate relationship with them. At times, they would warn me of somebody around me, I don't really know if it was because I was the only tenant who was constantly there, 
and who actually spoke to and got anything on them. One time I was at work, and a customer said that he saw something like a little boy next to me. I started to recall the little boy entity who was in the house I lived in. I did a spirit box session later, and I asked if one of them had followed me to work. The little boy's voice actually responded and said, Yes, only me. I get that it was scary for some, but moving away from the haunted house was also something that felt rather saddening and freeing at the same time. It's nice in the new place. The first day and nothing paranormal had happened. A rather quiet night of sleep. It feels nice, and yet strange at the same time. Oddly lonely, but it's something my boyfriend and I will get used to. The only thing is, my boyfriend brought a piece of jewelry that one of the entities really liked with us, so we'll see how that turns out. But for now, it's quiet and peaceful, bittersweet, but still a nice change from everything that was going on before. Time for newer and better things. A change of scenery. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars Pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me, but every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. 
I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing, where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18 month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this, you get home from a stressful day at school and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open, and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I gonna do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, Upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other. Just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. 
it wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m., and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning, as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door, so when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen, and the fire, and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening, or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school, so I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, so I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. 
Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties, and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliché, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway, that was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I have never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention, and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on, and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me, when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow. And this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. 
The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone, just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully, though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, No doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like, for some reason, she couldn't trust the doctor or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy, that feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight, that feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once, a true scare. I got that today at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, 
and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2 Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom, and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other, and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, Your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then, 
a cutoff. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet, another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge, just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted, but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. And then we heard the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man, so I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. 
About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different. Almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. 
We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch-style house with a three-car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside, where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right. My brother's room followed that. And lastly, my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway, when suddenly, the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors, and my heart began to race. Then, they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there, and it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. Growing up, my family seemed to have a knack for picking haunted houses or haunted locations. Being a military kid was part of that. We got sent to old parts of the bases that we lived in all the time. One was the entire section of houses, which was haunted by what the wives and my mom deduced was some kind of civil war general. There was one base in particular that we lived on twice in my life. This was the second time when I had studied more of the paranormal and it was really interesting. It was a young house, one of the newer ones, which had been built in the span between when we had moved from and back to the base. My old childhood home was long gone, but my mom still thinks the general makes his rounds. This house had something else. Both my mom and I have a knack for telling if a house is haunted. To us, it won't feel empty. A haunting, free house feels more like a vacuum of space. I always get the sense that something will peek around the wall at me when I look through the windows, if something's there. At the house we lived in, I would always get the sensation that something was standing behind me. Like in the horror movies, where you see the ghost behind the character, but then they stand up and it's gone. For fun, I called the ghost Johnny, as in Johnny Rebel, 
seeing as how it was Virginia and probably another Civil War ghost. One night, I was laying in bed, and I heard what sounded like pacing up in the attic area. It was frantic pacing, like someone was unhappy with something or panicked. The activity was ramping up a little, so my mom and I did a mini investigation. We opened up the attic door, and my mom stuck her head up there. Immediately, she called down to my dad, asking if he had put the Christmas decorations up there. He did, and we both shared a knowing look. She took the decorations down, and the activity immediately settled down. When my dad was promoted, we were moved to a new house just a short walk from the old one. My mom came to me one day and said that she had had a dream. In her dream, it was the dining room from the previous house, and a little boy was sitting at the table, dressed in 18th century clothing. She said he looked up and had blood coming from his eyes and mouth. She started yelling at him to leave. She said that he looked startled and said, but I don't want to leave. We both agreed it was an odd dream, and as I thought about it, I looked up yellow fever, knowing that it was a sickness prominent during that time frame that the boy looked to be a part of. I didn't think it would turn up what I found. Not only had there been a yellow fever epidemic in that area in the 1800s, but there were two stages of the disease. If you got the second stage, you would bleed from the eyes and mouth. I told this to my mom, and we came to the conclusion that Johnny was probably not a Civil War soldier, but a little boy who died of a terrible disease and just wanted his space to be left alone. Growing up, my family seemed to have a knack for picking haunted houses or haunted locations. Being a military kid was part of that. We got sent to old parts of the bases that we lived in all the time. One was the entire section of houses, which was haunted by what the wives and my mom deduced was some kind of civil war general. There was one base in particular that we lived on twice in my life. This was the second time when I had studied more of the paranormal, and it was really interesting. It was a young house, one of the newer ones, which had been built in the span between when we had moved from and back to the base. My old childhood home was long gone, but my mom still thinks the general makes his rounds. This house had something else. Both my mom and I have a knack for telling if a house is haunted. To us, it won't feel empty. A haunting, free house feels more like a vacuum of space. I always get the sense that something will peek around the wall at me when I look through the windows, if something's there. At the house we lived in, I would always get the sensation that something was standing behind me. Like in the horror movies, where you see the ghost behind the character, but then they stand up and it's gone. For fun, I called the ghost Johnny, as in Johnny Rebel, seeing as how it was Virginia and probably another Civil War ghost. One night, I was laying in bed, and I heard what sounded like pacing up in the attic area. It was frantic pacing, like someone was unhappy with something or panicked. The activity was ramping up a little, so my mom and I did a mini investigation. We opened up the attic door, and my mom stuck her head up there. Immediately, she called down to my dad, asking if he had put the Christmas decorations up there. He did, and we both shared a knowing look. She took the decorations down, and the activity immediately settled down. When my dad was promoted, we were moved to a new house just a short walk from the old one. My mom came to me one day and said that she had had a dream. In her dream, it was the dining room from the previous house, and a little boy was sitting at the table, dressed in 18th century clothing. She said he looked up and had blood coming from his eyes and mouth. She started yelling at him to leave. 
She said that he looked startled and said, but I don't want to leave. We both agreed it was an odd dream, and as I thought about it, I looked up yellow fever, knowing that it was a sickness prominent during that time frame that the boy looked to be a part of. I didn't think it would turn up what I found. Not only had there been a yellow fever epidemic in that area in the 1800s, but there were two stages of the disease. If you got the second stage, you would bleed from the eyes and mouth. I told this to my mom, and we came to the conclusion that Johnny was probably not a Civil War soldier, but a little boy who died of a terrible disease and just wanted his space to be left alone. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed, just relaxing, and we started to clearly hear footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. Nobody should have been around. I went to check, and nobody was there. Being a believer in Bigfoot, I thought, well, maybe it's something like that. So I looked out the windows and there was no sign of anything anywhere. There was fresh snow on the ground and there were no prints. That's what I really thought was weird. I laid back down and it happened again. So I got up, looked around, and there weren't any prints or anything. It happened a third time after that. I couldn't figure out why there were no prints when we clearly heard footsteps on the front porch. Then we heard this wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a couple of times too, but I chose not to go outside to look. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow, but then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, 
I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped, but as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night. My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense it felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour, and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone, and when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. One day, I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. 
It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back, and the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs, and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street, and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort, all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside, and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but all it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them. Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. I was up near Antelope Lake, California, exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m. with clear skies. Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this run downtown. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery 
and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in, or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turn back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day. It was outside and it was very sunny and bright. So I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened but it definitely wasn't natural. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too. And when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could, and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults 
what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party, and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shined through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house, though. But I still wonder if it might have been him. Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired. So I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m. and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something, but now I was awake and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew 
and he was fast asleep, not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know, the swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swooshing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods, and when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family, though. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boar and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there, you would have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road and then drive about an hour up the mountain off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room, no doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just a part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling really vulnerable. At some point during the trip, my cousin, sister, and I started wandering around outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing the small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but just small hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flows and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and tell that it was a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say be careful what you wish for, because in one lava tube in particular, we found something. We smashed it, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones sitting on long brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but like some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary at all. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to them. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was no physical way that a person could have put those there. And why wouldn't they have gotten destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years at least because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it almost. 
The only explanation we could think of was that it had been an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asks us if anybody went to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, that's weird, he says. I woke up and saw somebody standing at the sliding door, so I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other, horrified. Like, what if it was the person that left the offering, and we totally disturbed it and now we're screwed? We asked for more details. He said that it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man, and that he just stood there at the door, staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and they were mad at me. It could have been a human, sure, but it seemed really unlikely given our location. There were no other cabins or homes built at the hunting grounds, nowhere near them. Either way, I never stayed there again. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C82 is something that we reminisce about often. We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock 
that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door, slowly, to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those bootsteps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006, 
So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey, and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board, and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were going to go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come. Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, 
not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant-infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations. Once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back, in the woods. And the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy.
We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs, with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms. One of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m. since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed, and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m. and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night, thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay, but the cabin gave out significant negative energy and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could and come back late at night just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that ever again. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night and that it was a really serious thing because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, 
and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything. They were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I had an experience with the infamous Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, back in July of 2009. For those not already familiar with the castle, I strongly recommend looking it up. There are a ton of websites that have articles about the history of it, including the known facts, legends, and personal encounters. In July of 2009, my then boyfriend's brother got a free reservation for a guided group tour of Franklin Castle and invited my then boyfriend and myself to tag along with him and his then girlfriend. I've always been fascinated by the castle, so I was pretty excited. I'm not 100% sure that the tour was legal or that the guide even had permission to enter the castle, but regardless, we went. All of the info the guide gave me matched up with everything I had read about it, so at least he was well informed. The guide started outside at 11 p.m. We were in the yard of Franklin Castle, just staring up at it, and all I could keep thinking about was how long I'd wanted to go in there, and I was finally about to. Once everyone that had reserved a spot for the tour arrived, we started. There were about 20 to 25 of us. The guide took us around the outside of the castle, telling us about it, and then we headed in and went to the first floor, which was the basement where the servants' area initially was. Within about 15 minutes of being in there, I started to feel kind of funny, like overloaded. I knew what was coming and tried fighting it off, but I couldn't. I started to get dizzy and things started to get dark. I went and sat on the steps, freezing, pale, and sweating it out. After about five minutes, I was okay to go on. It was just so intense. Things like this have happened to me before when I'm around immense amounts of energy like that. I think the energy of the house was just too much for my sensitivity. We carried on to the second floor, then the third floor. At this point, I was standing around with a couple of other people, listening to the guide tell us about the floor and any stories surrounding it. All of a sudden, I hear these light footsteps coming from above. I thought it was just my imagination or maybe somebody went up there ahead of the guide. Then the girl next to me asks the guy next to her, did you hear that? One of them asked the guide if anyone had gone upstairs yet, and the guide confirmed that nobody had ventured to the fourth floor yet. Then we went to the fourth floor and wrapped up the tour. Part of me couldn't wait to get out of there, but another part of me wanted to look around some more. So I followed my boyfriend's brother and his girlfriend down to the third floor, 
then the second floor, and finally the first floor. I was walking behind my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend through the kitchen area, and she stopped in the doorway in the living area. I was standing behind her, and I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness, to say the least. I got out of there right away. I made my way outside and waited for the others. The tour was nice, and the castle was amazing. It was all torn up, though. Between the constant attempts at remodeling, the fire, and its age in general, it was in need of a lot of work and completely unlivable at the time. The guide stated that there were all these plans for it, but most never happened. It's been sold again since then. From what I've read online, the current owners have their own plans, but do not have any interest in doing tours. Only time will tell what's in store next for the castle. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the ten of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost ten years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, 
that I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick-or-treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old, bendy, spooky road you take up to the house, and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. This scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around but it still freaks me out to this very day. The Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. 
Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15 and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me, and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power Therefore, there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately. So, naturally, I turned on the EMF. It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable strong force pushed me into T. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday, but those stories are for another time. Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins, 
People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the king never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel. In the summer of 2019, I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself, 
harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like, no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshiping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle, and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day. The sun made the occasional appearance, but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves, which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children. And we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire, with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows? Maybe I'll have more stories then. I was a guest at Abbey Glen Castle in Ireland on October 28th through 30th of 2019. It was a stay for my birthday. We arrived and were overwhelmed with the kindness and hospitality we experienced. We arrived late, so we dropped our bags in our room and headed for dinner in the restaurant with the piano. Our table was adorned with the Ireland and American flags a special touch for us as your international guest, I suppose. We enjoyed our dinner, and just after dessert, we were treated to a piano serenade. As we prepared to leave, if memory serves me correctly, the piano player, dressed in a nice suit, offered to take our picture. As we left the restaurant, we were handed a great picture documenting our trip. We retired to our room, ready to sleep after a long day of travel from Derry up north. That night, we struggled to be made comfortable. Both my partner and I felt a strange presence in the room. Neither of us mentioned it to the other upon awakening. But shortly after breakfast, while shopping, we compared our strange feelings. We were both shocked that the other had felt this presence. Though we had booked the stay for two nights, we politely returned our keys to the front desk and decided to forego our second night and leave to Limerick. Fast forward three years since returning. My partner has displayed the picture in our room. We have looked, passed, and gazed at the picture no less than a hundred times, always with fond memories of Ireland. 
But a few weeks ago, with a normal glance, she saw an image in the picture that clearly looks like a ghost or apparition as the third party to our dinner picture. We were both kind of freaked out by this sighting. Maybe it was there all along. Maybe it's our imagination. Maybe it's real. Who knows? We have shown the picture to numerous confidants and simply asked, what do you see? Without fail, they all see the third party in our couple picture. I visited Dudley Castle in England today with a friend, a very historically significant place, and apparently very haunted. The main attraction is the zoo, Dudley's zoological gardens and castle, but one of the enclosures, the castle creatures part, is within a section of the castle itself. There's a room that displays the history of the castle, and as we were reading the information, we both felt sort of uneasy as if somebody was behind us. Note that the zoo was very empty today. My friend jumped away, saying that somebody had touched her arm. We stood for a second and moved on through the exhibition, feeling a little shaken, but in a sort of way excited too. As we nearly approached the bat enclosure, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, and a third shadow appeared behind us, as if somebody was striding toward us. We had seen absolutely nobody inside the enclosures, and the layout of the building means that the noises often echo throughout the tight halls, but there was nobody there. We quickly ran out of the enclosure, terrified but still kind of excited. Something else to note is that my mother has experienced some potentially paranormal activity in this building, specifically inside of the bat enclosure. As she went to leave, she backed away and said sorry to someone who was behind her previously, who apparently had disappeared. Both of my parents were adamant that there was somebody there that she nearly ran into, and then disappeared the second she turned to apologize. Apparently, these are common experiences. As I said, Dudley Castle is apparently very haunted, so I'm just curious if anybody else has ever had an experience there or if there are any potential explanations, paranormal or otherwise. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squires is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it. The lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle, and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. 
then I remembered. Nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera. One friend was recording video on his phone and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside, that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark, but on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs and on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She said she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it. This happened a few years ago, but now it came back to my memory because of something I read recently. 
At the time of this, I was working for a private security company, and we were working at an event at Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. There were probably 10 to 15 of us scattered across the darkened castle in winter. It was really early in the morning, probably about 1 to 2 a.m., and a colleague and I picked the short straw of doing perimeter walk, where there is no light, not even from street lights nearby. So we have to do laps of the entire castle along the wall with the moat on our right-hand side in near darkness, bar the torches that we were allowed to carry. As we approached our second lap near the longest stretch of the wall, I noticed footsteps in the darkness that weren't ours. We stopped a few times to check out this noise, but we could never pin it down to anything. It could have been an animal moving in the darkness, I suppose, but it just sounded strange. The next thing happened all within a few seconds, not really fast enough for us to respond. In the darkness, I noticed a figure of a man walking toward me. He was walking up from the moat to the right of us. As he approached, he said something along the lines of, Right Greeley, then walked straight past us into the solid 12-foot rock wall. In a complete state of shock, my colleague and I just confirmed with each other what we'd seen, that somebody had walked into a solid wall and vanished. Not gone over, not walked past, but walked directly into. We raised the alarm for an intruder just in case, but after a site-wide search, we never found anything of this guy who had walked up the slope. Despite my experience, I'm still hesitant to use the word haunted. Many people have asked me what I think caused what happened, and I don't have an answer. I can describe it, but I cannot explain it. Therefore, I tend to avoid the usage of words and terms that attempt to explain the phenomenon in any manner. I'm a man of science. I'm not religious or spiritual. However, I cannot simply ignore what happened to me. Here's my story. It was 2009 to 2010. When I met the woman who would later become my wife, we started renting a small house within the city limits. I was in the process of beginning a new job, and circumstances prevented me from staying in the house with her for the first week. Each morning, we would talk on the phone during my drive to work. She explained to me that each morning, she had struggled to sleep the previous night. She described sounds that were keeping her awake, like someone running through the house, objects falling off the kitchen counter, doors slamming. After three days, I made arrangements to go ahead and move in with her. I was convinced that somebody was breaking in and harassing her. She was convinced, however, that she was sharing the house with a ghost. I took off work the third day. It took me about eight hours to get everything moved in. I was taking a break on our bed when I felt somebody or something tug on my pant leg. I remained motionless, hoping that it would happen again. After a few seconds, it did happen again, much more aggressively this time. I felt a hand firmly placed on my leg just before it grabbed my jeans and started pulling. She was on the bed next to me and nobody else was with us. We had no pets as they weren't allowed. I immediately started having the same experiences throughout the night as she had described over the phone. It was like somebody was destroying our kitchen, but nothing was ever out of place. There was running as she described, which sounded like a smaller person, perhaps a child. I woke up one night to somebody standing next to my bed. I heard giggling, and then the individual bolted out of the room as I turned my head. It was too dark to notice any features. Over the course of eight months, many unusual things happened. 
To make a long story short, I'll skip ahead to my last experience, and perhaps the most frightening. I was alone in the house, waiting to join an online seminar. I was sitting on my couch with my laptop on the coffee table ahead of me. I heard the back door slam shut, and a person begin running through the house. These footsteps were heavier, and this person was moving quickly. Given the design of our small house, this person was running in my direction. I shot up and ran out of the house, and I didn't stop until I reached the street, and that's where I remained until my wife returned. As I was standing by the street, I was looking back into the house. A balloon from a recent party made its way from the kitchen into my bedroom, then back into the kitchen moments later. It felt like I was watching somebody search for me, going room to room, all while holding this balloon. This was the last thing that happened to us, and it stopped after that. We continued living there for another four years. I would give anything to experience it again. I would try to be less afraid, and I would approach the situation more analytically. My wife, on the other hand, was never afraid of it. Unfortunately, my wife passed away a few years ago, but I know she would have enjoyed sharing her story. I still drive by that house occasionally, and nobody has ever moved in. When Redditor O.G. Wiz was 15 years old, they lived in a basement apartment at their parents' house. What happened there stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Here's the story. My parents bought their house in 1996. The family that owned it before us renovated the basement to be an apartment complete with its own kitchen and bathroom. So obviously, at 15, I lived in the basement apartment. I stayed there until 2013. I had this TV stand that I used for storage space. It sat next to the bathroom door. It had a couple of old computers on it, some boxes of random junk, and a ton of DVD cases. They were all empty cases. I had separate storage for the discs themselves, but I had a thing about not letting go of useless items, apparently. In the living room, which I didn't really use much, there were a couple of old couches. The family cat preferred to hang out there on one of the couches. One night, probably around 11 p.m., I went to use the washroom. The cat was on the couch, and no one else was home. I opened the door to leave the bathroom, and suddenly a DVD case shot from the TV stand and hit the wall across the room. At the same moment, the cat jumped up, arched its back, and started hissing. Then the cat ran upstairs. That was the only time that this happened to me in that basement. And it's the only time that I ever saw that cat, who recently died at the age of 22, hiss or arch his back at anything. I've only had a few experiences in my life that I would consider paranormal. I don't really much believe in this stuff, to tell you the truth, but I could not figure out any other explanation for the DVD case flying across the room, or for the cat to act so out of character. I don't know what it was, but I believe that something was there that night. Reddit user Jerry111165 moved into a house 20 years ago. Little did he know, it had one extra occupant. Here's his story. 20 or so years ago, when our three girls were three little girls, two, four, and six, we lived in a house in Massachusetts. We shared a driveway into the woods with a neighbor, a good guy. He told us that before we moved in, a little girl that had lived in her wheelchair had somewhat recently died from leukemia. 
I couldn't even imagine. Those poor parents. We lived there for seven years. After we had been there a year or two, we started having occurrences late at night, between midnight and 2.30 in the morning. The two older girls shared a bedroom and slept in a bunk bed that I had made. My oldest was in the top bunk. My youngest had her own room. So late at night when the house was dead quiet, the girls' toys would start playing by themselves. Some would light up. Some would make whatever noises the kids' toys do. This started happening a lot, and man, it freaked my wife and me out. We'd be sleeping, and suddenly the kids' toys would start moving around and playing sounds by themselves. We just knew that it was the little girl who had died from leukemia. She just wanted to play, and she did come back and play. Our house was way off the road. Very long, dark driveway. No one came out there, and especially not at night. One night, I was home alone, and somebody knocked at the front door. I didn't think anything of it, and I ran to answer the door. When I got to the top of the stairs, just a few feet from the door, I stopped. I just knew that there was nobody there. My hair stood up. It really scared me. The toys playing by themselves went on for several months. One night, we woke up to my oldest daughter shrieking. Her bunk bed was tall, so when she was sleeping on her back, it was kind of close to the ceiling. I mean, kind of. You know what I mean. She was screaming bloody murder. I think she was probably around six years old. She had woken up and said that a little girl was floating inches above her head, right up against the ceiling, looking down on her. She just wanted to play. When she was just 11 years old, Reddit user SimpleLeaf96396's dad rebuilt their home. However, brand new as it was, he didn't stop something uninvited from checking out her new bedroom. Here's the story. I grew up as an only child. My parents had my sister when I was 11. Before she was born, my dad rebuilt our bungalow into a huge two-story house. Hence, no one had died in my new bedroom. I'm in my mid-twenties now, but when I was around seven, I started getting a lot of nightmares about the concept of death. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting up again. By the age of ten, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced that something not someone, but something, was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room. The one that my dad had built. My dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He had tried to turn it into a fun den area for me, but I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued until I was about 12, when I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked just fine. That was until it got dark outside, and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting or typing to someone. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I would go out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, and he said that it must be damaged and he bought me a new one for my 13th birthday. He believes in ghosts, but he couldn't explain what was happening in that room that he had built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was about 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This seemed to work, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. 
I slept fine, my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones, and I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back. That same corner, that same feeling, the same dark energy, the same creature. Except now I have an image of it, burned into my memory, despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape, but very muscular, and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it. Almost wolfish, but without a snout. It snarls and glares, dark red eyes with big black pupils, and it has horns as well. Big horns curved back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. But there you go. That's my story. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter to me. But I don't go into that room anymore when I see my parents. Not even in the daytime. This story is a fascinating tale from Artistic Rip 8184 about a very peculiar patron that entered their restaurant. Here's their story. So this happened a while back, and it still creeps me out. I'm hoping that this counts as a paranormal experience, because it was the most realistic one I've ever had. I've heard that the dead can visit us in human form, but I've always wondered if that's true. I was waiting tables at the restaurant I worked at one afternoon, and stopped by to greet a table that had an older woman and a man sitting together. When I spoke to them, the man was looking down, so I didn't notice him right away. The woman ordered her beverage, and I asked the man what he would like to drink. He looked up at me and said, I'll take a Diet Pepsi. All I could do was stare. My dad passed away 26 years prior when I was a kid, but I swear on my life that the man sitting in front of me was the living, breathing version of him. Same face, same height and build, same voice, even the same gold tooth. I don't have a lot of good memories of my dad, because he was super abusive to me and my mom, so I had a whole lot of emotions hit me all at once. When I could finally speak, I managed to stammer out, Oh, okay, I'll be right back. I took their order and checked on them a couple of times. When they paid, the man smiled at me with this twinkle in his eye that made me feel like it was my dad. He thanked me, but when he did, he didn't say the name listed on the receipt or on my name tag, my given name. Instead, he used my nickname, the name that only family uses, but I had never told either of them that name at all. This story comes to us from Redditor Bowler Beautiful 5804. In it, the author recounts living in an over 100 year old house built on top of a cemetery. Here's the story When I was in university, I lived in an older house that was built beside a church. The house was over 100 years old, but I'm unsure of its actual age. I lived in the basement and had a few housemates. We didn't know at the time that it was built on a cemetery. That was discovered shortly after I moved out. Weird things would happen in the house, but I'm still not sure if it was haunted or just purely coincidental. I would hear footsteps above my room late at night, and when I would ask the next day who was in the kitchen at 2am, my housemates would say that they never came downstairs at all. My one housemate had a cat, and one day we were in the kitchen. The back door opened by itself, and the cat walked in. 
I did see what I believe was a shadow figure in that house. I had a bookshelf beside my bed, and had a Buddha statue on one of the top shelves. In the middle of the night, there was a huge bang, and when I woke up, I saw a black figure jump from the bookshelf to the floor and run out of the room. The shelf with the Buddha figure had fallen off the bookshelf, and the Buddha had smashed to pieces on the floor. I thought at first maybe it was my housemate's cat that had somehow knocked it off the shelf. But the next morning, when I told my housemate what had happened, he said the cat had been locked in their room with them all night. Shortly after that, I moved out. The house was owned by the church, and there was a parking lot in the backyard. The church was adding an addition, and had started construction, and had started digging up the parking lot behind the house. During the construction, human remains were found, which obviously halted the construction until it was determined why the remains were there. It was found that before the house existed, a small cemetery had been on that land. At least 30 skeletons were found, and nobody was sure if they were ever able to determine the identities or why they were buried there. For some reason, when the house was built, it was decided to build on top of the cemetery, and the records of the cemetery's existence was either lost or forgotten over time. I'm not sure if the other housemates had experiences there. It was a creepy house, and I remember them mentioning hearing things at night and not liking to stay there alone. Like I said, I don't know if it was haunted or what, but weird things definitely happened there. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Pole Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, appealing mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. 
When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out, and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door, though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. But nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead, silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend, a man's name beginning with the letter M, Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was.
So I visited Dorset this spring, and I stayed in a hotel with my partner. I believe it was room 18 or 19. It's a stunning hotel with the most beautiful rooms. However, I don't think I'll be returning in a hurry. The first night, I kept seeing someone standing in the bathroom doorway. I brushed it off as my eyes seeing something that wasn't really there. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, and I simply assumed that I was seeing the back of the toilet seat. Even though what I had seen came nearly to the top of the door. I didn't say anything about it the next morning, not wanting to completely freak out my partner, as you do. I did test, however, and from where I was laying in bed, you really couldn't see the toilet, or the toilet seat, as it was hidden behind the wall. So what the heck was I looking at? Night two, I shut the bathroom door completely, and I made sure that it wouldn't unlatch and swing open in the night by giving it a good rattle in its frame. It didn't budge. Awesome, I thought, we can sleep in peace. Then we got hot and heavy and fell asleep. I watched some TV and turned it off and went to sleep too. I woke up some hours later to find the door completely wide open. I got up, went to use the bathroom, closed the door behind me again and went to sleep. The next morning, my partner was already up, so I can't tell you if the door was open or not again and they didn't say anything, so neither did I. I just assumed that they had forgotten to shut it when they went to go to the bathroom. No big deal. Whatever. We went out for the day. I think we went to a raptor place and saw a bird show, which was really cool, actually. When we came back to change before we headed out for a meal, we entered the room to find the wardrobe doors were wide open, and so was the bathroom door, again. I'll put in here that we always locked the room door behind us and put a little sign on the door stating that the room didn't need any refreshing, so no one else should have been entering that room except us. Nothing else was out of place. Nothing was moved or missing. Just doors open that shouldn't have been. The wardrobe, I assume, was Victorian or around that period. It was solid wood, well-built, and extremely heavy and stiff. It was awkward to open and close the rightmost door. It seemed like they only just fit together when they were closed. And not only that, but the leftmost door was actually latched shut from the inside, which I left well alone, as it didn't need to be open for any reason anyway. Night three, same thing as night two. I wake up to find the bathroom door open. I just leave it. Too tired to get up and close it, as it had been a long day and I'd been having a drink or two in the bar downstairs. I ended up actually having the worst night's sleep that night, with nightmares thrown in there for good measure. Coincidence? I don't know. When I got up in the morning, my partner proceeds to tell me that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw somebody pass by the door inside the bathroom from right to left, and that they were darker than the room itself and nearly as tall as the door. Nope. No thank you. The funny thing is, we were visiting with family, staying in another room, and they wanted to cut the trip short and leave a day early, but they didn't say why. We agreed because we wanted to leave as well, and we didn't really fancy spending another night in that room. So after breakfast, we packed up and got the heck out of there. I'm not a religious person. I don't even think I believe in God, but... As I was packing, I was praying and saying in my head that whoever or whatever it was had to stay there and couldn't follow us home. Hopefully, it listened. Hoth is a little village near Canterbury and Sturry, out on the old marshes that were once the Wansom Channel. A few years ago in 2014, my landscaping company were called to a job in a beautiful house there. The house was a converted barn and had been bought by the new owners who wanted some work to be done there before moving in, as is often the case. So the first step was to visit the property and take a look to come up with a price for the job. 
There was a great deal of land surrounding the property, with extensive gardens that had fallen into a state of disrepair. After visiting the property, I returned, saying that the place gave me the creeps, and that although it was empty and isolated several hundred yards from the next dwelling, it felt like I was being watched. Obviously, everybody laughed at me. I priced the job, which was a big one, and would need us to be on site for about five days, and forgot about the whole thing. As it turned out, we were given the contract for the garden clearance and various tree works, and we booked in for a few weeks' time. When we arrived on site, there was a crew of builders there already, who were working inside the house, and had been living there for a couple of weeks while they carried out the renovations. When we arrived, we said our hellos, and John asked what they thought of the house. The reply was, It's a lovely place, but it's haunted as hell. We laughed and asked why they thought that, and they told us that all night they could hear banging coming from empty rooms. Their tools were being moved around. They heard whispering, and one had even received a phone call from a distant voice that he couldn't understand, from a number that was just all zeros. He showed us the call record to prove it on his mobile phone. Interested, but still not entirely convinced, we got on with our work. Joe told us that the back courtyard garden gave him the willies, but apart from that, day one was uneventful. On day two, it was quiet in the morning. Then, in the afternoon, I went inside for coffee. While I was there, there were knocking sounds coming from one of the back rooms. Nobody was in there, but it could well have been someone in one of the garden areas knocking against the wooden walls from outside while doing some kind of job. But then there was a sound like wallpaper being unrolled or a poster falling off of a wall, something like that. It came from the hall. Then out of the hall, a shadow shot through the kitchen and out the front door. I was alone in the house at the time. And after looking from every angle, the only way the shadow could have been cast was by the kitchen lights in the middle of the room. But there was nothing there to cast it. I was starting to become a believer. On day three, Paul, one of the builders, was having an argument with somebody on the phone. When he hung up, he said, I can't believe that. The driver from the skip company says he won't come here to pick up the skip unless we can promise that there's somebody on site to meet him, because he reckons that he saw something here when he dropped the skip off before we got here, and he says that it's definitely haunted. When he did arrive, he said that when he dropped the skip off the first time, he knew the place was empty, but he saw somebody moving around in there. And while he was unloading the skip, the radio in his lorry came on with a loud load of static. Day four was quiet, apart from the knocking and banging, which we'd all gotten used to by then, even though it was louder than before, and definitely not one of us messing about. On day five, a guy turned up to put in a new TV aerial and that involved some wiring being fitted in the back room where most of the noises had come from. A few hours in, he was having coffee with everyone else in the kitchen, and he said that he'd be glad when he was done because that room was creeping him out. He said that he was sure he kept hearing somebody walking around in there, but there was nobody inside the house, let alone in that room. The final thing that happened while we were working there was that another contractor turned up to do some light fittings. He parked outside the house. While he was in there, his van radio came on blaring with really loud static, just like the skip driver had said happened to him when he was there before. A few weeks after we'd been there, the new owners had moved in, and John and I went over to visit them and settle up the bill. John was curious and asked the owner if he was enjoying living there. He obviously read between the lines a little bit, Maybe he'd already been asked about the place by one of the other contractors, and he responded by saying, It's a beautiful house, but I must say, it takes on a completely different feeling at night. It's not such a nice place after it gets dark. We returned to work there a couple more times on smaller jobs, but as the clients were living there full time by then, we didn't spend much time in the actual house itself. On one occasion, we were in the kitchen in the evening, having a cup of tea with the owner, when from the back room there was a huge crash, like a wardrobe being pushed over. The owner just put his finger up and whispered, Please just pretend you didn't hear that. 
We don't want the children to be scared. We do a lot of work on repossessed houses, no pun intended, and houses going through probate. So I have visited a lot of empty properties, often where the owner has recently died. And in over 10 years, I have never been creeped out by a place like I was that one. For a couple of days, I have been hearing footsteps in the middle of the night, loud enough to wake me up. When I wake up, they suddenly disappear. This could be an auditory hallucination, but I'm damn sure I heard it. Spots in my house also suddenly turn cold when I'm home alone, like the kitchen. Also, my television has occasionally been flickering on and off for a couple of days. My two dogs also keep barking at random spots in my house, and they seem agitated a lot. I can't get them to stop, even if I offer them treats. There's also just a terribly weird feeling in my own house. I don't have any audio or video evidence. If I get some, I'll let you know. But it's so freaking scary. I can't live in my own home without fear anymore. I'm usually skeptical when it comes to spirits and demons, but this has really got me convinced that something very odd is going on. There's no past history of paranormal activity in my house. No one's messed around with a Ouija board. I'm just so scared. I can't sleep or go places in my house without turning the lights on. If you have any idea what's going on, please let me know. So this was when I was about 16. My family and I moved into a registered historic home that was 240 years old. It was dated around when our town was founded. When you first walked into the house, you felt it. It was like an ominous cloud that hung over everything. The first experience I ever had was in the parlor that used to hold wakes in it. I was sitting at the computer, we had converted it into an office, and I kept hearing loud noises directly above me. The room above me was my bedroom, and I was the only one home. I looked around to make sure the dogs were with me and that they weren't tearing anything apart. I initially ignored it and it subsided. After about an hour, it started up again, but with more violence. It sounded like somebody had moved my entire wardrobe across the bedroom floor. I ran up the staircase, but by the time I got to the second landing, the sound stopped. I barged into my room and it was completely silent. No furniture had been moved. The second event was a lot more terrifying. It was about 3 a.m. I woke up to the sound of grown men arguing outside of my bedroom door. The catch? The only male that lived with us was my 14-year-old brother. I jumped out of my bed and flung the door open, trying to catch it. Nothing. I got back in bed after I stupidly locked the door as if that was going to stop anything, and it started again. This time I went to my grandmother's and brother's separate rooms. They were both asleep, and every TV was off. The toilet down the hall flushed itself, and I ran back to my room. The third event is when we decided to move. My brother was taking a shower upstairs. While he showered, a clear, perfect imprint of another set of feet appeared in front of him. Small things had happened in between those events, but these really stood out the most. I'm so glad we don't live there anymore. When I was pregnant, my kid's father and I stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the 1840s, which to me was super interesting 
until my kid's father, I'll call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy for the middle of the day, and when I looked, he was right. It gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room, and at night, we could see through the kitchen, and it was as if the stairs became this dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they really believed in ghosts, and the husband was an abusive drunk and drug addict, so they had enough problems. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly had serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because of the shadows. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times and seeing genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye, or even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long, spindly legs running, I was a little on edge. Every time you would look at these things, they would disappear. A few times, I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye, and I would look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most, because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person, and sometimes nothing being there, but other times you expect it to disappear, and it would in fact be a person. It was so weird and unsettling. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room, you would want to look over your shoulder into the doorway, as if someone was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out, considering that I slept right near the doorway, and would often get a feeling of someone coming toward me. One day, Brian and I were the only two in the entire house. Facing one another about two feet away, face to face, we were talking as we usually do. Directly in the middle of us, we heard a woman's voice say, Shh. I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and said, No. Did you? Then we laughed it off, as we were clearly talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. They told us they assumed that the black voids that ran on the floor were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved, like they were being pushed by a breeze or something. He chalked it up to being stoned or tired. There was no breeze. The wife told me that when they first moved in there, her son would see a man in a hat, but assumed that it was just his imagination. How could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everybody, as it was right where it felt like somebody was walking by that door frame at you in the living room. One night I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in, and to my horror, all three dogs were inside the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house, and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything, I don't really know. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations that I had with one of the roommates was really interesting. The roommate was renting a back bedroom. It was down a long hall at the very end, the only door in this isolated hallway. I told her about Brian and I hearing the shh directly in the middle of us. She explained that she hears the same exact thing in the hallway. If she and her son were getting too loud, they would hear a woman say shh. They were sure that it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway, but I'm not so sure. I'm pretty sure that the house I babysit at is haunted. 
The parents were going to a party, and they were supposed to be home at around 9, but rang me saying that they wouldn't be back until midnight, so it was my job to put the kids to bed, which I had no problem with. They are the sweetest, most well-behaved kids I've ever met. It got to 9.30, and the kids brushed their teeth, got their books, and went to bed. I tidied up, sat down, did a little homework, and then FaceTimed with my friend. This is a religious family, and there are crosses on some of their walls. I heard what sounded like someone knocking on the front door, but it was about 10.15, and the parents usually message me when they're almost home. And, of course, they have keys, so I automatically suspected that it wasn't them. I checked, but there was nobody at the door, so I just sat back down on the couch and got carried away talking to my friend again. Then, the same three knocks. They have guinea pigs, and I started to suspect that it was those guys nibbling on the cage or just messing around, so I went and checked, but they were in their little home things. I still believed it was them, but then, as I was leaving the room, I saw the wooden cross that was nailed at its head on the wall lift from the bottom and drop three times, knocking three times. It was as though some force was lifting the bottom half that wasn't nailed and dropping it like a door knocker. I just froze, and my friend was like, oh, what, what, what was that? I tiptoe ran back into the living room. I have no idea what caused that. I started to think maybe it was one of the kids jumping from upstairs, causing the walls to shake or something. But the cross is on the wall between the kitchen and the dining room, and directly above was the parents' room and the bathroom. So unless they were in their parents' room or the bathroom jumping up and down in sets of threes, it doesn't really make sense. Plus, they were asleep. Perhaps coincidentally, the homework that I was doing was philosophy which can be very anti-religion and sometimes anti-God. In fact, I was actually writing an answer to the question, is the Western idea of God illogical? Probably not the most respectful homework to do in the house of religious people, but hey, I don't know what it was. A mocking? God showing me he was real? Maybe not. I can't explain it to this day. When I was a kid, I would always feel watched from a very young age, around six or seven. I would refuse to sleep alone for this reason, and I insisted on sleeping with my brother or mum. If I was forced to sleep alone, which was the case most of the time, I would stare into my room and observe the details for hours before finally falling asleep. My first experience came when I was around eight. I went to bed like I would on a normal night. My mom would pretend to sleep next to me and keep me company so that I would fall asleep. When she didn't do this, I would place a large body pillow next to me so that I wouldn't feel watched. I woke up in the middle of the night one night. I would always wake up at around two. But on this night, next to my bed was an old woman that I could see through. I could see all the details, though. She had wrinkles, probably around 80 years old. She had curly hair and wore a buttoned sweater with stripes. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran out the door, next to her. My dad picked me up and let me sleep in their bedroom. It would only escalate from here. Almost every night from this point on, I would see a cloud shaped like a human standing next to my door when I woke up in the middle of the night. Keep in mind, I would always wake up at around 2 a.m., with no exceptions. It would disappear after 30 or 60 seconds, and kind of just dissolve and float up into the roof. I could move and speak, so it was not sleep paralysis. One night, it spoke with me in a woman's voice. I was sleeping when I woke up to the voice saying, Hi. I thought it was my mom, so I hesitated to even open my eyes at first. But then, I was greeted by the figure standing at the door once more. I tried saying a few words, but no response. If I had to guess, I saw this figure at my door every night for months, maybe years. The vibes I got every time I went face to face with it were terrible. I was absolutely horrified. 
It's hard to explain, but it felt like the thing in front of me was evil. If I remember correctly, it was not 100% stationary. The mass or body of the thing was moving slightly, sort of hovering in position, if that makes sense. My brother reported a female voice whispering, good night, in his ear one night as well, which is super scary. At this stage, sometimes things would fall down in my room at night, and my parents would come search it but find nothing. My brothers, one remains skeptical till this day, started reporting heavy footsteps when they brushed their teeth at night. They would go and check, find nothing, go back to brushing their teeth, then hear the footsteps and repeat. Hearing heavy breathing right next to me at night also happened a few times, stopping when I turned on the lights. One night, where my brother and I were relaxing in the living room, we spotted a figure walking back and forth, right outside our window, maybe five meters away on the grass. It was a summer night, so it was fairly bright. It was shaped like the person I always saw, but this figure was black and not the cloudy type that I would always spot. It walked back and forth for minutes. We called our dad over, but he couldn't see it. Only my brother and I could. One particular incident made me call it quits and beg for help. I was sick and home from school. My mom was going to the bakery, so I would be home alone for a little while, which I hated. I went to my brother's room and started playing some Counter-Strike. After a few minutes, a large sculpture that my brother had made at school fell down onto my face. I got scared, opened the door, and across the hallway I saw the cloud figure at my own room, exactly the same spot I saw it every night. This time, it moved quickly toward the kitchen, at a pretty fast pace. I jumped out the window and waited for my mom to come home outside. I had never been that afraid. I get chills just remembering it. At this point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I begged for my parents to find someone that could help. My parents, who had witnessed nothing alarming, didn't share the same desire, but agreed to do it. I could not be present when he was here. I was, quote, too young. But he claimed that three entities lived in the house and gave us some details as to why they were present. From that point on, I never experienced it again. I wouldn't feel watched anymore. I could sleep alone, and I never saw anything again. I don't know what the hell that was, but I'm getting curious now, now that some years have passed. So, if anyone has any ideas as to where these things come from or what I experienced beyond what I've told you and what I know, I would be anxious to hear it. Shortly before becoming pregnant with my second child in 2008, we moved into a 100-year-old mansion that had been renovated into separate apartments. I had never had any sort of paranormal experience before living here, so most of what I experienced I brushed off or made excuses for, but some things were really hard to ignore. I would frequently see shadows or movements out of the corner of my eye hear whispers that very distinctly sounded like they were coming from inside my apartment, and would often have lights turn on and off by themselves. One night in the middle of summer, I was about seven months pregnant at the time, I was struggling to get comfortable in bed, but finally settled on my back with my hands above my head. No sooner had I started to relax that I felt a cold hand on my stomach. It took me a moment to realize that the hand was coming from the wrong direction. It was as if somebody standing beside my bed had their hand on my stomach. I immediately sat up and looked around, but there was no one there other than my ex who was facing the opposite direction. I told him what happened, and he told me it was probably just the baby kicking and I was mistaken. What I felt was definitely not that. Shortly after this, I started to see a yellow flowing dress with small flowers. I don't really know how to explain it. It was like I constantly would see the tail end of someone walking into a room or down the hall. I never got to see the whole person wearing it, just the back of the flowing dress. 
Every time I saw it, I didn't feel scared, but peaceful. After the birth of my second child, we moved into a bigger apartment across the hall in the same house. I immediately noticed the atmosphere felt different, like the air felt almost heavy. The second night there, I could hear voices on the baby monitor, thinking maybe it was picking up voices from the apartment above ours, and being the nosy person I am, I laid there with my eyes closed and the monitor pressed to my ear, listening hard, trying to pick up what was being said. Suddenly, I could hear a door in my son's room slowly creak open through the monitor. I stopped breathing, trying to listen closely, thinking I was going to hear my son's tiny voice or small footsteps. Instead, it sounded like somebody with heavy, steel-toed boots on was running down my hallway, into my room, and then they launched themselves onto the bottom of our bed. The whole bed shook. I felt paralyzed. My ex started screaming, thinking that we had an intruder, but there was no one there. We tried to rationalize what had happened. Maybe a spring got caught in the mattress during the move and happened to release at that exact moment. And maybe the footsteps I heard were actually from upstairs. All I know is that from that point on, I was absolutely terrified to stay in the apartment at night without a lot of lights on. There was also a weird room or storage area attached to my son's room that gave me the absolute creeps, and I could never get the door to stay closed. I put a hook and eye lock at the top of the door, and almost every day I would go in and the lock would be off and the door would be open. We never used that room, and my son was only three at the time. Finding the door open always gave me anxiety, like that feeling you get right before something bad happens, which is such a weird thing to say about a random empty room, but it's true. Not one second from the time I moved into that apartment until I moved out a few months later did I ever feel comfortable. I always felt like I was being watched. After moving out, I met multiple people that lived in that house, and every single one talked about all the weird and unexplainable things that happened while they lived there. This is the only place that I have ever lived that I've had weird, creepy, or otherwise unexplainable experiences. But that was the house that made me a believer. Let me start by saying that this has been going on for over a year now. Some days are really bad. Some days, absolutely nothing happens. I live in a rural area. I have lived in this house since my son was two years old, until be 16 in May. Nothing at all happened or felt weird up until about three years ago. I was sitting on my patio in the summer. All of a sudden, I got the feeling that somebody was watching me. My son wasn't home at the time, and I was alone. My house is surrounded by wooded areas. My actual driveway is almost a half mile long from street to house. I looked towards the woods at the back of my house, and I saw a man standing in front of a tree. He was older. I'd say he looked to be in his 70s. He was wearing a dark suit. The color was faded black. He did absolutely nothing but stand there, staring. He was bald, and the left side of his head looked like a deflated basketball, for lack of a better description. He made me nervous, and I went back inside my house. Fast forward to the present. My son and I have seen this many, many times. He never leaves the woods, doesn't speak, and doesn't try to do anything. We've become used to him. We respect his area, and he respects ours. About three months ago, in early October, I was walking my dog in our yard. She started barking and took off running into the woods. I yelled for her to stop and caught up to her about 400 feet in. I grabbed her leash. Before I could turn to head back home, she started growling. My dog loves people, wouldn't hurt a fly, but her growl was vicious. I finally turned around, and there was a man standing there approximately four feet away. I never heard him or saw him approach, 
There's no reason for him to be in the woods behind my house. My closest neighbor is a mile down the road. He was also dressed in a suit, a navy blue one, blonde hair, roughly mid-thirties. He caught me off guard and I said, oh, <laughs> you scared me. He replied, beautiful day out today. I said, yes, yes it is. And I began moving to walk around him. I got beside him and had the most awful case of nausea to the point that my mouth filled with saliva and I thought I was going to vomit. I kept walking with my dog. I didn't want him to follow me to my house because my son was in there alone. So I walked along the wooded edge all the way to the top of my driveway. I looked back several times and didn't see him. After a few minutes, I began going back down my driveway to my home. My son called me and said, I thought you were in the backyard. I said, no, I walked up to the road and we're heading back now. He said, mom, a man came to the door and said to tell you that it's very rude to walk away during a conversation. Since that day, things have happened at least three times a week. I found a tooth laying on my kitchen floor. I found a small pendant cross on my windowsill. I've had bruises on my arm that look like fingerprints. My dog died from metastasized sarcoma on what we thought was just a sprained shoulder. The same day my dog passed, my son and I both saw this man again. Well, we saw his face, but his body was grayish white. His arms were unusually long, and his legs were just as long. He was crouched down in a position, like a spider. My son is terrified and wants to move. I'd be on board with the idea as well if it weren't for the fact that this man or thing followed me to a friend's house one day and she saw him too. So I don't think moving is going to do any good. My uncle's house was constructed from zero, but the place where it is had been long abandoned before he started building. I have so many stories from there that, to me, prove that it is indeed haunted. But I'll begin with the oldest one I can remember, before there was even a house there. Right next to the house, there's a kindergarten. I studied there when I was a kid, just like my mom and her brothers before me. There was always a playground legend about a man in a military uniform who called the kids to go behind the school, and then they disappeared. Even as a kid, I remember being so afraid of going to that particular place behind the school, but as I grew, I stopped thinking about it. Fast forward a few years, and my uncle's house had just been finished. One night, when I was out doing laundry with my cousin, I decided that I wanted to see the kindergarten from above, as it had been years since I saw it on the inside. So we go into the balcony and get a really good view of the place. And after a few seconds, I notice somebody walking in between the classrooms and the back of the school. I couldn't see their face, but my whole body tensed as I saw this shadow go through the wall and then disappear behind the school. I remembered the story from my childhood and I still wonder if that's the same man that the kids saw back then. Most of the paranormal experiences I've had have been with my cousin. I believe her when it comes to the paranormal things that she's told me has happened in my uncle's house. One of the scariest ones for her was a time when she had just come home from school and wanted to ask her aunt, let's call her Sarah, if they were going to eat at her grandparents' house or if they would be staying there. So she goes to the bottom of the stairs and yells, Aunt Sarah, are you here? To which Sarah's voice responded, Yes. Then my cousin yelled again, Are we going to go to Grandma's? But no one answered after that. After a few minutes without a response, my cousin went to the second floor and started looking for Sarah. But there was absolutely no one there. Not a single person. She then called her on the phone, only to find out that they had all gone to her grandparents' house and were waiting for her to go as well. She ran out of there and didn't come back for weeks as she was too afraid of the voice she had heard. I wasn't present when this happened, but it's important to the next story where I was present. 
After those things and a bunch of other paranormal things happened to her and our family, they decided that they would call in a priest to bless the house and invited everybody to pray and later hang out with them. My whole family was there, 20 plus people in the backyard as the priest blessed the house. We were all praying and singing, happy, united, when suddenly, just as the priest was going to climb the stairs to the second floor, a loud voice sounded, as if it was coming from where we were standing. It just said, Go away. My 14-year-old self was shaking with fear, but the lady that was directing the prayer yelled at us to pray louder and to take each other's hands. A lot of people were crying with horror at what we had just witnessed. That has to be one of the scariest things I've ever been through. And for that, I'm convinced that there's something horrible hiding in my uncle's house. I've had a few interesting experiences since I started using my spare room three months ago. A little backstory about the spare room. When I first bought my home last year, there was a family of around 13 people living in it, six of which were adults. There were three small bedrooms and one sketchy annex in the garage. A year later and the neighborhood is still telling me stories about how awful these people were as neighbors. The annex room was initially shoddy framing and drywall work, presumably installed by that family. The walls were painted a weird green color, and the rug was a wrinkly stained mess. It became apparent that someone had been peeing in all four corners of the room. I figured it might just be pets, but there was a mirror that had, please help me, written on it in makeup, and the room locked from the outside. The day we got our keys, I called to respond to the Seattle riots with my National Guard unit, and I was gone for about a month. During that time, my wife and the in-laws began renovating the home to make it livable. I felt guilty being unable to help. My wife got together with my mom to convert that scary extra room into a man cave and jam room with all my musical equipment and memorabilia. It came out really nice, but I haven't found much time to use it in the past year. A couple of months ago, I built a gaming PC and decided to set it up in that room. Now that I've been going in there almost daily, things have started to feel a little strange around the house. I get the sensation that someone is standing directly behind me once or twice a day in the room. Our TV caught fire in the living room a few weeks ago our water main burst last weekend, causing us to dig our yard up over the course of three days. And my garage light keeps turning on and off. I can hear the light switch moving. This morning, I got out of the shower to find that my wife had already left for work. I'm coming down the hall and I hear her clearly say, Hey babe, from the spare room side of the house. I replied, You're still here? To which I got silence. I looked out the front window, and sure enough, her truck was gone. That's when I heard her again. Babe, come here. I grabbed my things and noped to work. Anyway, when I was pulling out of the driveway, I could hear what sounded like a girl screaming from outside, followed by a bang. I stopped before backing into the street, thinking, was that my phone? I waited for a second before continuing on my way, thinking it might just be the school across the street. I got about 50 feet down the road before I heard it again. This time it was faint, but it sounded like it was coming from inside the car. I paused at the stop sign and rolled down the windows to see if it would happen again, as it had sounded identical to the first one. Nothing. I roll up my windows and continue on my way to find that it happened several more times, almost like a recording. The same scream and the same bang, over and over, for another mile or so. Anyway, I'm weirded out for the day. I might sage and bang some pans later. I don't know. Update. 
So this could all be a coincidence, but we've had a string of bad luck events take place with the recent snow. The following events happened over the course of a week, starting on Christmas Eve. We had a crazy cold snap here in Whatcom County, bringing us to unheard of low temps for the area. As one could expect, our hot water line froze and separated, leaving us without hot water for almost the entire week. Why is it always water problems lately? I ended up spending a bunch of time in the attic installing new copper lines and stuff started going off around the home, with everything beginning from me using the spare room office more often. I'm not surprised that I might have once again disturbed the privacy of whatever entity is in our place. My wife keeps telling me that she's under the impression I've opened and closed the bathroom door when I hadn't been back there all day. This has happened pretty often since I originally told the story about this room. Maybe it's paranoia. The other night we woke up to a really loud sound from the spare room area. Our entire pantry rack system had come off the wall and was barely held up by one of the accordion doors. This could be explained by too much weight on the shelves, maybe, but what happened next made it odd. I got up early the same morning and booted my PC to play some Tarkov. I was in there from around 7 to 10 a.m. When I came out, I noticed that the closet next to our front door was wide open and all the coats inside were on the ground. After a closer look, I realized the plastic hangers were all broken off, like somebody had just ripped everything down. The cold cracked our truck windshield. We've been experiencing some relationship struggles that I don't even care to elaborate on. We had no hot water, couldn't work all that week because of inclement weather, and now this? It's just a lot of stuff in such a short period. Anyway, I don't know what you guys think this might be, but I thought you might enjoy the story. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though, and we bought the house. From the beginning, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold, not to mention it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated, and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets, and after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom, at first. But this went on, back and forth, back and forth, for several minutes. And it was fast. It was a very brisk walk. 
Not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening, every night for a few weeks, and I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me, and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom, noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. And one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. 
Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then, she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it, and he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything. But I haven't. At least not yet. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic, rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex, and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though, and we bought the house. From the beginning, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets. And after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room. And shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom at first. But this went on, back and forth back and forth for several minutes and it was fast it was a very brisk walk not to mention next to my door was the locked door to the annex anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door but nothing it freaked me out and had me dreading the next night this kept happening every night for a few weeks and i remember vividly one night i actually left my bedroom door open Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow 
walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in, and this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor, and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever-increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house, and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom. Noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence, and one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mom screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it, but even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it, and he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything, but I haven't, at least not yet. I had a creepy experience at the Lizzie Borden house and I thought I'd share. For the record, I don't believe in ghosts and I'm skeptical of all paranormal experiences, 
but I will certainly admit when something is creepy and can't be easily explained. I didn't go into this day expecting or hoping to have any kind of experience. We stayed in one of the attic rooms, the Knowlton room, which had a large toy chest in the corner. I had no issue with the room and found it cute and comfortable, but when I went to sleep I had awful dreams all night. It was a hyper-realistic dream. I was lying in the very same bed that I was actually sleeping in, feeling terrified. I was trying to fall back to sleep, but it was difficult because of the strong sense of fear and because I was so thirsty. My throat felt like paper. I wanted to get up and get a drink of water from the bathroom, but I was too afraid. I felt that if I opened my eyes, I would see somebody in the room. I lay there for what felt like hours trying to fall back to sleep so that morning would come. At one point, I heard what sounded like a ball go bouncing across the floor. I heard it a second time, and I woke up my friend who was sleeping next to me to ask if she had heard it, but she hadn't and it didn't happen again. I assume that I dreamed this whole part because she doesn't remember me waking her up, but maybe she was just too tired to. Then at some point, I think I woke up for real because I was suddenly aware that I was lying in bed with my eyes open and the fear was suddenly lifted and the room felt completely normal. It was like a cloud had been lifted from my mind, which I sometimes feel when I'm struggling to wake up and I finally pull out of it. I was still really thirsty though. I didn't think much of my bad dream until the tour guide started to mention experiences that other guests had had while sleeping in the house. When we went to the attic, the guide told us that a lot of people who sleep there hear the sound of children playing at night. I asked if anyone had ever reported hearing a ball bounce across the floor. She said, that's pretty common. Why do you ask? She also refused to go into the attic guest rooms. She let us explore, but despite having no issue with the murder room and the master bedroom, she would not go into Knowlton room. This could have just been an act to enhance the tour's spookiness, but I don't know. I've also since learned that bad nightmares are very common in that room. For the record, I don't typically have dreams like this. I have no problem sleeping in strange places. I have stayed at many hotels and inns and friends' houses. And while I may have restless dreams, I don't have nightmares, especially not these vividly realistic ones where I'm just lying in bed feeling afraid. I've only had a dream like this once before shortly after I had moved into my current apartment and was sleeping alone in my new room. No one ever lived in that part of the attic. It was open storage space and was only converted into guest rooms when the house became a bed and breakfast. So there's no reason for why there would be children's ghosts in the attic, let alone any ghosts at all. I know the tour guides claim that the attic is the most haunted part of the house, but there isn't really a logical reason for this. There were some children who were killed next door and they claim that those children come to visit, but I don't know. Maybe the atmosphere cultivates bad dreams. I did look at the toy chest before going to bed, so maybe that influenced my dream. But I didn't notice any balls in it, just dolls and stuffed animals. I know a bad dream isn't the most interesting thing, but the fact that many people have had bad dreams in this room is at least a little weird. It's the spookiest thing that I've ever experienced, for sure. I was hoping I might get another independent report of hearing a ball bouncing. I am too skeptical to believe anyone who says, me too, after hearing my story. But nonetheless, I find it neat that I dreamed of a ball bouncing. Despite only noticing dolls and not balls, and not being a person who's overly susceptible to creepy places, and that this fits with other people's reports of having heard children playing. What do you think? Have you ever had any strange experiences at the Lizzie Borden house? Okay, so this is weird. I was a skeptic for most of my life until I was around 23. A group of friends had stayed in an old house in southern Louisiana that was said to be haunted. The house was very old and there was a family cemetery in the backyard. The room that was said to have the most activity was the uppermost room. 
The maids of the house were so spooked by that particular room that they refused to clean it, leaving the owner to tend to it. I really didn't believe in things like spirits or ghosts, so I didn't mind sleeping there. Well, things got weird, quickly. The first day, the only things that were off were the lights, flickering slightly, only in the upstairs room, and the alarm clock constantly having to be reset as it kept going back to noon, as if it kept getting turned off. We chalked that up to the house being built in the 1910s and having dodgy wiring. We went to sleep and slept well. The next day, we decided to check out the family cemetery, just a small plot of land with maybe five or six graves. We walked around a bit and that was that. Well, that night, I began to have the most realistic and haunting dreams I've ever had in my life. They were vivid, sexual, dark, and above all, terrifying. When I woke up, I kept passing out, as though something was blocking my airway. I'd lose, then regain consciousness, all while trying to get out of that room. There was a voice in my head telling me to get out, and that whatever was on me couldn't get me outside the room. I crawled on my hands and knees, while trying to stay conscious, to the front door and down the stairs. About a third of the way down the staircase, I felt this relief, a massive weight removed that had been squeezing my entire ribcage. I could think clearly, without interference. I stayed on the couch the rest of the trip. The next day, when I went to move my things out of the room, I would begin to get dizzy if I stayed there for too long. When I'd go back downstairs, the dizziness would leave. I'm 32 years old, and this hasn't happened anywhere else since. When I was little, we used to live in a house where so many weird things happened. I know so many people probably won't believe me, but honestly, I saw so many things in that home. My dolls would move and talk to me at night. My brother was in the shower when all the tiles flew off the wall. I would see animals and weird objects move. And once, my brother and I even saw what we believed to be an alien. It was just insane. Anyway, I grew up and believed that it was all imaginary friends and stuff like that. My brother still remembers the alien, but for the most part, I thought we were just kids. Recently, my cousins, who lived two houses down, were telling us that the man who now lives there has gone insane and walks up and down the street at 3 a.m. saying things like, the devil is coming. He wasn't like that when he first moved in. I brought this up to my mum, and it turns out we moved because the house was haunted. My parents had experienced horrible things there too, and eventually did some digging to find out that the house was built over an old church and a bunch of other things. Anyway, it was so creepy. I was around four, living in a house with my mom and my mom's boyfriend. It was around three in the morning, I think, when I had woken up because I had to pee. I walked outside of my room to see a woman in white standing in the stairway. My room was on the second floor. I ran into my little sister's room to tell her. She went out of her room and saw her too. We both ran back into my room and hid under my covers, terrified. This was 10 years ago, and a couple of weeks ago, she said that my mom and her boyfriend, now ex-boyfriend, had seen her too. For them, it was around midnight. They were asleep, and my mom had woken up to see a woman standing in her closet. She thought it was nothing, and her imagination was just playing tricks on her, so she went back to sleep. The next day, when my mom's boyfriend got back from work, he went and asked my mom if around 12 she had seen anything that looked like a woman in the closet. 
she and her boyfriend started freaking out. Now we know that the house next to ours was actually a Civil War hospital, and many people had died in that house. Other things happened in that house, too. When my little sister was a baby, she would always point to the glass and say, Look, woman. No one could see her, but now we think it was probably the same person we've all seen. The other thing is, my mom's boyfriend and his cousin had gone into our attic with a camera and began to record. When they came downstairs and showed the tape to my mom, they could see tens of orbs floating around in there. Things like that happened all the time. And while it was interesting, I'm glad I don't live there anymore. My old house was unbelievably haunted. That's what we've always thought. But honestly, I believe in my heart that there's something attached to my family. I have a reason to believe that, but that's a story for another time. Back to the house. My brother and sister were home alone. They were downstairs watching a movie when they heard a door upstairs slam shut. They ran upstairs to see what it was only to find out that it was my bedroom door that had slammed shut. They opened the door, and no one was there. My closet doors started subtly moving. They opened the doors to find out that my cross, which was inside of a shadow box, was flipped upside down. In case you don't know what a shadow box is, it's something that you put inside of a case, with a big piece of glass in front of it meaning that you can't physically touch the item inside of the box. So as to how that cross flipped over, no one will ever know. My family has always been kind of religious, so in that moment, they were both like, we're leaving, we are not staying here tonight. They went into the laundry room to get some things. In this house, our laundry room was in the garage, so they went to go back inside and the door slammed in their face. It was locked. They opened the garage door and went around to the front door. It was also locked. They checked the patio door, and that door was locked as well. Not being able to get into the house, they made the choice to call a locksmith. The locksmith came, but you know, in our area at least, locksmiths drive big yellow vans. But this guy pulled up in some old car. He came to our door and unlocked it in seconds. And then he started hitting on my sister, asking her if she wanted to go out for drinks while he's on the job. So my brother calls the company to complain. And also this guy charged my brother way too much money. So he complains about that too. He calls the company and says that the locksmith you just sent was not following protocol, blah, blah, blah. And here's the scary thing. They responded and said, Sir, we haven't even sent a locksmith out to you yet. So who the hell was the guy that was just at our house? We never did find out. Every house I've ever lived in has been haunted. When I was three, I lived in an old trailer with my grandparents and my mom. I went into my bedroom, which was the computer room with a mattress on the floor, to get something. When I looked around, I saw a man in the mirror. He was quite tall, had on old Coke bottle glasses, and was in a dress shirt with suspenders. But my reflection wasn't in the mirror. I ran out of there so quick. I also had really weird dreams in that house. After a huge fight with my mom and my mama, we left to go live in my mom's childhood house. That house is where I've had the most ghost encounters and developed anxiety, so I absolutely loved this house. Anyway, I was around four when we moved and seven when I saw my first ghost in that house. I was upstairs and from my bathroom mirror, you could see the shower. All of a sudden, I looked at the mirror and I saw three fingers sliding down the shower door. 
I ran downstairs to my mom, and to this day, I don't go upstairs or take showers there. The second time, I was downstairs, and I heard a big crash in the bathroom, as though a bunch of pots and pans had fallen, but all over the house, nothing had moved. After that, I moved out with my mom. My mama still lives there. I still hear footsteps upstairs, and in the night, someone is watching me. Currently, I live in a different house with my mom and her boyfriend, and it's a little different. I haven't seen anything, but there's been more things happening to objects. My mom had a crown royal bag, and one day the strings got mysteriously cut. Also, the most recent, I had a friend over and we were about to go to sleep. When I noticed on my Polaroid camera, it's an antique from the 70s, that the handle had been cut. This happened about two weeks ago. About a year ago, I was texting my now ex-boyfriend, and all of a sudden an Avon compact that was sitting in the middle of my desk flew off onto the floor. It's still in our texts to this day. And that's all of my ghost stories. Except, of course, for the countless times that I've felt somebody watching me and other things like that. I'm not really sure what to make of it. So, I work for my local authority's cultural service. I can work in any one of the cultural buildings across the city, but one that I work in, I believe is definitely haunted. The building is 300 years old, used to be a farmhouse until the 1860s, and then an upper middle class family home. There have been a few occasions where I believe I've experienced paranormal activity there. One time, I was covering a Sunday shift, if I covered a Sunday shift, I always made sure we got in a tea break before we opened. So, three of us sat in the canteen having a drink and a natter. No one else was in the building. I was the key holder, so anyone getting in before opening time had to get in through me. Something in the building went bang. A bang like something heavy falling over. It seemed to come from the corridor across from us but nothing was out of place. The three of us heard it and the three of us searched the building to look for an explanation, but literally nothing was out of place. Another time, I was working on some admin in the office. I usually shared an office, but that day I had it to myself. The offices were the old servants' bedrooms. We had a volunteer working in the office opposite. She left to collect her things, ready to leave, just as her husband came up to collect her. I sent her husband back downstairs to meet her. Within a minute, I saw someone, and presumed it was the volunteer, come back up the stairs and go into the office. So I got up to tell her that I had literally just sent her husband back downstairs, but the office was empty. On a third occasion, I was in one room tidying something up. I heard footsteps walking toward me from the adjacent room. I was in the building by myself. Finally, again on my own, I was in what was essentially a gentleman's game room, polishing the glass cases. I had this overwhelming feeling that I couldn't explain the origin of, that I wasn't welcome in there, being a woman. Now whenever I go in there, I can't stop myself saying something like, I know, but I'm just doing some polishing and I'll be out. And the feeling subsides or doesn't come on at all. I'm not the only person that's come out of that room with an odd feeling. Two girls one evening while locking up went to switch the lights off, and they both at the same time came out feeling scared and crying, but they couldn't explain why. My parents rented a house in a remote upstate area, and we moved in when I was 16. I lived there until I was 25. I'm now 31. Slowly, my sisters moved out later than I did, and my parents just moved out like six months ago. 
Here are a few of the encounters we've had. Every night, my sisters and I would hear footsteps coming up the stairs and going into the bathroom. Every time, we assumed it was one of my parents up for a late night bathroom run, since the only bathroom was in the upstairs area, where the rest of the bedrooms were, and my parents' room was downstairs. We eventually realized it wasn't them. Then we'd get up to use the bathroom and wait forever before knocking, only to find out that the bathroom was empty. My dog, who slept in my bedroom, would wake up at the same time every night, always around 3 a.m., and stare and growl at the dark area in my bedroom. My little sister and I, who shared the bedroom, could feel a presence, but we were too scared to look at the shadow. So, while looking at the floor, we would slowly pick up our dog, place him under the covers with us, and just pray that it went away. The main encounters happened in my bedroom. It must have been where it lived, or maybe there were multiple entities. But one time, my younger sister and I redecorated our bedroom and placed a new shoe rack right in front of our bed and lined up our shoes. We both sat down on the bed to look at it from different angles and see if we liked the placement. And a shoe came flying off the rack directly at us. We both booked it and didn't come back for hours. It liked to hide stuff from me, specifically me. I would be doing my makeup and then after I used the foundation or lotion, I would go to put the cap back on and it would just be gone from the vanity. It would happen right in front of me. Or I would spread out my outfit on the bed that I would plan to wear, shower, come to get dressed, and a piece of clothing from the outfit would be gone and nowhere to be found. Now I'm sure you'll think maybe a sister, right, since there were four of us. Well, I thought that too, except that it happened consistently for years. I got used to it. I'd leave a note sometimes in the bathroom for family before I went out with, for example, my foundation uncapped that said, the elf took my cap, if you randomly find it, please put it back on. That's what I always called it, an elf because of how mischievous it was. Later, I learned to give it gifts. I would place out my outfit or my engagement ring in its box, or whatever else was really important that I wouldn't want to go missing. And I would loudly announce in my empty bedroom, I need this. Please don't take it, but I've left you this, for example, an earring, for you to play with while I'm out, or asleep, or whatever it was. It worked. I read that online, by the way, as I tried to find ways of cohabitating, since financially we couldn't move out. One day, my sisters and I asked the landlord what was in the attic, since there was one that didn't have a ladder to go up to it. And he told us that he didn't know. He'd bought the house as is many years ago and had never been in the attic, so he had no idea what was there, if anything. So I got the bright idea of let's check it out. We got chairs, which we stacked on top of each other while my parents were out, and I was going to check while my sisters held the chairs for me to climb on. Well, I opened the attic door, and all I could see was pitch black. I wasn't even at eye level into the attic yet, just barely could see into it, as I'm pretty short. So my sisters got a flashlight. I turned it on, went to put it on the floor inside to climb in, and poof, it went out immediately. I figured, okay, the battery's dead. My other sister handed me a lit candle to put on the floor so that I could climb in while the other one went to get batteries. And as soon as I placed it on the floor, poof, it got blown out. At that moment, I flipped. I closed the attic as fast as I could, and none of us ever planned on checking again. These are just a few descriptions of our paranormal encounters. My parents either never believed us, or they didn't want to. They never heard anything downstairs and never noticed anything. Until, when we all moved out and they moved into my old bedroom, where my mom would swear that stuff disappeared on her all the time, that lights got turned on and off, the doors open and close, and so on. Then the landlord lost the house to foreclosure, 
and my parents moved out into their own home about six months ago. The haunted house is now abandoned, as nobody has purchased it, and more haunted than ever, I'm sure. I wouldn't take any amount of money to go sleep there for one more night on my own. I moved into my current house yesterday. It's a typical middle-of-nowhere farmhouse with thick woods surrounding it. It's a house passed down through generations, starting with my great-grandfather's uncle who helped build it. He died while repairing the silo, the grain suffocating him. In his will, he wanted my great-grandfather to own it. My great-grandfather then died from a heart attack at the age of 93 in the bathtub. My grandma was next in line, and within a month of moving in, died in a car crash a few miles from the house. My mother then temporarily moved in, and she said she would sell it. Nobody would buy it because of the history. However, she did see some people walking around in the yard. She would later tell me this after I moved in. I just assumed either it was the TV reflection on the windows or her dreaming, and if it was true, it was probably just some teenagers messing around. I wasn't too worried and had my dog to keep me company. The first night, I was sleeping on the floor, as I hadn't bought a mattress yet. My dog was sleeping next to me and hogging the blanket. I quietly got up to go look for another one, when I saw someone quickly walk past to the kitchen. I was confused, thinking that maybe one of my buddies who helped me move in was trying to scare me. I walked to the kitchen and saw nothing. I must have been searching every corner and cranny for about an hour. I kept saying, that's really funny, but I need to go to bed. Eventually I gave up and grabbed a blanket and walked back into the living room where I'd been sleeping. My dog, who'd been peacefully sleeping, was in the corner of the room whimpering, staring over my shoulder. I got the chills and slowly looked behind me only to find darkness. I did a quick search of the house, turning on the lights and whatnot, but I found nothing. I decided to keep the lights on and I went back to my dog, Reuben. I settled on the creaky wood floor and threw my blanket over me. Reuben eventually walked up to me and sat down. Just as my heart rate was returning to normal and Reuben was snuggled up next to me, I heard an explosion from the kitchen. I jumped up and stood there. Reuben started crying again and went back to the corner. I grabbed some scissors and walked to the kitchen again. This time, the kitchen light I had turned on was blown out, broken glass shards everywhere. Jokingly, I said, you're paying for that, to who I thought was still trying to scare me. The moment I said that, an overwhelming dread came over me. I felt dizzy and out of breath, I noticed I was suddenly very cold. I chalked it up to the light being out, must have made the kitchen colder. I quickly walked back to the living room to find Reuben staring at the wall. At this point, I'd had enough and I wanted to sleep at a hotel. I grabbed my phone and searched it up as I was unfamiliar with the area. Suddenly, Reuben snarled at the wall. I had never heard him do that before. I looked up, but everything was the same. It was just me and him. However, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. I turned and looked out the window directly left of me and saw a man in old attire walking toward the silo. He looked dirty and battered with a slight limp. I could see him because my mother installed a street light. Well, at this point, I decided I would confront him, thinking he was the man inside my new house. I opened the window and yelled at him. The moment I did this, he disappeared right in front of me. At this point, it was four in the morning and I was just done with it. I grabbed my blanket and Reuben and went to sleep in my truck. I woke up at 2 p.m. with several missed calls. It was my mom and sister trying to check up on me. I got back to them and currently, I'm debating what I should do next.
So this summer, my family and I stayed in a house in Germany for a week. It seemed nice enough, but right away, there was just a strange feeling throughout the whole house. I don't know how to explain it, but you know when it just doesn't feel right? So probably the first thing I should mention is that there were noises coming from everywhere. Footsteps, banging, that kind of thing. I should also mention that none of us talked about it being scary until we left and were in the car. So on the first day when my mom and I were in my room and were hearing noises, neither of us mentioned it, even though we both knew that it was nothing, right? The first really scary thing happened on the second night. My room was opposite the conservatory and every night there was a noise coming from there. But on this specific night, a chair freaking moved. Like, what the heck? On one of the other nights, and this is probably one of the scariest things, my mom thought she saw my brother running between his room and the bathroom. But when she asked my dad why my brother wasn't in bed, my dad walked out of the bathroom and said my brother was in bed. So who was that person running in between rooms? We all agreed that my brother's room felt the weirdest. Luckily, my brother is a complete lead box, so he was fine with sleeping in there. So you can probably understand why my mom did not want to sleep in there when my brother went in with my dad on the last night. I needed to use the restroom so many times that night. I don't know why. And before I went for the last time, I thought I heard one of my parents getting up for the bathroom because I heard footsteps and things moving around in there. But then, I realized that my parents' door had never actually opened. And when I asked them about it the next day, they said neither of them had gotten up. That same night, my mom was in my brother's room. She had put her Garmin watch on a book. She heard a noise and the watch was half off the book. She heard a shuffling noise and a thump. And then the watch was on the floor and the sensor light was flashing. She came into my room and slept in there because she was terrified. One more thing is that everybody woke up loads of times every night. Usually we all sleep pretty well. I really don't know what to make of it, but I'm pretty sure that house was haunted. So my family and I have been living in my house for about 18 years now, and I've noticed a few weird things happening, but nothing evil and sinister. There are a few spirits in the house, and they usually appear randomly, so they come and go as they please. But there will be times that you'll randomly look to a particular spot in the room, and you can picture them in your head, or you'll see them from the corner of your eye. The spirits in my house are both young and old. There are two men. One is my grandfather and the other is unknown. There is a female and she's unknown also. So are the two young girls and the boy. The older spirits stay with me in my room. The unknown male lays beside me or sits next to me on the bed and the woman sits on the edge of my bed or sometimes lays next to me. One of the little girls peeks around the cupboard in my kitchen, while the other sits with me on my bed alongside the little boy, who also stands in my doorway. But there have been three occurrences that I know of that have happened to me besides the spirits surrounding me on a daily basis. The first was the shadow figure in the laundry. I had just had a shower and I opened the bathroom door. The laundry light suddenly turns on. There was a shadow figure that looked like my older brother. So I said his name. Then I take a step forward and the figure rushes to the back door. I chicken out and run to my room to get dressed. Once I had done that, I told my dad because my mom is a skeptic. The second was the shadow figure that was in my room. I was lying in bed watching some YouTube before I went to sleep, like I usually do. And I don't know about other people, but I always put my head under the covers because I don't like the dark. Anyway, I took my head out from under the covers, and I see a shadow run into my bedroom wall. I just put my laptop down on my bedside table and went to sleep. 
The third is the orb outside my front door. It was after dinner, and I was going to feed my dog. And as I was walking out of the dining room, I looked toward the front door, and there was a bright orange orb floating on the other side of it. I looked to my parents and back at the door, but the orb was gone. I don't really know what to make of these recent encounters. They're not like the other ones that I'm used to. What do you think? I'm a real estate agent. Also, for privacy, I've changed the names of the clients. This is one of the few haunting type things that I've ever experienced. Anyway, my clients, we'll call them Jim and Pam, had been looking for a home to buy for a while. We'd seen a few houses that were in their price range, but didn't have the features they wanted. So when a home matching their requirements and price point popped up on the market, we were all more than motivated to give it a look and hopefully make an offer. We scheduled a showing for 7 p.m. that evening. I didn't have much going on that day, so I got over there at around 6.45 p.m. And since I still had 15 minutes before the buyers would get there, I decided to look through the house and also turn on the lights as it was getting dark and turning on lights for a showing is always a good idea anyway. When I walk into the house, Right away, I notice it's fairly nice for the price that it's at. It seems to be underpriced by at least 10000 if not more, and that gets me excited. I know the buyers are going to want to make an offer, so I just have to make sure there's nothing super awful. As I make my way through the rooms, turning on lights, I come upon an intercom in a hallway next to the kitchen. I press it and talk through it, to hear that the other receiver is directly below me in the basement. Very cool, as I've only seen intercoms in movies. Then I walk through the door frame into the kitchen. The counters and cupboards looked nice, but cheap. And then I noticed the refrigerator was open. Must have bad suction, I thought, or someone left it open. I think to myself to go over and shut it. I did so, and then I gave it a little tug, but it seemed pretty well sealed. So I figured somebody from a previous showing had just left it open. Even though the refrigerator has nothing in it, it's still a little rude of the last agent to not do a once-over and shut it. As I mull this over, the intercom buzzes and static comes through. I slowly walk into the hallway as it continues, and a few steps away, it cuts out. Hmm, I thought. Must have electrical shortages or something downstairs. I hadn't gone downstairs yet, so I figured I might as well go down there and turn on the lights and check to see what was going on with the intercom. The basement doesn't have a switch, just a pole string attached to a light in the middle of the room. The light from outside is coming in through the small windows, just enough so that I can see where I'm going, but not much more. Before I can pull the light string, I hear the intercom buzz back on but this time it's static through the basement receiver. So now the interference is coming from upstairs. I'm not really sure what's going on at this point. I turn on the light and run up the stairs. Again, the intercom stops as soon as I get close, but something in the kitchen catches my eye. I walk into the kitchen to find that every cupboard, drawer, and the refrigerator are wide open. My heart sinks, and the hairs on my neck stand on end. At this point, the scare was over, but the clients called to let me know they had just arrived. It was 6.55ish, so all of this happened pretty quickly. I hurriedly slammed everything shut and tried to act normal. When I opened the door, Jim asked if I was feeling all right. I assume I was slightly pale. Look like you've seen a ghost type of appearance. I said that I was, and we quickly walked through the house. Nothing opened this time. And afterward, when I asked how they felt about the house, they both agreed that something felt off and dark. I told them that I sensed that too, but didn't go into detail. Needless to say, we didn't write an offer, and I've never gone back. Definitely creeped me out. Definitely haunted.
When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint, and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly, and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch the breakfast club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids' room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities, some good, some not. 
The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. It's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. I know that there's something in my house. When my husband and I bought this house, we were told that the woman who had lived here previously walked from the bedroom to the kitchen, collapsed on the kitchen floor, and passed away three days later in the hospital. Apparently she collapsed on a Wednesday. Our bedroom is the same bedroom that she had. This summer, we were sitting out on our deck enjoying an evening breeze when I see a shadow walk past my front window through the blinds, coming from our bedroom and headed to the kitchen. I freaked out thinking that somebody was in our house. Our son was staying with his aunt that night. We came running in, stupid thing to do if somebody was truly in the house, I guess, and we searched every nook and cranny, nothing. Now we're hearing voices, and the other day, my soda flew off the table by the rocking chair. I think I made her mad somehow, but I'm not really sure what I did. And I'm not really sure what to do now. It seems like things are about to get interesting. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new house. Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home, and before that, I have no idea. My partner, our young children, and I have lived here since it was built, nearly six years ago. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest child's bedroom. It was her bedroom from about six months old until about two years. She never slept well ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crappy sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we would bring her into our room, which was directly next to her room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway. And if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, a boy, now has that bedroom and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest daughter's bedroom, she would wake in the night and my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle and I would go in to comfort her. While comforting her with my back to the door, I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me so much so that I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. During a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. We asked her how she slept Totally normal question, and we certainly didn't lead her answer in any way. She said, eh, not so great. I felt on edge, like somebody was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, I just felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I had felt in the past, 
when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before, so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. A friend recommended we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room, and we might do that. But I just wanted to share this story and see if anybody else can relate. I've had many paranormal experiences in my life, but this one has stuck with me for a while. This all happened a few years ago in a little hick town. My friends and I were bored as hell, so we decided to find some trouble to get into. My friend mentioned a super creepy house in the middle of nowhere that had been sitting empty for a little over a year. We decided that since we didn't have anything better to do, we should go and check it out. So, the six of us crammed into a car and headed over there. It was around 3 a.m., middle of summer. The moon was full and it lit up everything around us. We parked a little ways up the road and walked up to the house. It was definitely spooky in the moonlight. It kind of looked like the creepy house from the Blair Witch Project. We were originally just going to walk around the property, but my boyfriend at the time decided to kick the door open and explore inside. Three of my friends stayed outside to watch for cops. The cops didn't normally patrol the area, but we wanted to be extra safe. The other two and I went inside. I made it maybe six feet into that house before I got hit with a really weird, heavy feeling. It felt like I was wrapped up in a thick blanket, but instead of being warm and cozy, it was cold. I got out of there as fast as I could. My boyfriend and our friend, let's call him Tim, teased me, saying that I was being a wimp. I knew something was weird in that house, and I refused to go back in. Tim decided to record their walk through the house. After walking through, Tim picked something up, threw it at my boyfriend, and started screaming to try to spook him. Well, it worked, and they ran out. The three of us then started looking through a shed in the back. We found various hunting traps. They looked pretty old and rusted, so I assumed they were just hung up for decoration. My boyfriend decided to take one to remember that night. I'm pretty sure that the trap he stole had something attached to it. A lot of weird stuff started happening at our place after that, but those are stories for another time. We left shortly after. When we got back, we watched the video that Tim took inside the house. After we laughed at my boyfriend's screams, Tim said he thought he had heard something weird in the video. So we played it back. And sure enough, while they're running out of the house, there's a voice in the video that doesn't belong to either of them. It was a woman's voice, clearly saying, she died here. We collectively lost our minds. I was the only girl there that night, and the sound of them screaming and running would have drowned out my talking, and like I said, I had already left. I wish I still had the video for proof, but I had a falling out with Tim and deleted our messages, so I don't have the video anymore. I still beat myself up over not saving it. I used to be terrified of the paranormal, so I didn't save it when he first sent it to me. I've come to accept since then that I'll always have weird paranormal experiences, and it'll always be a part of my life. Still, that video was the first paranormal experience I've ever had solid evidence of. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted 
and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time, she woke up with somebody holding her feet down, and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. 
He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night, and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. A few years back, one of my best friends and business partner was, and still is, a single dad. His ex-wife was in and out of mental institutions for years, and he had sole custody of his two kids, a boy, age 10, and a girl, age 14. My friend had to travel to New York to oversee the multimedia setup for the auto show for the Ford display. I was back at the office with the programmers during the day, and I would stay with the kids each evening. Their house was a new two-story rental in the Woodlands, Texas. The development was built in a heavily wooded area just north of Houston. Weird stuff started happening the first night I was there. I was watching TV with the kids. The den lights would go off. The light switch was on the other side of the room. I went over and the switch was turned off. I thought it was a problem with the breaker or there was another light switch. But if there was another switch, who turned it off? I flipped the switch on, the lights came back on, and I went back to sit down. The lights went off. I walked back and I found the switch flipped back down to off manually. That disturbed me. This went on for a while. I asked the kids if this had happened before and they told me that every now and then, the lights would go off. So now I'm trying to act unconcerned in front of the kids. Suddenly, there was a loud crash in the attic. I, we, went upstairs and opened the attic door to check. There was nothing in the attic. It was completely empty, and thus we had no explanation as to what had made the loud noise. I'm thinking that there's someone else in the house. Their mother had shown up unexpectedly before at their old house, but she was in jail at the time and supposedly didn't know this address. Things quieted down and it was eventually time to go to bed. I let the family dog in, a lab, checked all of the doors and made sure they were locked, and then I went up to the guest room, which was between the kids' bedrooms. I left my door cracked, and I had just turned the bedside lamp off. As I was laying down, I saw the silhouette of a boy crouched down between the cable box and VCR lights on the other side of the room and myself. I thought the sun was getting ready to try to scare me, so I turned the bedside lamp on and said, gotcha, but there was no one there. 
Then there was another loud crash in the attic. This woke the kids up, and now they were scared. We then heard a door slam downstairs. I told them that it was a new house, and noises happen. I also told them that I would sleep in the day bed out in the hallway. I made my rounds again, and we all went back to bed. When I woke up the next morning, the kids and the dog were all asleep on the floor next to my bed. I still had four more nights to go. The next day, I got to the house as it was getting dark. The wind was starting to pick up, and all of the tree limbs were swaying. There was thunder in the distance. However, the kids seemed fine. I helped them with their homework and made dinner. No, we're not going to McDonald's again. And we all finally sat down to watch TV. The storm was worsening, and there was more thunder and lightning. The den in the house was huge, with large floor-to-ceiling windows, and the walls went all the way to the rafters. There was an interior balcony on the second floor that wrapped around three of the walls. There was an exterior balcony facing the backyard. You could see through the upper windows out to the lower part of the outside balcony. So now, the rain is coming down in sheets, the wind is blowing, and bursts of lightning are happening everywhere. Suddenly, the daughter says she sees something moving out on the balcony. I look up, and it looks like a pair of legs in dark pants scurry past one of the windows. I'm thinking, do I get the gun out of the master bedroom? But that opens up a whole new can of worms. So instead, I run up the back stairs from the kitchen to the second floor hallway and out through the balcony door. The wind is blowing cold rain right into me and I get soaked, but I don't see anyone on the balcony. I go back downstairs and tell them there's no one outside. Shortly thereafter, I tell them it's time for bed. The son goes right to bed and goes to sleep. The daughter is afraid of storms. The dog won't go into her bedroom and her cat is nowhere to be found. I tell her that I will sit with her until she goes to sleep. I bring a chair into her bedroom and set it on the left side of her bed. We talk about storms, and I tell her about being in a tent in the army during really bad storms, and how nice it is to be in a house for this storm. We both fall asleep. There's a loud clap of thunder, a flash of lightning, and I see a dark figure about five feet tall standing in the far corner of her room. I jump to my feet, but now I don't see anything. I don't want to wake her up, and so I carefully walk around her room and check the hallway. I slowly sit back down. I eventually doze off again. Later, I hear a noise and I started to look around. The cat is curled up on the foot of her bed, and the dog is starting to lay down at my feet. The storm has passed, and looking outside her bedroom window, stars are shining up above the tree line. I go lay down in the day bed out in the hallway, and just as I fall asleep, I hear a door downstairs slam shut. It sounds like the kitchen door to the garage. I go downstairs. The kitchen door, door to the garage, and front door are all shut and locked. I start to walk over to the master bedroom suite, but something tells me not to go there. I head back upstairs and lay back down. What seems like seconds later, the alarm goes off and it's time to start a new day. I have to get breakfast going, and it's my turn to drive school carpool. Most of the days in that house went about the same. All I know for sure is that something was wrong with that house. My mom bought a house when I was in the second grade. 
It was built in 1856 or 1857. I'm not entirely sure. The guy who built it was a prominent doctor. He had a few kids, but I don't know a whole lot about him. I do know that over the years, a couple of people died there, mostly him and his kids, but we got the house because the woman living there had lost her sister and she wanted to move into a nursing home. The house was not used to treat patients so far as I know. There was a hospital built maybe 80 yards from us where I'm fairly sure he did most of his work. I know that place is very haunted, but nothing malicious as far as I know. Anyway, I feel like that's enough background on the house. We lived there in the early 2000s. I was six or seven and we moved out when I was 13. We didn't live there a very long time. The house just seemed to be bad luck. We had a dog named Snowball. He was an American Eskimo dog, 20 pounds, fluffy and white as, well, snow. He would just stare in dark corners a lot, as would my cat. I'd hear my mom call for me a lot, but when I went to look for her, she wasn't even home from work yet, or hadn't called me. A few times, we would be in the kitchen or the living room, and we would hear something digging through my shoe boxes full of Polly Pockets. My bedroom was directly above the living room, and the floor was thin. When we would go upstairs to look for the cat or the dog, they were usually right there in the living room with us. The cat liked to stay under the couch, but when we would investigate, all my dolls and accessories would be thrown about my room, and the door was closed. Snowball liked to chew on my dolls, as he had a gum disease and I guess it felt good, but he really didn't like being alone, and his favorite spot was on the green couch, where he would look out and watch the street. He was also old, and only went upstairs when it was cold, and we would all sleep in one room, because he liked the heater. Otherwise, he was downstairs. My cat did the same thing. She was often very close to us. She liked the spot on the red couch where she could watch TV. None of the pets liked going upstairs unless we were there. I spent a lot of time outside, but I also liked to sit in the office. I would play Neopets, RuneScape, and watch videos on various sites. I'd feel like somebody was watching me all the time. I'd turn around, but I was alone. Sometimes when I was outside, I know that my mom was still at work, but in her bedroom, through the window, I would see a man looking down at me. I don't remember being afraid of him, just kind of got used to seeing him. My mom would always say, oh, that's just Dr. Green. I would wave to him and he would just vanish. One night, I woke up and somebody was sitting on my bed and it was freezing as they were pulling my blanket down. I woke up mad and then panicked because pulling at my blanket was the man in the window. Then I could smell it. Something was burning. I woke my mom up and we found that the microwave was shorting out and had burnt through the cable and was on the verge of catching fire. After that, I made my grandmom take me to his grave and I'd leave flowers for him there all the time. Dr. Green was a nice ghost. He would just appear, and he only woke me that one time to warn us. Then there was Luke. Luke was malicious. He terrorized the pets. It's why they wouldn't really go upstairs. He always appeared in dark corners, and I could never bring myself to walk past him. It felt like if I did, something bad would happen. He was more active, too. Cabinets would fly open, things would fall off shelves, and he would throw things at us. In the dead of night, you could hear heavy boots slowly climbing the stairs. Sometimes the TV would randomly flip channels. You'd hear groans, and he actually attacked us. I regularly had nightmares, and I would wake up with strange bruises and cuts and scratches. This was also happening to my mom. We know his name is Luke because my mom used to record QVC and the sewing channel on the VCR. I think it was QVC and they were doing some craft thing, but they asked the caller what their name was and very clearly in a masculine voice, someone says, Luke. 
Then the woman who was actually the caller and was live on the show goes on to say her name and go on about the product. We were only guessing that the friendly ghost was Dr. Green, as the man always appeared in similar clothing to the photos that we had of him, very nice suits and a hat. Luke was dressed in ratty looking clothing and he wore huge boots with spurs. I can still hear his boots clanging up those squeaky steps. Lastly, there was the ghost dog. I love animals, but I hated this dog. It was huge, black, and made me feel sick to my stomach whenever it would appear. And it appeared everywhere, outside the carport, downstairs, upstairs, and especially the cellar. I could hear its toenails clack on the hardwood and I would hide under my blankets. The hair on my arms and neck would raise and I could hear it sniffing me. It makes my skin crawl to think about that dog. If you looked at it, it would growl and vanish, but I only saw it twice. I heard it all the time though. I would also have nightmares about this huge black dog following me around. It was a recurring dream that scared me so much as a kid. I'd be in the yard and there was a creek that ran through it. It went under the road and there were those huge steel cylinders that let the water pass. I could crouch and walk through them, but I'd see the dog there and it was guarding what looked like a kid's body. It would immediately wake me up. I never thought to look up and see if a child had died there. I was a kid and it scared me to even think about it, but I still see that dream vividly. I own a big black lab, Great Dane Mix, and sometimes he gives me flashbacks to that dog. I could go on and on about the odd things that happened. More happened to my mom, and she has weird pictures, videos, even called a priest to cleanse the house, but I don't think it ever helped. It may have, but the people who live there now have fixed up the house a lot. I've been tempted to knock on the door and ask them but I feel like that would be weird. I drive past the house every time I go visit my grandparents. Also, stepping back on the property makes me feel uneasy. When we were moving out, I was packing my things. Something knocked over my corkboard, and I was frustrated because it broke. I told whatever it was to leave me alone, that I was leaving. I turned back to what I was packing, and then, I heard a voice behind me very clearly say, if you come back, I'll kill you. I don't want to take my chances with the paranormal. With a threat like that, I don't want to mess with it, especially as this voice was very different from Luke's. It hissed, it made me feel sick, and made the room very cold as well. Whatever this thing was, I don't want to get to know it and I don't want to tempt fate. This happened in 2021. My family and I were living in a pretty old house at the time, like really old. There was mold, wood creaking in the middle of the night, and when the wind would blow, it sounded like the windows would shatter. I have three different things that happened at this house. My dad and I were driving back from a spirit Halloween store for Halloween decor because it was around that time of year. When we were walking up to our door, we heard a loud bang on the window near the bottom right corner. We had cats at the time, but they never really jumped at the windows and we checked. Two of them were asleep upstairs and the other one was outside, nowhere near the window. My thought was maybe something had fallen and hit the window, but nothing was laying next to it. If you take the palm of your hand and you slap it on your window, it sounds exactly like what we heard. The second thing that happened to me was a little creepier. There were wooden floorboards that led from my kitchen to my living room. The kitchen had a tiled floor and the living room had carpet. Whenever you would walk through these wooden boards, they would make a mind numbing creaking noise. Now I've had my cats walk over these boards and they won't make a sound. 
and my cats are decently large and heavy. When I was home alone and sitting on my couch, I heard the floorboards make a noise. I've heard them make noises before, but this one sounded directional. I was obviously hesitant to go check, but eventually I did and there was nothing there. The third thing that happened is almost impossible for me to explain. I didn't see this one, but my dad did, and I didn't know this up until today. He walked into the kitchen and past the countertop. As he walked, a small glass moved about four feet across the countertop, almost as though somebody had slid it. There was nobody in the house at the time except for me, my mom, and my dad, and we were not there, in the room. The windows may have been open, but even if they were, the wind couldn't have been enough to slide that glass across the table. This one is kind of a bonus, but not necessarily that creepy. I have a habit of speaking in my sleep. I've said really weird things before, like get the shovel or run. But my parents said that in this house in particular, they heard me scratching my wall in the middle of the night. My bed was pushed up against a wall and apparently my hand was in the air clawing at the wall. Another creepy thing happened too. My room is hallway adjacent to my parents. Apparently in the middle of the night, I sat up and blankly stared into their room. My dad looked over and asked me if I was all right. I didn't respond, but I put my hand up and waved, kind of like Forrest Gump in that one gif. I'm not sure if my house is haunted or if I'm possessed or both, but weird things are definitely happening here. When I was between 2 and 14, I lived in a haunted house. Lights would turn on and off without any people in the room. My little brother, who was about three, would point and scream and cry at the corner where the front door connected to the garage wall. The worst thing was, I used to get in trouble for wearing shoes in the house while people were asleep. The thing is, I didn't even wear shoes in the house. I would take them off the minute I got home and leave them by the door. Whenever I left my bedroom door open during the night, I'd see a very tall man in a sort of old-timey barbershop hat standing in my doorway. When I closed the door on him, I would hear him walk down the hall. I'm also fairly certain that there were two graves in the crawl space under the house. I mean, anthills aren't usually six feet long right? I am a 27-year-old female, and my sister is 26, with a husband who is also 26, and a 9-month-old baby girl. They got married coming up on two years ago this summer. Just before they got married, they started to build a new house on a plot of land that's essentially in the woods, on a dead-end road with most of the 16 acres going uphill. The road itself is pretty quiet, with maybe 10 houses total, pretty spaced out new houses. They only have one next door neighbor. This is important. So, as I said, they just built this house not even three years ago. The thing with the property, though, is that they found at least one, and maybe another, partial house or building stone foundation. Now, our dad, being the history detective that he is, had found an old property map that basically said that there used to be a farmhouse right where their now backyard is, hence the stone foundation. My dad has gone there to do metal detecting quite a few times, and he's found some neat stuff. Some was just the typical metal containers, cans, trash, and junk that he found at the foundation, tossed in by who knows. 
but a few neat things were a belt buckle. What appears to be, according to his treasure hunting online forum, either a woman's or a child's sword or knife guard. And that dates to when the farmhouse was there, in the mid to late 1700s. Now for the spooky stuff. So I've stayed overnight there a few times, in the guest bedroom, over a year ago at least. My sister and I went out drinking, and I just ended up staying overnight. I was alone in the guest room, snuggled in bed, when I felt like something, or someone, was watching me. So much so that I pulled my blankets over my head and tried to sleep. Then I had the urge to close the closet door randomly. I eventually fell asleep and thought nothing of it after the fact. I never mentioned it to her or her husband, since they're both highly Catholic and participate in church and stuff, so I didn't think they would get me. That's the only experience I've had, if that counts. Fast forward to now. She sent me a photo on Sunday, which sparked our conversation. The picture was of her side entrance door that goes into the mudroom. In the top corner window, there is what appears to be, I haven't seen it in person, a smudged handprint. At first, my thought was, okay, maybe the builders did it, or maybe it was something there when the door was being made or put on. So I told her that, and then she texts back that it's not on the inside or the outside of the window. It's between the panes. Weird, right? My sister said that it was definitely not there before, since she's basically a neat freak and has washed the door windows before, many times. My second thought was we've had some rain and humidity recently, being almost summer and all, so maybe it was some moisture of fog and stuff like that that was between the glass panes that just looked like a handprint. It literally does look like a handprint though, after looking at the picture for a while. I'm studying the picture and I start to get this weird thought of maybe it's somebody scoping the house, but it's on the top window facing downward. And it's as if they or it had their left hand pointed down pressed from the outside. I tried to recreate how it would look or feel if I did it myself. It's an extremely awkward position especially if you're peeking into a door or window from the top pane, like six feet off the ground. She was thoroughly freaked out, I think. I usually try to eliminate all of the obviously logical reasons of what it could have been. A raccoon? A person? Moisture? I ask her if she's had anything weird happen, out of curiosity. This was her actual text message back to me. Quote, I was running on the treadmill a couple of months ago at night. My husband was gone, and I got a very forceful tap on my left shoulder, like someone wanted my attention." End quote. Obviously, I've redacted her husband's name. I think it was probably a muscle twitch or something, but she was freaked out after that. Then she goes on to say, quote, And I hear voices sometimes. My husband thinks I hear the neighbors, but when I'm inside, literally sounds like a man and a woman on our porch." End quote. It was a super quiet area. Like I said, they only had one neighbor. It could have possibly been her neighbors with sound traveling or something, but still. I asked about the baby, and she said that she does look off into random corners like she's watching something, but that doesn't seem that odd to me for a nine-month-old. Nothing really with the monitors, either. I'm going over today after work to see my niece. I meant to mention to her to maybe check on her carbon monoxide detectors, just to be safe. So, I'll tell her tonight. It's one of those situations where some of the stuff is pretty weird, and other stuff could possibly be explained. I was hesitant to even tell the story, since nothing super or overtly paranormal has happened yet just feelings and weird things. But I wanted your thoughts. What are your suggestions? What do you think is going on, if anything?
My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get-rich-quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to and his ego, unfortunately, got in the way of making a living. At times, he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums, which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, he invented and patented this newly engineered golf club and partnered with a few investors, and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally, and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird-ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful, and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both naughty pine as well, a little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic, or even wanted to open the door, though. The door looked like it was meant for children, though, almost like an entrance to a treehouse or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that, and I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, no. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them, or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway and I feel the air get thick, like I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house, but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team. Cool, if I ever cared about football at all. 
It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late, and we were told since it's Saturday we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up, and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other, and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother, and his back was to me. Then I go to look at the TV, which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan, and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV, and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down, and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there, in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later, with my sister, when we switched rooms. Because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened, and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started, the divorce happened, dad moved out, and mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school, and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time, and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme Burrito with no beans that she always orders. I get home and she's in the living room and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first you hear nothing. Then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him wondering who he is. You can't really tell what he's saying, only bits and pieces. But my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, please lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. 
My dad got sick of living with his own mother and the house was in his name. So he legally kicked my mom out. And at this point, my older sister moved in with her fiance and my other sister moved with mom to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic. Until around 2007. He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big, solid oak sleigh bed, and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, fate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room. A greaser type, with slick back hair and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic, and everyone heard that metal against concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left. And when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying no before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the naughty pine room caught a woman saying, crawl out, you have to crawl out. There were growls. There were snarky remarks said in the basement and a man's voice saying, where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel. You're dead, it's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us in my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. 
Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still. And we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange. My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life, and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get-rich-quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to, and his ego, unfortunately, got in the way of making a living. At times, he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums, which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, he invented and patented this newly engineered golf club and partnered with a few investors, and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally, and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird-ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful, and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both knotty pine as well, a little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic or even wanted to open the door though. The door looked like it was meant for children though, almost like an entrance to a tree house or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that. And I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, no. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway and I feel the air get thick. Like I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus 
because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house, but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team. Cool, if I ever cared about football at all. It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late, and we were told since it's Saturday we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up, and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother and his back was to me. Then I go to look at the TV, which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down, and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there, in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later with my sister when we switched rooms because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards, and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started. The divorce happened. Dad moved out and mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme burrito with no beans that she always orders. I get home and she's in the living room and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first you hear nothing, then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him wondering who he is. 
You can't really tell what he's saying, only in bits and pieces, but my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, please lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. My dad got sick of living with his own mother, and the house was in his name, so he legally kicked my mom out. And at this point, my older sister moved in with her fiancé, and my other sister moved with mom to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic. Until around 2007. He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big, solid oak sleigh bed, and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up, and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house, which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, fate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room. A greaser type, with slick back hair, and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic, and everyone heard that metal-against-concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left, and when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying, no, before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the Naughty Pine Room caught a woman saying, Crawl out. You have to crawl out. There were growls. There were snarky remarks said in the basement, and a man's voice saying, Where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel. You're dead. It's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, 
asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us and my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still, and we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange. My family friends lived in a small coastal town in California, and it has really old buildings there, including the original state capitol. They lived in an older house built around the 60s or 70s, and it was a single story home. I was small, maybe two to four years old, and my parents never let me or my brother go there. My uncle and auntie didn't really let anyone else go there either, because of, well, all of it. It was haunted by a little girl or something. They would see a shadow, ironically the dog's name is Shadow, down the hall, hear a laugh, doors would slam shut or suddenly open, and they would hear footsteps running around. The dog, Shadow, would stare down the hallway and start to growl and bark, and even start to whimper after they found scratch marks on him one time. After this, they didn't want anyone to go to their house, especially not kids. The daughter, who is the same age as I am, came crying to her mom, saying that the little girl with black hair and white threw a toy at her. The oldest brother had his lights flicker, his dog barking and his door slamming shut all the while. It scared the crap out of everyone. But one night, another one of my uncles had to drive by their house to pick up my uncle and auntie to go to a party. He saw a girl that looked like the daughter crouched on top of the van with her hair over her face, just tapping on the windshield of the car. He called my uncle to ask if their daughter was outside, but he said, nope, all the kids are at their grandparents. But as soon as he got off the phone, it was gone. In the morning, they saw a small handprint on the driver's side window and small scratches on the front windshield and a dead mourning dove on their porch. They moved about five months later. When I was a young child, about 10 or 11, I moved into a small country town. I've been there before and my parents grew up there. Everyone who lives there knows that the whole town is haunted, from the school and even the church hall to everything else. And once it goes dark, most people who live there go inside because you can see spirits walking in dark places and that's pretty much the extent of it. But the house that I lived in had a spirit who likes to mimic voices, specifically of your loved ones, and even likes to look like them. It would only target me and my older sisters, and only when we were home alone. I would wake up with bruises and scratches, same as my sister. One time I was home alone and heard my older sister call out for me from our room. I got up and saw her walk into our room just slightly, but I could tell it was her. I called her name, but she didn't answer, so I followed her in. I entered our room and saw that it was empty. I thought that she was messing with me, but she's pretty tall, so there wasn't really anywhere she could hide. Then suddenly I heard the front door open, 
I went and saw my older sister with the rest of my family coming home. She hadn't been there. This wasn't the first time that something like this happened, and it certainly wasn't the last. Fortunately, I moved out of there about two years ago, and I've never woken up with a random bruise or scratch ever again. In order to set a little background, this took place in Western Wyoming. It was a small town, and at the time it had maybe 2,500 people. This was the first home that I lived in during the time that I spent in Wyoming. We moved here because of my dad's job. The family and I weren't very enthusiastic because we loved our home in Oklahoma. My dad and mom went up and looked for houses without us so that we could finish school and wouldn't have to stay in a hotel. The housing market wasn't doing so well and the choices were very limited. In fact, it came down to one choice. The house that we had to move into was built in the 1930s and it was rather different from the house we moved out of. It was single story with a large basement. The staircase to the basement was immediately to the left when you walked into the front door. No door at the bottom and the steps were steep. It was fairly dark without any lights on. We move in within three weeks of being told that we're moving. My dad spent the first night there alone and never told us what he experienced until years later. We were about eight to 13 years old between my brother and sister, so he didn't want to scare us. He decided to sleep in the basement because the TV was down there and the basement was fairly large. He said that it was late, around 2 a.m., when the TV turned on to static by itself. He's not bothered too much by it, but then he hears a door creak open and some footsteps. After doing a little investigating, he lays down again but doesn't sleep much due to weird noises. Jumping forward sometime, this would be my first odd experience that would make me a believer later on in life. Every night, my sister and I would pick a VHS movie from a large bookshelf in the basement. Since I was too afraid to sleep in my room in the basement, we slept in a bunk in my sister's room. My mom tells us that it's time to put in a movie and go to bed, so we agree to head downstairs. My first choice was one of my two favorites, which was the land before time. I asked my sister without turning around, does land before time sound good to you? After about a minute, I get impatient and I say, well, how about the Lion King then? Not much more time passes and I get upset and I tell her, fine then, if you're not gonna say anything, we're gonna watch my movie. As I slowly turn around to address my sister, I see that nobody is there. Here's the real kicker. I look back to the large bookcase and see two shadows, plain as day. My shadow, which is to the left, and a smaller shadow that clearly looks like a little girl on the right. This is when I realize something is not right and I freak out. After screaming and starting up the stairs, I take one final look back to see that the little girl is moving down the hallway to my room. Well, at least her shadow is. There was absolutely nobody in the basement to produce that shadow. The shadow disappears into my room and then to top it off, the light comes on. So I'm screaming bloody murder at this point and I run to tell my parents. They tell me that it was just my imagination. So then I ask where my sister is and they tell me that she's been in her room waiting for me to bring up a movie. Again, years later, I get told that they had both seen a little girl in the house, too. They knew full well that it was not my imagination. The last thing that happened was to my brother. He had a room in the basement, but he wasn't a chicken like I was. One late night, he was woken up to his door creaking open. He thought it was me because sometimes I would get scared and come sleep with him. After a few moments, he said a small head peeked through the door. He said, 
What's wrong, buddy? Can't sleep? The door slowly shuts, and he hears footsteps down the hall to my room. He decides to get up and come see what, who he thought was me, was doing. After leaving his room, he sees my light is on and my door is open. He walks into the room, and every single toy from my wooden toy box is out. This is very unusual for me, because my parents were quite strict and would kick my butt if I left my room like that. He asks me the next day what I was doing down in my room so late, and I had no idea what he was talking about. My mom vouched that I was passed out in her room after we all watched movies. To sum up this story, my brother and I both had recurring dreams about a little blonde girl being stuffed into my toy box in the closet. Another dream that we both had was this kind of tall old man beating us in the basement bathroom. We've come to think that maybe a kid was killed in that house and the negative energy manifested because of that. Something I forgot to mention, all the toys were cleaned up the next day and were meticulously placed, all standing up in an odd order. Nobody in my family ever placed them like that, and no one had been in the basement aside from my brother, and he said that he certainly didn't do it. In any case, I'm really glad we don't live there anymore. All the homes in my neighborhood were built in 2009 or 2010, seven homes in all. One of the homes across the street was purchased by a single female with two boys and a child on the way. Her boyfriend did live with her, but didn't help purchase the home, and he was not a good guy. They fought all the time. I'm pretty sure he was on meth, and he cheated on her constantly. He even tried to approach me. So, I reiterate, not a good guy. Toward the end, he started getting abusive. She had him locked up, but let him come back when he got out. One day, an ambulance showed up at the home. We were all told that he had committed suicide, had gotten high on meth and shot himself in the bathroom. All right, this was believable. After his death, she asked me to help her watch the home as his friends and family were accusing her of killing him and were pulling up into her driveway and then leaving and basically just trying to harass her. I thought this was suspicious, but whatever. As a single mom, she had to work all the time. The oldest boy would watch the little one while she worked. He would always come down to my house to stay, but wouldn't tell me why. But I liked the kid, so no worries. About four years went by like this and she told me she was moving. I was kind of shocked because these were really nice homes and fairly cheap, but I figured it was just because of what had happened previously. Finally, she told me that they were moving because of the paranormal activity in the home since his death. The little one was the most bothered by it and that's why he stayed at my house all the time. She proceeded to tell me what really happened. They were in a fight and he had a gun in his hand and was threatening to shoot her. They had a struggle over the gun, resulting in him shooting himself behind the ear. He fell to the ground, crawled down the hallway, and died in the living room. The little one said that he could see him at night, crawling down the hallway. The doors would open and close on their own, and they would hear disembodied voices and feel negative energy, stuff like that. She said her guests would see and hear stuff too. She wouldn't go into much detail and I understood why I didn't press the issue. The boys were struggling in school and she wasn't doing so well either. They moved and the house sat empty for about a year now. Well, my daughter and her husband have decided to purchase this home. I asked them what they would do if they saw him crawling down the hallway at night. They joke about it, but I mean, come on, that would be some scary shit. If you've never really experienced anything paranormal before, or hell, even if you had. My son-in-law is a huge skeptic, but my daughter has had some experiences. 
I wonder if it's still active or if he moved on when they left. A morbid part of me can't wait to find out. So this isn't anything too crazy, but I do have a little story about my childhood home. It was the summer of 2012. Life was good, and I was up at 2 a.m. watching Teen Nick in my house's den. The whole house was always fascinating to me. One of the first houses built in our small town in Kansas during the Prohibition as a moonshiner's illegal party house. The whole house is a colonial style full of Victorian features. From the outside, it looks like a two-story, but there are actually three floors and a half a basement. The architecture was always confusing as to how this was accomplished, but wedged between the top and main floor is a log cabin-themed room, our family room and den. It was a glorified bar room fitted with a monstrous fireplace an Alaskan moose head from about 1920, and a salvaged chandelier from the former Douglas Opera House. I always hated being in that room at night because I always got a weird sensation, like someone standing over me when I would try to sleep on the couch after a long night of TV. My best friend and I also felt like this from time to time, sleeping in my own bed, which used to be the master suite. Never could get the cat or the dog to hang out in the den, though. Its door was an inch thick of solid wood and had a very complex lock that remained tucked inside its latch since no previous owners had the key. We never bothered to close it. It would get stuck in the frame because it was so heavy, designed to keep the police out if someone tipped off a booze party. There was a nursery on the top floor that shared a wall with this room. It was sold to us with no doorknob to the small 4x10 room. It became our home office. There was a brand new computer and an all-in-one printer and fax machine that remained unplugged, rarely used. My bedroom was right next to it and I always slept with my door open. In the middle of the night, I could often see the computer light up and paper would cycle through the printer. The unplugged printer. I could never get myself to check it out until the morning. Whenever I looked on the sheets, there was nothing on them, and we would just load them back inside. It was my sister and I's favorite place to pirate scary movies. We would close the door so as not to disturb mom and dad since it didn't latch. But one night, she left me in the room to go get a snack, and when she came back, she couldn't open the door. I was trapped inside. My mom had to use a butter knife to force the handle. I was kind of shook given the timing. But back to the den. I'm minding my teen Nick business when out of the blue I get a call from my friend. She tells me that she's doing a Ouija board session, which I've always done my part to stay far away from. She says that her presence told her to call me. She informed me that I was wearing a black shirt which I was and I only own one. I hung up the call and immediately went to my bedroom to wait out the next few hours to daylight. That same summer, my mom, grandma, sister, and I went on one of our late night drives where we would blast oldies cruising the back roads. As we were driving, an unidentifiable creature ran in front of our car and across the road. None of us agreed on what we saw. We thought that it was a very large white rabbit or cat or small dog. It was moving unthinkably fast for any of those animals though. It made it across the road in two hops. At the time we joked about it and kept on our way. When we got home and stepped into the foyer, heavy work boots start down the upstairs hall and down the stairs. They stop at the den level. From the foyer, you can see the part of the staircase that leads to the den, and no one is there. We're all looking at each other, waiting for my father to continue his trip down the stairs. Then he comes up from the basement, followed by our dog. 
The cat is chilling in a window on the main floor. We sent him upstairs to investigate. He checked everywhere, even the attic, and there was nothing. Could all be a coincidence. When we moved into an apartment that fall, nothing else strange seemed to happen though. I'm tempted to ask the family who lives there now if they've ever experienced anything. The original owners are buried in the morgue just down the street. And sometimes I think they make a trip to their old home. In 2006, I was 18 and had moved to Victoria, BC with my best friends. We were working as construction laborers for said friend's father, and he had put us up rent-free in a very old home close to downtown. Not directly related to this story, but from our living room, we could see Beacon Hill Park. It was literally 50 feet away. And the father's favorite local watering hole was the James Bay Inn pub which we frequented often. Both, I realize afterwards, were places of numerous accounts of paranormal activity. The Beacon Hill doppelganger is a well-known, well-documented, unbelievable story, and I suggest Googling it. The James Bay Inn pub was formerly a care center in the 1940s, and a national treasure of ours, Emily Carr, passed away in a room that is now the men's washroom for the pub. I did not experience anything at either location, but I'm just emphasizing that Vic is supposedly one of the West Coast's most haunted cities, and the proximity may or may not have had something to do with this, but I digress. The house we were in was very unsettling right off the bat. Holes in the upstairs drywall, like a previous tenant had thrown their entire body at the wall. The unfinished basement had two by four framed walls, no drywall, isolating several bedrooms, which were pieces of plywood on four cinder blocks for a bed. Squatters had been there. It had windows with no panes of glass anymore, only wrought iron to block intruders. Just a place you only go to use the laundry machine or dispose of trash. The trash is important. The kitchen was obviously old, had faded green linoleum floors and a big spot in the middle that had been sanded down to the wood subflooring and we thought nothing of it. Being in our first place with no supervision, we were typical semi-responsible guys and treated the house with a decent amount of respect. After a few months of working and partaking in nights on the town, as well as drinking a fair amount, we grew lazier and more careless in maintaining our space. For some reason that I can't totally recall, we had begun to throw our bags of trash into the basement, as it wasn't being collected by the city. This became increasingly easier and easier to do. We had two puppies living with us, a Chihuahua and a British Bulldog. One day after work, I was taking a shower and the Chihuahua was mulling about in the bathroom. The door had no handle, just a small chain lock so it could sway three to four inches open or closed. A very distinct three knocks occur and I see the door move. No biggie. I just say, almost done, assuming my friends needed the bathroom. The dog is now trying to get into the tub or shower with me. I finish up and towel off and go tell my buddies that it's all theirs, but nobody's home. I call them and they're all at the gym and have been for a while. I grab the dog and leave immediately and we drive around the city as my mind races. I return later and my story barely shakes up my very macho friends. Maybe a week later, I'm in bed and I have a floor lamp with a dimmer and an indicator LED on that dimmer to let you know that there's power to the light. The light is fully on like every night. So I close my eyes and the light is now off, but the LED is on, so I know the light has power. After I get done checking that it has power, I think nothing of it, close my eyes and the light goes back on. I say a few prayers, sleep, everything's okay. 
but something had adjusted the dimmer in that room. Next week, I find myself home alone with the dog sitting on the living room couch. We had a set of flimsy sliding double doors that we kept closed and they were directly across from me. Out of nowhere, the doors shake as though somebody had punched them as hard as they possibly could. It was loud and extremely aggressive. So again, I grab the pooch and beeline for the front door, exiting the living room. I remember preparing myself to see something down the hall as I leave the front door, but I see nothing, and I drive around town for a few hours. After this, my friend and the bulldog would sleep on the floor of my room every night, and the other friend would start sleeping in the living room right beside us. They had smaller encounters, like faucets and lights switching on and off, but neither was the type to talk much about it. But my macho friends were all sleeping as close together and to me as possible. They were freaked out. I never saw an apparition and those stories were as scary as it got. Upon having enough of the job in town, I informed the friends and the father that I would be moving back to the mainland. Months later, word got back to me that their dad never told us the previous longtime owner of the home had passed away in the kitchen and hadn't been found for three months, hence the scrub down linoleum. As he said it, the gentleman had almost melted into the floor and the dad knew that we wouldn't want to live there with that knowledge. As months went by and I thought more about it, it dawned on me how much we disrespected his home. We had a five foot tall trash mountain in his basement, which we never went down to anymore, just threw the bags down the stairs. And the house in general was just a mess. I concluded that he was manifesting his energy to, in a sense, tell us to clean up our freaking act. And rightfully so. I never had any sense of malice or ill intent upon me. I truly believe he meant us no harm. I don't think he wanted to terrify us either. It's just that he was part of that house and wanted some respect. There's a little boy that inhabits my mom's house. My mom has owned her home for 18 years now. There have always been small, bizarre occurrences around the house, the kind that you can explain away or simply ignore. Things falling off of counters or going missing, strange noises or that feeling of being watched, footsteps down the hallway all the time. We never talked about it and I never felt scared or even had any idea that our house was actually haunted until one night. The bathroom at the house is located at the very end of a long hallway, and my bedroom is directly next to it. It was summertime, and I was about 14 or 15, that age where you would stay up talking to your friends on the phone all night. I was on the phone with my best friend. It was 4 a.m., when I distinctly heard footsteps running down the hallway, into the bathroom, and the bathroom light clicks on. Immediately, I get up to check out what's going on, thinking that maybe it's one of my younger sisters. If somebody like my younger sister was running to the bathroom at 4 a.m., obviously something is wrong and I wanted to help. Maybe 10 seconds elapsed before I look into the bathroom. There's nobody there and the light is on. I check on my sisters and my mom. Everybody in the house is sleeping like the dead. I'm absolutely horrified, and my friend on the phone experienced the whole thing with me. The next day I told my mom. She tells me that she knows the house is haunted by a little boy in a red sweater, because she has seen him herself running down the hallway. Years later, my stepdad on one end of the hallway and my mom on the other both see him again, the boy in the red sweater. He yells like a child playing and runs down the hallway into the bathroom, and then he disappears. Something about this is just inherently sad to me, the idea of a child stuck in a purgatorial loop. What was he running from? What was he running to? 
Who is he? Or who was he? And what happened to him? I live in a relatively old house in Scotland. I have always felt another presence at home, and I have believed in the paranormal since forever. It all started when my sister and I heard the floorboards creak in the middle of the night. When she went to check, nobody was there, and the entire family was fast asleep. A little while later, I woke up and I saw a little girl in my room just looking at me before literally jumping and never seeing her again. Until recently, I always thought that I had tricked myself into imagining her, as I remember dreaming about a child and playing with this girl. The other day, my sister heard a little girl giggling. She's the only girl in the house now. When she told me, I instantly connected this to seeing the little girl. But perhaps this could explain more occurrences as well. My sister once told me a while back that sometimes when she looks out of the corner of her eye at the doorways, she would see a shadowy figure darting from room to room. I didn't really believe her. Well, until it happened to me. I was sitting in my parents' bed because I sleep in a closet-sized room with no Wi-Fi, and I glanced up to see this shadowy figure skip into the bathroom. I immediately went to check to see if anybody was there, and to my surprise, the room was empty. But nothing will ever scare me as much as what happened about a year ago. I woke in the middle of the night or early morning, which is very unusual for me. I should mention that I sleep facing the wall as I hate being open to the rest of my room. I laid on my back for a brief second or two before hearing three perfectly synced and identical claps. At the time, I assumed some robber or burglar was checking to see if I was awake, so I bolted under the sheets and faced the wall, lying motionless as I was terrified. My brother and sister were away at the time, so I was home alone with my parents. In the morning, I asked them if it was them, and they said no. My parents have never been sleepwalkers or anything of the sort. After doing some research, I found out that apparently ghosts clap to communicate sometimes. My biggest regret is not looking to see who, or what, was clapping. My whole family believes me though, excluding my skeptical brother. Can anyone explain this? Or has anyone experienced anything like it? I'd love to know. I live in a small town in Canada, and my house was built in 2007. Before that, it was farmland. My great-grandmother and her kids immigrated here from Ecuador in the 70s. Throughout my family's bloodline, every woman in the family is believed to have had some kind of sixth sense. My great-grandmother's sister was a powerful medium. My grandmother's older sister is also a medium and reads palms. My mother does tarot readings and informs me on her past experiences with ghosts when she lived in Toronto with my grandmother and great-grandmother. Ever since I was a baby, I've been seeing ghosts everywhere. My grandma told me that I would point to the corner and talk to it like somebody was there. I'm 16 now and I've been living in this house for the past 15 years. Paranormal experiences have happened to me here for as long as I can remember so it's just a normal thing now. My mom doesn't encourage me thinking about those things though. She tells me it's all in my head. A month ago, my dad's parents came up from Texas to renovate our basement. On their last day, my grandpa told me that he thought our basement was haunted because of all the voices he was hearing near the cold room. I told my mom about this and she lowered her voice and told me that she had lied to me. She had said that it was all in my head, but she'd been telling me that to protect me. 
it wasn't all in my head, and that I had been seeing ghosts. She used to keep me in her room as a child and pray to God to keep the spirits away from me, because she saw them too. So far, I've noticed one ghost or entity or something that keeps reappearing in different places. I first saw her when I was eight or nine. My cousin and I saw her in my closet. She had pale skin, long blue-black hair, and wore a deep blue dress. The most notable feature is that her nails were painted a shiny metallic blue that glistened in the dark. She held out her hand to us and we ran away. The second time was when I was 11. At the time, I had a loft bed that was up near my ceiling. My bedroom is on the second floor. I was lying in bed after coming home from school and I saw that lady slowly walk by my window. Her nails were still painted that shiny blue. It was the most notable ghost I've ever seen. Ghost in quotations because I'm not really sure if that's what she is. Apart from that, my younger brother and I, Lex, both saw a glass cup on our table slowly slide over to the other side of it. I always see figures in my room and hear music in the shower drain. My entire family hears people talking in our bedrooms. My brother and I have started to wake up with long scratches all over us. The house was blessed by a priest when it was made, but I don't think it worked, or maybe it wore off. I'm getting scared, and I don't know what to do. Update. We had a priest from our local church come to bless our house again, but I don't think it was effective. A few weeks ago, I had the house to myself with my brothers, while my parents and grandparents were out. Lex and I were watching TV in the living room when we saw our youngest brother, Michael, age 10, sprint out of the washroom and into the dining room which isn't visible from where we were. We didn't think anything of it, until Michael came out of his bedroom on the second floor to get snacks. We were absolutely terrified and retreated upstairs. Maybe I'm just doomed to live in a house with ghosts. If you like haunted houses, you would love my dad's home. It's a two-story brick home, built by a family back in the 1840s. It was owned by the same family until my dad bought it. There's a rumor that it has a tunnel entrance on the property because of the Underground Railroad. I lived there by myself for several years during college. Dad lived with his girlfriend. Paranormal stuff happened on the daily, so much so that it was just routine. Footsteps throughout the house and going up and down the stairs during the day was typical, but mostly at night and in the early morning. If it was at night, I would usually just turn up the TV. Several times, I was woken up by a man who shouted, Hey! When I'd look around, a man's silhouette could be seen leaning casually against the doorway of my room. I got the feeling that this ghost didn't like me but I didn't really give a damn and I would just roll back over and go to sleep. Often, I would also wake up to the feeling of my bed shifting, as though somebody had sat down. Once I felt something rub my back, not in a malicious kind of way, more like a motherly way. I'll also experience very strong and sudden aromas. They'll come out of nowhere and last just for a few seconds. Usually it's cigar smoke, my dad and I don't smoke, old ladies' perfume, or freshly baked bread. Items would always go missing and then magically reappear in other areas of the house. You never, ever feel alone. You always see somebody just out of the corner of your eye. I had to keep the blinds closed because I kept seeing somebody walk across our front or back porch, but nobody would ever be there. I always got the feeling that if you glanced at the top of the stairway, you would see somebody standing there. Very often, I would hear feminine humming. It definitely had tune and inflection. It wasn't our central heating or air conditioning or anything mechanical like that. After a particularly active paranormal night, 
The next morning, there was a random, dirty, rusty, handmade nail, about three inches long, laying on its side outside of my bedroom. The only time I felt genuinely scared was when I was playing a video game at about 4 p.m. I heard the front door open, and my dad whistled his distinctive whistle. I heard footsteps and keys being placed on the counter. Without looking up from the game, I said, Hey dad, I didn't know you were coming here today. I would have ordered pizza or something. He didn't answer me, and I thought maybe he just didn't hear me. So I paused my game and went into the kitchen. It was totally empty. No keys on the counter. His shoes weren't by the door. The door was locked and his car was not in the driveway. I thought, wow, kind of rude for him to leave so soon. So I called him and said, where'd you go in such a hurry? Dad sounded confused. I haven't left work. I'll be here late tonight. My dad works about an hour and a half away. There's probably more things that I just can't remember right now. My friends have all hated that house and they would never come over. Whenever family comes over, they get weirded out by the vibes, which is strange because most of them don't believe in these things. I grew up in southern Pennsylvania, not far from Gettysburg. When I was eight years old, my parents decided to build a house on vacant property, surrounded by fields, and it was beautiful. I lived with both of my parents and my two older brothers, who were 15 and 17 at the time. Though I grew up in the area, we only stayed in this house for four years. My first night there was not what I expected it to be. I was laying in my bed and had just closed my eyes. Then I heard a voice that sounded like a soft whisper, about six inches from my face, say, help, help, over and over, just repeating the same word until I finally fell asleep. I tried my best to forget about it, because I thought there was no way the house could be haunted. It was brand new. Certainly I was just tired. About a month goes by, and I'm sitting on my bed, doing what I used to love doing most, which was read. I glanced up and looked at my doorway, because I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. At that moment, I had officially seen a full-body apparition of what appeared to be a soldier from the 1800s, but he didn't see me. He was just walking by my room, very slowly. I still remember every detail of his appearance 20 years later. He was covered in blood and looked like he'd been shot or stabbed. This lasted for about five seconds. Still being creeped out, my curiosity got the best of me and I walked out of the room and searched all over the house, but I found nothing unusual. About a week or two goes by and I'm in my bed, trying to fall asleep yet again, only to be disturbed before I even had the chance to close my eyes. This voice was very deep and masculine. I couldn't understand a word it was saying because it was speaking in a different language. It sounded annoyed and angry. It happened every night at the exact same time for two weeks, before it suddenly and inexplicably stopped. After that, I had a night terror. I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I had woken up in the middle of the night and I could see what looked like a tarantula crawling on me in bed. I swear it was there, I definitely saw it. I was panicking. My dad came in the room to check on me and found that everything was okay. No spider. Before I could fall asleep though, I heard what sounded like two men laughing right next to my bed. At this point, I was getting used to all the messed up things that were happening. One summer, I stayed up late every night so I could watch Hannah Montana at midnight. One night, when the clock struck midnight, I heard my back door downstairs open. Then I would hear a woman say my name, as if she was calling for me or looking for me. I'd hear the door shut, 
followed by footsteps, and then there would be silence. This happened every night for almost two months. It never failed. It didn't even bother me at this point. I knew it wasn't my mother, because she worked 12-hour night shifts at the hospital almost every night. There were no other females around. But one night, it too stopped altogether. I was up at midnight, and nobody had called my name. I went to sleep, and everything felt peaceful for once. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my bedroom door. I looked at the clock on my cable box. It was 3 a.m. I assumed that it was one of my brothers, and I told them to go away. But then, the doorknob started turning. But it wouldn't open because the door was locked. I have always slept with my bedroom door open. Always. And I definitely wasn't the one who locked it. The knocking and doorknob rattling went on for what felt like forever. And then it stopped. A few minutes later, I hear what sounds like scratching at the door. I think to myself, what the heck? Is it my cat? But then the knocking, scratching, and turning of the handle start happening at the exact same time. No way in hell my cat could do all three at once, let alone the knocking and turning of the doorknob. It would happen for about 30 seconds, and then it would stop. It happened at least five times. Sometimes the knocking would be so hard it sounded like pounding, and my whole door was shaking. Whatever was on the other side of that door really wanted to come in. It got so bad that it woke my dad up. He heard all of the commotion, and as soon as he opened his bedroom door, it all stopped, instantly. He called out to me, but I was too afraid to say anything. He went back into his room and closed the door, but the same scenario repeated itself three more times. My dad made me sleep in his room. We never spoke about it. Ever. Things seemed to be fine, for a while. Then whatever was in my house struck again. My brother had gotten up to go to the bathroom. He turned the hallway light on, noticed that my bedroom door was closed as it was across the hall from the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the hallway light is off and my bedroom door was wide open. He looked inside my room and saw me still sleeping. Everyone else in the house was sleeping. He woke my dad and brother and told them what had happened. They searched the house for a possible intruder, but found nothing. More months go by and we are all awoken by our smoke detector going off in the middle of the night. We all go downstairs in a panic, just to find out that the stove was on, full blast. Big flames on top of the stove in the middle of the night. What the hell? One day, it was just my father and I. My mom was at work, as usual. My oldest brother was at work, and my other brother was at baseball practice. I'm downstairs, but I hear what sounds like somebody running upstairs. Forgetting that both of my brothers aren't home, I go up the stairs and see somebody run into my brother's room and slam the door. It was loud. I thought for sure it was my brother, and I wanted to go in there and see what he was up to and why he would be running around like that. I opened the door and nobody was there. I watched the door close right in front of me. I felt sick to my stomach just standing there, realizing that the only other person that was home was my father, and he was in the shower. I continued to see weird things all the time. One day, in the middle of the day, I saw my German Shepherd run upstairs full blast as if she was chasing something, but I never saw what she was chasing. Whatever it was went under the bed, and she was viciously growling at it. At first I thought it was my cat, until I saw him sitting on top of the bed. It appeared that he had been sleeping until we burst in and woke him up. One night, my cousin was spending the night. We were walking through the living room when she saw the reflection of another person on the glass of our big bookcase. Another time, we were in my backyard, and she told me that she saw somebody looking at us through the window. I guess this happened on a few occasions, but it wasn't anybody we knew. My brothers almost never had friends over, so that was not a possibility. I remember one day I was walking down the basement stairs. 
When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw what looked like another apparition. Except, the apparition looked exactly like my older brother. But it also didn't look human. It was almost white and blue, and his eyes were pure black, like something trying to be him. When he saw me, his eyes got really big, and he looked terrified, and ran away and went into the crawl space. I ran upstairs to find out that my brother wasn't even home. I never went back down there after that. A few months later, I was with the same brother, and we were in the living room watching George Lopez late at night. I'm into the show, but he muted the TV. He looked at me and said, Did you hear that? I told him no, I hadn't heard anything. We sat still for a minute, and then I did hear it. Together, we both heard footsteps coming up the basement stairs. My brother grabbed a baseball bat, and we went to the basement to investigate but to no avail. The rest of our family was sleeping upstairs. The next night, my mom was up late at night sitting at the dining room table, doing whatever it was she was doing. Around 3 a.m., the shelf in the dining room blew off the wall and put a hole in the wall that was adjacent to it. We looked at the nails in the wall that had held the shelf in place, and they were still perfectly straight. We moved out of that house when I was 12, I still experience paranormal things, but nothing that comes close to what I dealt with in that house. I believe there were a lot of spirits there, and I'd love to know about what happened there previously to cause so much activity. We were a regular church-going family, so I'm sure if there was anything demonic there, that probably pissed it off even more. But I don't know. What do you think it could have been? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? All of the above? What's your story? Back in the 90s, my parents would often move from house to house. Before I was born and they were pregnant with my sister, they moved into a new house complete with a lake in the backyard. It was pretty old, but still comfy. My parents thought it was all fine, until some strange things began to happen. For starters, they said that when taking showers, the radio would often switch to random static noises, the lights would flicker, and hair dryers would just shut off suddenly. All right, no big deal. Just an old house. Nothing strange at all. Of course, my parents started speculating some strange things were happening after living in it for a few months. One night, they had some friends over. This picture of a little boy was hanging on the wall, overlooking the living room. My parents joked around and talked about how it was evil or something. Just as they did that, all of the lights turned off, as if on cue. One night, both of them were sitting in bed, trying to fall asleep. My mom told me that while sleeping, this weird blowing noise blew right in her ear. She said something like, stop doing that, thinking that it was my dad. He said, I'm not doing anything. They both felt this weird blowing noise in their ear, like right next to their ears. I would honestly be terrified too. Then finally, after having crazy and terrifying experiences, the last thing that happened was their breaking point. When getting home with groceries, the magnets on the fridge were strangely arranged differently than they had been before. Not only that, but while getting all of the bags out of the car, my mom swore that she saw a shadow flash by in the living room. My dad looked over and said that he saw it too. They both called the police thinking it was an intruder, but when the police arrived, they couldn't find anything. They ended up living there only six months. That was the last straw. When they moved out, there were some rumors going around that supposedly somebody had died in that lake behind their yard. When they came back to see the house a little while later, it had been condemned.
I first want to talk about the recent experience I had at my house while I was trying to astral project. I was laying down, doing the techniques, when I suddenly hear somebody breathing right next to me and my dog. At first I thought it was my dog, since sometimes he moves around in his sleep. And I think he has nightmares. While I'm hearing the breathing, I look at my dog, but I can hear him breathing and it's a different pattern than the one that was right next to me. My next experience haunts me to this day. I was in bed when my dad and I hear the gate button being pressed. It connects to an iPad. We ran downstairs to investigate since we suspected that it might be the police. We open the app to see that it's a black screen. Peculiar, but it was because of the Wi-Fi. For some extra context, the gate camera will snap a photo of the person who pressed the button to be let in. It took two photos. My dad and I went to the windows to see any lights, but there were none. There was nobody in the photo. The next experiences somewhat relate to each other. This happened when I was walking home from school. I was strolling down my road when I hear someone yell, Hey! I turned to see if it was my neighbor, since we have a few houses on the small patch of road. No one was there. I walked next door to see if anybody was home there, but nobody was. The second thing that happened was I was walking in the forest on my property. I was walking on this little trail when I hear snap. Not like a twig. It sounded like a firm finger snap. We have tenants down in the yard, but how they could snap so close to me when no one was there is beyond me. It had to have been somebody standing right next to me. It wasn't an echo or anything like that, but nobody was there. The last experience has given me a wider sense of the paranormal. I was dragging the lawnmower when I hear an old woman's voice say, Hey! I turn to see nobody there, so I keep dragging it. Then I hear, Stop! It was so loud that I dropped everything and had to look. Nobody was there. I want to be honest. We do have a tenant downstairs, but why would she be yelling at me? I kept dragging the mower, and then I heard mumbling, and then the voice disappeared. What's even creepier is that my neighbor's grandmother lived in this house. When she died, I think he just decided it was better off cutting the property in half, sell one side, my house, and then make his house on the other. So maybe it was her thinking that I was him or not being happy I was in half of her house. In any case, it's definitely been interesting. I bought my first house nine months ago. It's a huge accomplishment for me. On the evening after I closed on the house, I had a little champagne toast in the new place. I invited my boyfriend, my sister, we'll call her Jenna, her four-year-old daughter, we'll call her Mary, my best friend, Aunt T, and my son and brother who live with me. It only lasted an hour or two. I gave everyone the tour. My best friend and Jenna wanted to stop in every room and talk about my plans for it. I ordered pizza. Like I said, we had a small champagne toast. My niece, Mary, had a great time running through the house. She and my sister have a 700 square foot apartment, so my place seemed huge to her. Mary loved my room. I have a closet in my room with a built-in pedestal kind of thing, so we sat her on it and joked that it could be her room. All in all, it was a good time. Everyone who didn't live there headed out at about the same time, starting with Jenna and Mary. It was a school night after all. Not even five minutes after Jenna and Mary left, my sister calls me, still driving home. She sounds shaken, and I was worried for a second that her car had broken down or she got into an accident, but no. Jenna said that she had asked Mary if she'd had a good time and if she liked Aunt Dee, that's me, and my new place. Mary said, yeah, I had fun with Aunt Dee, Aunt T, and the little girl. 
My sister said she actually pumped the brakes on the car because her instinct was to stop the car in its tracks. The thing is, there were no other children in the house that night, just Mary. Jenna's not trying to scare Mary, but she wants to know more. So very gently, she asks, Oh, what little girl? Mary says, the one that was standing behind Aunt Dee all night. My sister presses her a little more and asks Mary what the little girl looks like. Mary says she has long black hair and she had on a pretty blue dress. My sister asked if the little girl had spoken to her. Mary said no, she was really shy, but they had fun chasing each other through the house. And the little girl was sitting in her house, aka my closet, when we opened the door. Mary hesitated to walk into the closet at first and I didn't know why. Now I know. So apparently I have a little ghost girl in my house. She likes my closet and me. My house was built in 1900, so it does have a long history, but I haven't looked into it yet. I haven't heard or seen a thing in this house since I moved in, but I did not sleep well for the first few nights. The ghetto where I'm from is divided by a golf course. One side of the street is project housing, and the other side is nicer homes built in the 30s to 90s, before the projects were there. I lived in a 1934 two-bedroom house, bright yellow tile. I was 26, and I lived with my girlfriend who was 24. After living there a few months, my girlfriend started saying she felt uneasy in the hallway which was very small and had a crawl space in the ceiling. I brought my dad over to get up there and take a look because, you know, could be something scary up there. He found nothing except insulation. A while later, I took a nap for about two hours. My girlfriend was in the next room folding laundry after work. She comes to wake me up, shaking my shoulder. She asks how long I'd been asleep. I said a couple of hours. She said, so you didn't just walk through the house? I said, no. She said, but I just saw you walk through the hallway. I asked if she was sure, and she said yes. I told her it wasn't me, and there's no one else in the house. Fast forward a year. I'm trying to quit smoking, and I lost my vape. My buddy had been staying at my house for a couple of weeks, and he's helping me look for my vape. I walk out to the car and I get in the driver's seat. I'm digging between the seat and the gear shift, and suddenly, something or someone is talking into my ear. Not whispering, speaking, right into my left ear. There's that SOB right there, it says. I'm frozen. It's the dead of night. Nobody is around. My buddy is still inside. After about a minute of complete silence, I finally open the car door and go back inside. I tell him what just happened. That's when he goes, huh, probably the same person that calls my name at night. What? He'd been hearing somebody say his name from behind him on the couch he slept on at night ever since he started staying with me. I'm creeped out, but not enough to move. The rent was great and I was not easily shaken. Fast forward a few months. My mom comes over to pick me up and to go shopping. I throw on a shirt in front of the hallway and say, Hey, how does this look for today? My mom turned around and her eyes go over my head. She starts to back up and tries to adjust her eyes. I said, What? She said that a black shadow had just gone up the wall behind me into the room behind me. I thought, oh, so now there's that. Fast forward a few months more and I'm watching TV in the living room with my buddy. We hear a loud bang. We go into the kitchen and all the cabinets are open. A single jar of Nutella is on the floor and a huge hole has been punched in the wall beside the refrigerator. Interesting, but I'm still not leaving. Fast forward a few more months. My buddy moved out, my girlfriend and I broke up, and she moved. 
I was living there alone for the first time. I go to lay down one night. My bed was freshly made, so the covers were tight. I cut the light and laid my head back. Suddenly, there's pressure on either side of my feet, like someone has one hand beside each side of my foot and is pressing down, as if you're looking over top of me. It lasted all of 30 seconds before I sat up and turned the light back on. Nothing there. Still not moving. Fast forward. I get a new girlfriend. She starts staying over. She says she sees faces in the mirror in the hallway. I'm like, yeah, weird things happen here. Nothing has ever tried to harm me, so I stay. This goes on for a couple of months, until one day I come home to my girlfriend on the porch. It's dark. She says she will not go back in that house while I'm gone. She convinces me to move. I'm in love. I want her to be comfortable. So we're in our new house and I'm on my laptop, going through old photos and videos that I took at the old house. I find videos of myself being recorded from my laptop, but I'm not pressing record. It was videos of me watching TV, working out, leaving my bedroom and walking through the house. It stops all on its own. All of the videos were about a minute or so long. I went to the courthouse and found records where the owner and also the town sheriff had died there of old age. And the community seems to believe that there was some kind of brothel there at some point, due to a red light on the porch. I'm sure that was just a rumor. One of the neighbors said someone had shot themselves in the house, but I couldn't find a record of that either. I wish I could go on about other instances at the old haunted house, but I've gone on long enough. It was 2009 to 2013, rent was 625, and honestly, I wish I had never left. I grew up in a haunted house through my childhood years and when I was a young adult. Sometimes I wonder if it was real or just in my head, but I wanted to talk about it. Heads up, there is some mention of animal death in this story, so if that's not your thing, maybe don't listen to or read it. Anyway, when I was a very young child, I lived in a very old house. I think the house was originally built in the early 1900s. It was originally a doctor's office and home. Right next door was the town's hospital. The house was originally a one-story, one-bedroom, one-bath house and was later turned into a three-bedroom, one-bath, one-story house in 1960. I live in fear in that house. All you felt living in that house was fear and nothing else. I would either look down at the floor or close my eyes if I had to get up and walk to the bathroom. I always felt watched, and sometimes when I walked into the kitchen to get to the bathroom, something invisible would come up and hit me, or my body, or I'd be checked to the side. It would also happen if you stood at the kitchen sink. Something invisible would come from nowhere and body check you to the side. Then we had our dad's old non-battery operated plug-in radio that would turn itself on all the time. Even when it wasn't plugged in, it would still go on, all on its own. It did for years, and we just got used to it. But then we had a social worker therapist lady come for a visit. We came and sat down at the kitchen table to talk about the radio turning on with the lady there. I tried to do my best to ignore it, but I couldn't, and I had to explain to the lady what happened. She was actually okay with it. Apparently, it wasn't her first time with the paranormal, so that was cool. Years go by, and I'm home alone taking a bath. Out of the blue, the front door opened and slammed shut, and I could hear somebody stomping all the way through the house and into the kitchen, and then stop. I got out of the tub quickly, covered myself with a towel, and then threw the bathroom door open. No one was there. I was still home alone. You can't break into my dad's house. My dad put in key entry only locks and hard bar grids over the outside of the windows. 
The living room windows were triple paned and the bedroom windows were double paned. That house was like Fort Knox. Again, a few years later, my big sister lost her keys one day. She always put them in the same spot every day, but that one day when she went to get them, they just weren't there. We searched everywhere for the keys, and when we finally stopped looking, the keys showed back up in the same spot they should have been in to begin with. The second time they disappeared, they were found outside on the ground in the drive. It was outside the fence. There was no reason for them to be there. The third time the keys went missing, they weren't found until many years later, inside the compartment in the dashboard area below the radio of the car. She didn't find them, but the car dealership that she took the car into to trade it in found them. That was pretty creepy. The house, or the negative thing in the house, turned Dad into a very negative person. He went from an awesome dad to a very abusive dad over the years. I took the brunt of that abuse because I was the youngest and the most sensitive to the paranormal. He never abused my big sister, just me. The negative thing in the house also grabbed dad and body checked him a few times, but he kept that to himself for years until we no longer lived there. One time when I was home alone in the house, I was standing in front of the kitchen but kind of standing sideways because the kitchen stove was next to the sink. Something in the living room in front of the pellet caught my attention and when I turned to look, I saw this mist or fog come up through the floor in front of the pellet stove and start moving toward the first bedroom. That was mine and my sister's bedroom and then it just disappeared in front of me. Oh, and this is the best one. When I came back home for a little bit when I was a young adult, my sister and I had a bed together for a few nights. But one night in bed, my sister in her sleep just sits in my bed right next to me. As soon as she laid down next to me, a very bright young man came up through the bed on my sister's side of the bed, leaned over her and grabbed my right leg below my knee. I wasn't asleep at all, and I was just laying there wide awake. I couldn't sleep because at that time, I was pregnant with my first son. But yeah, I could see the outline of this young man. He looked like a high school quarterback, slim, tall, biceps. He lit up the room, he was that bright. After he disappeared, I looked at the radio clock in our room. The time was 3.47 in the morning. We also had something in the house kill two of our cats with antifreeze. Someone opened a brand new bottle and dumped it in the corner of the house. Nobody was home when it happened. You needed a key to get into that house. One cat died right away, the other two weeks later. It was slowly killing two more of our cats. We could never keep pets in the home. They all started to die shortly coming back home. Years later, dad and sister moved out and he rented it to a friend from work. We had a six foot tall, large dog kennel in the back. The guy put his bulldog inside and chained him in the kennel. Then he locked it up and left for a few hours. Later, he found his dog hanging on the opposite side of the gate by its chain. Obviously, he was dead. That's never happened before and we had two dogs in that thing before and they were even bigger than the bulldog. We were all completely shocked when that happened. Even the work friend became a very negative person after moving into that house. To this day, I want nothing to do with that place. It now sits completely abandoned. Dad can't sell it, which honestly is probably for the best. It's not safe for anyone to live in. I was 13, soon to be 14, when I moved into this house. I was always very connected to the spiritual world because my mom was a very strong believer, and I was very curious about this topic. Everything was quite normal when we moved in, even though I had a weird feeling about a corner in my parents' room. That corner gave me a feeling of fear. Whenever I came into my parents' room, 
I got this unwelcoming feeling and an urge to leave, but I didn't think too much of it until I started to feel like I was being watched whenever I was home alone. The first time I really thought about the house being haunted was when my mom told me that for a second, she had felt like time stopped and she heard a male voice asking for help. At first I thought she was just trying to scare me, but she was genuinely very concerned about it. Even though that was pretty scary, my mom and I decided not to pay attention. We thought that if we just ignored it, it would stop and go away. A few months passed and nothing happened, at least nothing like what my mom had experienced. I still felt like I was being watched and I just couldn't stay in my parents' room, but the energy was really off. I was really depressed and my mom and dad started to fight a lot. My mom and I started to fight too. My mom was also feeling depressed and our life just took a downhill turn since we moved. Everything got worse when one of my cats died. After my little buddy died, I started to feel the strong smell of cigarettes and men's perfume and a masculine energy around the house. It wasn't the perfume or cologne that my dad used. My mom came to me asking if I had started smoking, and I said no, of course not, but that I had smelled the same smells as well. Then my mom told me that she had started to have these weird dreams about a man. I have to admit that while I felt very afraid of what was going on, I also felt this weird excitement to know more, and I started to do more research about paranormal activity. Now I don't know if that triggered it to get worse or not, but boy did it. I was now constantly feeling observed and oppressed. Then one afternoon when I was home alone, I was talking to my friend on the phone when I suddenly heard a loud noise coming from the front door. My dog started barking like crazy, and I immediately thought that somebody was trying to break in. I slowly went there to see what was going on, and I quickly discovered that there was nobody outside. I really started to freak out. I went back into the living room and continued to talk to my friend to calm down. I hear another loud noise. The door of my parents' room had just closed itself. I opened it to see if the window was open, trying to find an excuse for what had just happened, but the window was closed. At this point, I was losing it. When my mom got home, I told her what had happened. She told me to just ignore it, that if there was something in the house, it was just trying to scare me, and that if it was bad, it would feed on my fear. I thought that what she said was just a little too Hollywood, honestly, but I still followed her advice and played it cool. A little bit after that, on another afternoon, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up with a loud A in my ear. It was the voice of my mom. And I swear to this day, I can still hear the voice of my mom in my head, crystal clear. I even thought that my mom was already at the house, but it turned out there was no one there. Then another cat died two years at the house and two of my cats had died. If I'm being honest, all I could think about was how in horror movies the pets always die. I was terrified of the house. I avoided it at all costs and I didn't like to be home alone. I just couldn't handle the fear at this point. I constantly felt watched. I couldn't even go to the bathroom at night. It's like I wasn't even living in my house. I just felt extremely unwelcomed there. Then my mom started to have dreams about all of us being dead, and we always died in the worst types of ways. I was also having very vivid dreams. Some of them I remember clearly to this day. My mom then decided to do a cleansing to the house and everything calmed down for a while. Then my mom told me that when she was trying to put my little sister to sleep, she made a gesture like she was offering her pacifier to someone. And when she asked her, she told her she was offering it to the lady. My mom completely froze and didn't say anything. I wasn't sure what to think anymore. And by now, those things just started to feel really normal. I was scared, but curious. And I wanted to see something, not just hear it or feel it. Through the whole time that this was going on, I felt excited to see something. Even though I wasn't sure how I would react, I still wanted it. 
Well, that day came when I was trying to sleep in my room. Everything was dark, and I was facing the ceiling just whispering the lyrics of a song to try to get to sleep. I wasn't thinking about anything paranormal. And the funny thing is, in the moment when things were happening, I was never even thinking about the paranormal as a cause either. But I saw this light come from the corner of my room. I quickly looked and faced it, and I felt it looking back. Even though it was just a light, I could feel some kind of presence in it. When I processed what it was, I gasped, and it moved fast to the left, then to the right, then disappeared. When I tell this, it seems like it lasted minutes, but the truth is it only lasted for a couple of seconds. It was super fast. I can't really explain what I saw. It was like a lantern, but alive. I don't really know. It was white, and unlike the other things that happened, this one actually didn't make me feel scared. I did a little Google search after that, and I found out that what I had seen is typically called an orb, and the color white meant protection. At this point, I was very confused, but I had this feeling that the thing that I had seen was not the thing that was scaring me. I thought of my uncle who passed away when I was seven. Maybe the orb was him protecting me from whatever was in the house. Maybe not. All I know is that after that, everything calmed down. This was the last event that I can remember, and it happened in the very last year that I lived in the house. Shortly after all this, I moved. But now and then I think about that home. Why could I never go into my parents' room? Who was the man that asked my mom to help and appeared in her dreams? Was it him that made everything smell like cigarettes and cologne? Who was the lady? I never got any answers to these questions. One month after I moved, I had a dream. I was in my bed, and I knew I was sleeping, but I could see my room perfectly, and I remember thinking that a bad entity was there. Then I saw a very bright light that covered my vision, and I woke up feeling very protected. I think that was the last time that I felt like something was with me, at least at my house where I still live until this day. I have a lot of weird stories that have happened to me, but anyway, I moved to the haunted house when I was almost 14 and left when I was almost 18, and never for a second did I think I was crazy, even though nobody believed me other than my mom. And I get it, it sounds like scary movie stuff, but I hope you'll feel differently and actually believe my story, because it did happen, and I still really miss my cats. My friends lived a few houses down in an old house they were renting. They often talked about the house being haunted. They said that things would move by themselves or disappear, only to reappear later. They mostly talked about this pair of jeans that was set out when my friend was getting ready for work. When he went to go get them, they were gone. He figured he must have forgotten and just set them down elsewhere, so he started looking around. He couldn't find them, so he just got a different pair and then went to work. When he came home, they were folded up on the kitchen table. He asked his wife where she had found them. She said she hadn't seen them. They went to the kitchen, and she claimed she has no idea how they got there. One time, I walked over to their house, and I was going in the side door. As I reached for the doorknob, I saw it twist and open up, just a few inches. I thought it was them telling me to come in, so I waited for them to say something. After a few seconds, I opened the door and went in. I said hello and waited. Then I went into the house looking for them and calling them. That's when I realized the house was empty and they weren't home. I got this really funny feeling, and then I started to leave. And that's when I heard a baby crying in their bedroom. I thought, what in the world is going on? But I walked into the bedroom, and the crying stopped, and there was no baby. I got out of there as fast as I could. They later told me that that was the kind of stuff they put up with all the time. 
but they did move shortly after that. This story is definitely not the only paranormal experience that I've had, but it certainly was a unique one. I have a guardian ghost, or at least I think so. As long as I can remember, there have been weird things happening in my house. As a child, my parents purely blamed it on my imagination, but it continued and got even more visible during my teenage years. While a lot of the things that happened belong to another story, I'll concentrate on the very nice dude that seems to live there with us. He made his first appearance when my step-siblings and I were about five years old. I remember vividly playing hide-and-seek with them, walking into my room and seeing a ball rolling across the floor from behind the sofa. But nobody was hiding in that room. When I mentioned this to them years later, they confirmed that they also had had this feeling of another person playing with us. I've always heard footsteps in our house, up the stairs at night, behind me while walking up or down them. It was quite common. Then it started to become the whole house. When I was about 13, I used to spend about two hours home alone every day after school until my parents got home. Usually, I would spend this time in my room. What would happen every day is that I would hear somebody unlock the front door and walk into my living room. And every day, I would go downstairs, thinking that one of my parents must have come home. But nobody would ever be there. It got me so paranoid that I started locking the door to my room when I was home alone, thinking somebody must be in the house with me. Then I started to hear breathing at night, in my room, like right next to my head when I was lying in bed. The first time it happened, I got so scared that I stuffed my blanket above my head. The next morning I told my mom about it, who said that I must have just heard my stepdad snoring in their room. That would mean that I had heard that through multiple closed doors between our rooms. Sure, Jan. Anyway, the breathing started to get more and more common. Not every night, but quite often. Then there was the first incident that now, looking back, makes me think that this paranormal roommate had tried to protect me all along. When I was 14, I had a friend. As it turned out, she was a very toxic and backstabbing person, but I hadn't realized that yet. She was over at my house after school, and we were upstairs playing Sing Star on my PlayStation 2. My mom came up to inform us that she would go to the store to get some groceries and that we would be alone there for about a half an hour. This was okay with us. We waited until we heard her lock the front door and then we closed the door to the room we were in and started to sing to all of our favorite 2000 hits. That was until my friend suddenly stopped and started staring at the door. I paused the game and asked her what was wrong, and that's when she just turned pale and told me that somebody had just knocked on the door very loudly. I hadn't heard anything, so I told her that she must have just heard something else. We continued our game, and about a minute later, the same thing happened. My friend stands there, just frozen, completely panicked, telling me that she needs to leave the room immediately because something is trying to get inside. Great logic, by the way. But I, who still hasn't heard anything, slowly opened the door. Nothing was there. My friend wanted to go downstairs, which we then did. But when we got to the middle of the staircase, she starts screaming. Of course, both of us start running, me being scared because she's screaming like bloody hell. Our first instinct was to open the back door and run outside where we waited for my mom to come home as my friend refused to set foot in the house again. When she calmed down a bit, she told me that when walking down the stairs, somebody started talking right next to her, right into her ear. Needless to say, she never visited again. 
which was good knowing now all the things she did later on. Anyway, I was very paranoid still that somebody might be in our house. Right under my window was our back door, which I didn't trust one bit when it came to protecting us from an attempted break-in. Every now and then, when I was lying on my bed at night, I would get afraid of any noises coming from that direction, because oftentimes it sounded like somebody was trying to open it. But any time I got scared by it, this breathing would start again. And eventually it didn't feel scary anymore. It started to feel like somebody was trying to comfort me, trying to tell me that everything was okay and that I wasn't alone. Which looking back on it now is not so comforting because I was alone, but I digress. After what happened with my friend, I was glad to change schools. At my new school, I avoided topics like ghosts and stuff. I wanted to use the opportunity of making new friends without being the girl with the haunted house. Also, a part of me was thinking straight enough to acknowledge that the breathing only occurred when I was feeling scared and might just be some kind of mental mechanism to calm myself down. That was until I had a sleepover with two of my friends at age 17. For reference, my room was kind of long. On the one side, it had my bed, and on the other, it had a sofa. There were like three meters between them. So Sarah slept on the sofa, while Ella slept in my bed next to me. Next to my bed was a rocking chair that my grandpa had once gotten from a garage sale. Keep in mind that I hadn't told them anything that had happened to me in the last couple of years. Since it was the first time having them stay over, I wanted to be a good host and asked them how they slept. Ella didn't say anything, but Sarah said, Okay, I know this is gonna sound super weird, but I couldn't sleep for most of the night. It was like somebody was just breathing into my face, but when I looked, nobody was there. I was shocked because this confirmed everything that I thought I had just imagined. Around this time, the thing with hearing the steps got worse. So much worse that my mom started asking me if I was jumping around my room in the middle of the night. My stepdad asked on several occasions what in the world I was doing in the kitchen at 3 a.m. because he kept hearing somebody walk around downstairs. I hadn't been doing either of those things. About two years had passed since the sleepover with my friends when Ella and I were talking to a friend of ours who had just gotten his first apartment. He told us to come over later on and I jokingly asked him if he had any furniture yet or if we would have to sit on the floor. He then proudly told us that he even had a very cool rocking chair. That's when Ella told us that she hates rocking chairs because she had a really creepy experience regarding one. Our friend wanted to know what happened, so she started telling her story. Well, I spent the night somewhere and there was a rocking chair in the room. When I woke up in the middle of the night, there was this tall stranger sitting on it, just watching me sleep. I was confused and said, that's so creepy, where did that happen? She said, it was at your place. And no, it wasn't my stepdad. Ella knows my stepdad and he isn't that tall. And also he wouldn't just be sitting in our room in the middle of the night. I wanted to get more information about it but she refused to ever talk about it again afterwards. That's why she had been so quiet that next morning. The following years continued as usual. I even started communicating with this ghost. Whenever I got scared and heard the breathing, it always made me feel calm. So I started thanking him for letting me know that everything was okay. And whenever I thanked him, the breathing stopped. I once saw the guy that Ella mentioned too. I was walking down the hall past an open door and there he was just standing, a tall man with some kind of hat. I could only see the silhouette and I left as fast as I could because it was still kind of creepy. Later on, after finally believing the stories that I had told them, my parents became more aware of everything. Even after I moved out, my stepdad continued to tell me that there was some ghost guy living with them. Like, yeah, I know, I've been telling you for years. 
On the rare occasions that I am at my parents' house, he rarely makes his presence known to me. Sometimes I can see a shadow passing by an open door or something small, but my mom still sees him. She just decided to ignore him. We're still not really sure what this could be. I can rule out any deceased relatives as there aren't many and nobody has ever died in the house. My parents built the house, so we were the first to live there. I thought that maybe he was just attached to me and that when I moved he might follow, but he never did. I also don't think he's attached to the rocking chair because it started before I ever placed that in my room. I guess he just thought it was comfortable? I don't know. Still, I hope someday I find out where he came from and why he's in our house. This story is definitely not the only paranormal experience that I've had, but it certainly was a unique one. I have a guardian ghost, or at least I think so. As long as I can remember, there have been weird things happening in my house. As a child, my parents purely blamed it on my imagination, but it continued and got even more visible during my teenage years. While a lot of the things that happened belong to another story, I'll concentrate on the very nice dude that seems to live there with us. He made his first appearance when my step-siblings and I were about five years old. I remember vividly playing hide-and-seek with them, walking into my room and seeing a ball rolling across the floor from behind the sofa. But nobody was hiding in that room. When I mentioned this to them years later, they confirmed that they also had had this feeling of another person playing with us. I've always heard footsteps in our house, up the stairs at night, behind me while walking up or down them. It was quite common. Then it started to become the whole house. When I was about 13, I used to spend about two hours home alone every day after school until my parents got home. Usually, I would spend this time in my room. What would happen every day is that I would hear somebody unlock the front door and walk into my living room. And every day, I would go downstairs thinking that one of my parents must have come home. But nobody would ever be there. It got me so paranoid that I started locking the door to my room when I was home alone, thinking somebody must be in the house with me. Then I started to hear breathing at night, in my room, like right next to my head when I was lying in bed. The first time it happened, I got so scared that I stuffed my blanket above my head. The next morning I told my mom about it, who said that I must have just heard my stepdad snoring in their room. That would mean that I had heard that through multiple closed doors between our rooms. Sure, Jan. Anyway, the breathing started to get more and more common. Not every night, but quite often. Then there was the first incident that now, looking back, makes me think that this paranormal roommate had tried to protect me all along. When I was 14, I had a friend. As it turned out, she was a very toxic and backstabbing person, but I hadn't realized that yet. She was over at my house after school and we were upstairs playing Sing Star on my PlayStation 2. My mom came up to inform us that she would go to the store to get some groceries, and that we would be alone there for about a half an hour. This was okay with us. We waited until we heard her lock the front door, and then we closed the door to the room we were in and started to sing to all of our favorite 2000 hits. That was until my friend suddenly stopped and started staring at the door. I paused the game and asked her what was wrong, and that's when she just turned pale and told me that somebody had just knocked on the door very loudly. I hadn't heard anything, so I told her that she must have just heard something else. We continued our game, and about a minute later, the same thing happened. My friend stands there, just frozen, completely panicked, 
telling me that she needs to leave the room immediately because something is trying to get inside. Great logic, by the way. But I, who still hasn't heard anything, slowly opened the door. Nothing was there. My friend wanted to go downstairs, which we then did. But when we got to the middle of the staircase, she starts screaming. Of course, both of us start running, me being scared because she's screaming like bloody hell. Our first instinct was to open the back door and run outside, where we waited for my mom to come home, as my friend refused to set foot in the house again. When she calmed down a bit, she told me that when walking down the stairs, somebody started talking right next to her, right into her ear. Needless to say, she never visited again, which was good knowing now all the things she did later on. Anyway, I was very paranoid still that somebody might be in our house. Right under my window was our back door, which I didn't trust one bit when it came to protecting us from an attempted break-in. Every now and then, when I was lying on my bed at night, I would get afraid of any noises coming from that direction, because oftentimes it sounded like somebody was trying to open it. But any time I got scared by it, this breathing would start again. And eventually it didn't feel scary anymore. It started to feel like somebody was trying to comfort me, trying to tell me that everything was okay and that I wasn't alone. Which looking back on it now is not so comforting because I was alone, but I digress. After what happened with my friend, I was glad to change schools. At my new school, I avoided topics like ghosts and stuff. I wanted to use the opportunity of making new friends without being the girl with the haunted house. Also, a part of me was thinking straight enough to acknowledge that the breathing only occurred when I was feeling scared, and might just be some kind of mental mechanism to calm myself down. That was until I had a sleepover with two of my friends at age 17. For reference, my room was kind of long. On the one side it had my bed, and on the other it had a sofa. There were like three meters between them. So Sarah slept on the sofa, while Ella slept in my bed next to me. Next to my bed was a rocking chair that my grandpa had once gotten from a garage sale. Keep in mind that I hadn't told them anything that had happened to me in the last couple of years. Since it was the first time having them stay over, I wanted to be a good host and asked them how they slept. Ella didn't say anything, but Sarah said, Okay, I know this is gonna sound super weird, but I couldn't sleep for most of the night. It was like somebody was just breathing into my face, but when I looked, nobody was there. I was shocked, because this confirmed everything that I thought I had just imagined. Around this time, the thing with hearing the steps got worse. So much worse that my mom started asking me if I was jumping around my room in the middle of the night. My stepdad asked on several occasions what in the world I was doing in the kitchen at 3 a.m. because he kept hearing somebody walk around downstairs. I hadn't been doing either of those things. About two years had passed since the sleepover with my friends when Ella and I were talking to a friend of ours who had just gotten his first apartment. He told us to come over later on, and I jokingly asked him if he had any furniture yet or if we would have to sit on the floor. He then proudly told us that he even had a very cool rocking chair. That's when Ella told us that she hates rocking chairs because she had a really creepy experience regarding one. Our friend wanted to know what happened, so she started telling her story. Well, I spent the night somewhere and there was a rocking chair in the room. When I woke up in the middle of the night, there was this tall stranger sitting on it, just watching me sleep. I was confused and said, that's so creepy, where did that happen? She said, it was at your place. And no, it wasn't my stepdad. Ella knows my stepdad and he isn't that tall. And also he wouldn't just be sitting in our room in the middle of the night. I wanted to get more information about it, but she refused to ever talk about it again afterwards. That's why she had been so quiet that next morning. The following years continued as usual, 
I even started communicating with this ghost. Whenever I got scared and heard the breathing, it always made me feel calm. So I started thanking him for letting me know that everything was okay. And whenever I thanked him, the breathing stopped. I once saw the guy that Ella mentioned too. I was walking down the hall past an open door and there he was just standing, a tall man with some kind of hat. I could only see the silhouette and I left as fast as I could because it was still kind of creepy. Later on, after finally believing the stories that I had told them, my parents became more aware of everything. Even after I moved out, my stepdad continued to tell me that there was some ghost guy living with them. Like, yeah, I know, I've been telling you for years. On the rare occasions that I am at my parents' house, he rarely makes his presence known to me. Sometimes I can see a shadow passing by an open door or something small, but my mom still sees him. She just decided to ignore him. We're still not really sure what this could be, I can rule out any deceased relatives as there aren't many and nobody has ever died in the house. My parents built the house, so we were the first to live there. I thought that maybe he was just attached to me and that when I moved he might follow, but he never did. I also don't think he's attached to the rocking chair because it started before I ever placed that in my room. I guess he just thought it was comfortable? I don't know. Still. I hope someday I find out where he came from and why he's in our house. My house has always kind of had weird, unexplainable events happening in it, but nothing worthy of really telling. I've heard sudden scurrying footsteps, slight banging in the kitchen, stuff like that. I don't know where it comes from or why it happens, but I usually just figure it's a ghost. Today though, another weird event happened, except that it was way worse than anything else. I was home alone while my dad was at work. I slept very late the night before, so I was still asleep late into the afternoon. I woke up at about 12.30 p.m. to my dog barking. I sleep with her in my room, so it woke me up instantly. She was on the floor in front of the bedroom door. I went over to comfort her to make her stop barking. I didn't really think much of it. I figured she had just heard a noise outside. So I picked her back up, checked the time, laid down and turned over to try to continue sleeping. I was slightly worried because her barking usually means that she heard something loud, but I tried not to think about it and went back to sleep. I suppose it's also worth noting that I was facing the window next to my bed when I fell asleep. About two or three minutes later, I heard loud footsteps in the grass outside. My dog started barking again, so I tried to silence her out of panic. It sounded like it was right by my window. A big black silhouette sprinted past the window. My window has blinds over it, so the details were obscured. The window is about four feet tall. If you were five foot tall and stood by the window outside, your head would barely be visible. But this silhouette covered the entire window top to bottom. So given the height of the window and all that, and based on what I could see, I figured this thing had to be like 10 to 11 feet tall. It was also about as thick as a third of the window. Whatever it was, this thing was huge. It basically looked like a tall rectangle running by. There was a small crack in the blinds near the bottom where you could peek out and see outside. I only had time to glance at it, but I saw the color black, probably part of that figure. Another thing about the footsteps, I didn't hear any footsteps indicating that somebody was approaching. The sound of the footsteps basically just appeared next to my window and quickly faded out as soon as the thing passed by. There was no sound indicating that it had run off either. It just stopped. 
It was like it only existed to pass my window and then vanished. I heard some leaves crunching when it ran by, so I definitely would have heard it if it had approached or departed in the same way. This all happened in the span of one or two seconds. I was scared, so I picked up my dog and stared at the crack in the blinds for about a minute, expecting to see something happen again. Nothing did, so I just went back onto my bed and decided to call my dad. I asked him if he could come pick me up and take me to his work since I didn't want to be home alone anymore. I tried to whisper and tell him everything that had happened. He agreed and began to drive to the house. It took about a half an hour. I just sat on the bed, trying to calm myself with phone games. I occasionally looked over to see if anything happened, but luckily, nothing did. Eventually, my dad came home. I left my room to go talk to him about what had happened. And apparently, something else happened that I didn't know about. Outside, on the porch, we have a big umbrella pole placed inside of a hole in the wooden table so that it wouldn't fall over. It's been through extremely windy nights, but it's never fallen over. The umbrella is practically embedded in that little hole, so it's very sturdy. My dad told me to look outside. The entire umbrella was on the ground, as though somebody had pulled it out and then tossed it there. The wooden table was still oriented upright, so the umbrella wasn't just knocked over. If it were, the table would have fallen with it. The only thought that I have is that the weird creature I heard is what knocked over the umbrella, or rather took it out and threw it on the ground. And that's when my dog first started barking and woke me up. I probably just didn't hear it since I was asleep. I left to my dad's work and I'm still there telling this story. I honestly don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's haunted, I don't really know what's going on, but I definitely feel unsafe at home. All of these things happened at my now ex-boyfriend's house. I would spend a lot of time at his house overnight as his neighborhood had more things to do and his bedroom was more private than mine. We were both 19 to 21 during this time period. First, I should mention that his family practices the Yoruba religion and would leave water and offerings for individual deities. They were very in tune to that aspect of the universe. I had also felt growing up that I could feel things and spirits not necessarily communicate, but I could feel them and acknowledge them if I didn't think they were dangerous, and was generally chill and not really scared, as long as I knew that I wasn't doing something to upset them or vice versa. Whenever I encountered these things, I just sort of had this thought of like, oh, that's a ghost, and then I kind of moved on. In his house, his bedroom had a door that led down a flight of stairs into the backyard, and also into the basement. Basically, you come down the stairs, do a U-turn, and bam, you're looking at the basement. If you go straight just a couple of steps, then you're in the backyard. He has a washer dryer down there, and there was also some storage. It was dark, damp, and had a concrete floor. Not really a place you want to hang out in. Occasionally, we would go down to get the laundry, and I always found myself looking into the back of the basement and just knowing that I was not welcome to pass any farther than the dryer. Even at the dryer, I can only explain it as clear words popping into my head. You're not supposed to be here. It was in my own voice, but it would always leave quickly. And sometimes, just in case, I would give a nod of respect toward the back of the basement. I avoided going down there as much as I could. Additionally, sometimes when in bed late at night, I would hear creaking on the stairs. At first, I summed it up to an old house settling and changing with the temperature. 
but over time, I could not deny that it was the distinct sound of footsteps. It would always stop by the door to the basement, and I would stare at the door, waiting for it to open, but it never did. One day, we were sitting at the kitchen table with his mom and dad, and I don't remember how it got brought up, but I mentioned that I always felt unwelcome and like I wasn't supposed to be in the basement. I also mentioned that the words, you're not supposed to be here, would repeat in my head. His mom and dad shot a wide-eyed glance at each other. I said, what? Very matter-of-factly, his mom says, there's the ghost of an old man who stays down there. I immediately felt validated and got chills and described exactly where I felt unwelcome. She confirmed that he does hang out in the very back of the basement. She also told me that sometimes she'll leave a shot of whiskey for him when his activity picks up. He's apparently cranky by nature, but that seems to calm him down for a few weeks. She said that he was harmless, but I already felt that. He just didn't like me in his space. She left some whiskey for him the next day, and I think spoke to him and somewhat told him who I was. The feeling of unwelcomeness never left, and I would still hear the creeping on the stairs, but I made sure to acknowledge him whenever I went to the basement, and I never went into his space at the back. Bonus, his sister's room is on the same level, and when she was a kid, she used to have nightmares of a girl crying in her room, and swears that as she got older, she has seen her curled up in a ball on her floor when she wakes up in the middle of the night, and she'll hear a random cry if she's in her room alone during the day. All in all, a very strange experience. My house was built in the 70s, not particularly new, not particularly old. We moved here in the early 2000s. I don't really know any of the history behind the house. We've always joked that there were ghosts here, doors slamming shut, creaking, and things randomly disappearing have always been blamed on ghosts. But around five years ago, it started to get a bit more aggressive. Sounds of light footsteps could be heard in the hallway, scratching from the second floor and from inside the wall. We have no rodent or pest problems, we checked, so it seems unexplainable to the entire family. Then, one day, about three to four years ago, I was home alone sitting in the living room when a loud bang happened on the second floor. It was so loud that I was worried the upstairs cabinet had fallen down to the floor. When the bang hit, my lights flickered and the TV turned off and then back on. I could feel the shake all the way from downstairs. I went up to check what had happened, but everything seemed the same. This has happened several times and it is almost entirely identical. A loud bang, a shake, flickering lights, but nothing really happening. What makes this worse is that you can't hear it when you're upstairs. You can only hear it when you're downstairs. I've had people on the lower floor call my phone when I'm upstairs saying, stop slamming the door so hard, when I'm laying silently in bed and I can't hear it. In the past year, I started to actually see things. I thought I was just imagining them at first. At one point, I saw a toddler sleeping in my brother's bed. I saw her very clearly. She was young, maybe three years old. She had long blonde hair, and her arm hung over the edge of the bed. When I approached her, she disappeared. This was probably a year ago, but it still spooks me. Then, a few weeks ago, I encountered her again. I was home alone when somebody knocked on the door. I was a bit confused, as I wasn't expecting anyone. As I approached the hallway, I heard the door closing and a young girl say, hello, like she had just come home and was announcing her arrival. 
I felt chills run down my back, but I still opened the door to look. My brother is five, and I thought maybe he had just come home early, but nobody was there. I closed a door today, like properly shut it, and then she opened it again, and when I looked at the open door, she shut it. Now I'm hearing banging sounds from downstairs, and I don't know what to do. The dreams that I get in this house are always so vivid too, compared to when I'm not at home. Sometimes I wake up with the sheets off my bed and the blanket on the ground because I sleep so uneasily. This never happens when I'm out of the house though. Anyway, I don't really know what to do. I don't think speaking to her works. I tried, but then she just stops being noisy for a bit and then it picks back up. I really have no idea what's going on. I used to live with my mom and her ex-boyfriend in a really big house. It was around 6,000 square feet, and it gave me bad vibes from the very start. Whenever I voiced it to my mom and her ex, they would just brush it off and tell me that I was imagining things. They were always traveling and going places, while I had to stay behind because of my job. I was okay with this. I enjoy being alone. I was about 19, and after my friends had left for the night, I did my nightly rounds throughout the house. I would always check to make sure that all the doors were locked and all the lights were off. Once I made sure of that, I went to my bathroom to get ready for bed. My bedroom was the only one on the main floor. It was a four bedroom house, meaning that there were three upstairs, one being directly over my room and bathroom. My room and bathroom are separated by a small hallway, which can be closed off by a sliding door, meaning that there was a door to my bedroom and to my bathroom which I always left open because I could close off that little hallway so it was still private. I start washing my face and as I'm doing so, I hear what sounds like footsteps directly above me. I freeze in place and listen. They stopped. I shrug it off and continue. It's late and I'm just hearing things, so I go back to washing my face. Then it happens again, but this time a little louder. Again, I freeze. I know that I'm not just hearing things, but what can I do? They stopped and so I went back to washing my face. Then it happened again. I stop again. And then I hear and actually feel one of the loudest bangs I've ever heard in my life. It was like a 400 pound person jumped off of a bed onto the ground. That's what I heard. I felt the rumble. If that wasn't enough, right after that, my bedroom door slams shut. I'm freaking out at this point, and I run into my room to grab my machete. I thought that somebody was in my house, so I run to the kitchen yelling, whoever's in here, I'll kill you. I still have soap like dripping down my face onto the ground too. Seeing that all the doors are still locked, I run back into my bathroom and rinse off my face. I packed a bag and called my best friend. I told him what was happening and he says, get the F out of there. So I keep him on the phone as I finish packing a bag and get outside into my car. As I'm pulling out of my driveway, I notice something upstairs. Every single light is turned on. And I know for a fact that just 20 minutes before when I had checked everything, they were off. I didn't even think twice. I just kept reversing and didn't look back at the house. I've seen enough scary movies to know that there would have been a figure in one of those windows staring at me had I looked back. I'm sure of it. I went back the next day to see if somebody actually did break in, but there was no sign of forced entry. All the doors were still locked. Nothing was missing. All of the light upstairs had also been turned back off. Fast forward six months and we move out. My mom then tells me that the house was turned into a hospice 
after the original owner from the 1930s was widowed and got lonely. She turned the house into a place for those who didn't have any family to die peacefully, so they wouldn't be alone. That explains an awful lot. We moved into our first home in February of 2016. It was an old home built in the early 1900s in the historic part of town. I loved it. All the hand-carved woodwork and glass doorknobs with skeleton locks. It was exactly what I wanted, and it was perfect for myself, a 22-year-old female at the time, and my husband, 27-year-old male at the time. I was three months pregnant with our first, and we were so excited to start our family. As we got settled in, we noticed that the house was very noisy. I rarely have my home quiet due to having tinnitus, and we always need some kind of background noise to drown it out. On the rare occasion that the house was quiet, there was always lots of creaking and mostly moving coming from the loft-style attic we had. We shook it off as the house settling and being old. At least that's what my dad told us. So we moved on. Spring came and we were scrambling to get ready for the baby. The house needed a lot of work, but we were determined to get it done. The first major encounter was on a beautiful spring day. It was the weekend and my husband and I were spending our day off working on the house. I was cleaning the kitchen and he was working on my car in our detached garage. The way this home was built, you could see the detached garage from the window that's above the kitchen sink. I would glance out every now and then and see what he was up to. A little time passed, and I hadn't looked out at him. I started doing the dishes, and I heard him walking into the living room toward the kitchen. I could feel his presence there, so without turning around, I said, Hey, babe. No answer. Wondering why he didn't answer me, I looked back over my shoulder, only to be met with the dark silhouette of a man standing between the living room and the kitchen. In the blink of an eye, the figure was gone. Unsure of what I had just seen, I yelled through the window for my husband, who was still in the garage and had been the whole time. He came in and I frantically told him that somebody was in the house. He immediately went to grab his weapon and checked all over the house, but nothing was there. In all of the years we lived at that house, not once did my husband see our little roommate. But I? I saw him all the time. Out of the corner of my eye, peeking around corners. But more than anything, I saw him looking into the living room from the staircase that led to the attic. In the beginning, he frightened me, but after a while, I just kind of got used to him being there. I even spoke to him sometimes, telling him that I'm okay if he stays in the attic and asking him to leave my baby alone. He seemed to have agreed since in the last five years, my son lived there and he never saw him. When we went to sell our home, the realtor brought us some historical information she had found regarding the house and our neighborhood. We found out that our house and our neighbor's house was built by a brother and sister. Our home was the brothers. Their last name was the same as our current neighbor, so I figured he was most likely a descendant. I asked him one day, and he told me that the sister was his mom and his uncle owned our home. He said that he was a kind man who lived alone and died in the home many years ago. I asked him about the attic and he said that that was his uncle's favorite place in the whole house. He kept all of his trinkets and projects up there and would just spend hours working on things up there. I didn't tell him I believed my house was haunted. He didn't seem like the type who would believe me. Our home was listed and it sold within the same day. Sometimes I wonder about the man in the attic, if the new owners are nice to him or if they've even noticed his presence. I do hope they'll give him his space, as they are only passers-by in his home, 
like we once were. I work as a visual artist for the topmost financial company in India. I met this lady in the cafeteria who I was introduced to by another friend of mine. And as I got closer to her, she told me about her paranormal experiences that were so bad they made her want to commit suicide. This is not my experience, but her and her family's. They are Muslims and a family of four. Three months before I met her, her father had passed away, so it was just the four of them. The mother and the two sons who are in school, and she being the eldest sibling. After her father had passed away, they had leased a massive house for one to two years, maybe more, I don't remember, with four bedrooms, spacious halls, and two floors. It was a really big house that was leased for a very reasonable amount. The thought that the kids would have so much space and fun in a big house like that was really endearing to her. So as soon as they start living there, a lot of strange occurrences took place right from the beginning. They heard screams, like really loud screams that scared everybody. They could hear footsteps and banging from the first floor. None of them had a clue what was going on. All of them were scared and panicked and they never left each other. They slept in the halls together and they never used any of the rooms. She told me that one night while the boys were sleeping in the hall next to her, one got up screaming in the night. When they checked on him, half of his hair on one side of his head was gone, just half bald out of nowhere. Their kids started to suffer from panic attacks and that was just the beginning. One experience that her mother went through made them decide to leave right away. While the kids were gone to school and my friend was at work, the mother was alone at home, cooking in the kitchen. She was just going about her day. And then all of a sudden she could hear somebody crying. She's confused and calls out to her daughter, thinking that she'd come home early from work, but she got no response. She goes back into the hall to check and nobody's there. She goes back to the kitchen and continues cooking, when all of a sudden the sound of somebody crying becomes even louder. She sees something from the corner of her eye, on the ceiling, and notices that there is a lady sitting upside down on the roof, crying. The mother couldn't take it. She panicked and ran. She ran to her neighbor's house, which was quite far, and called her daughter. When she told them this, they all asked questions. The mother and daughter decided to go talk to the owner and tell him that they didn't want to live in that place anymore. The problem is, once you lease, you can't take back your security deposit until it's served its term, based on the contract. So they couldn't even move out because they would need more money to rent a different place. When they met the owner, he told them that he used to live in that house with his wife she had committed side in that house on the top floor. Since then, he's been seeing her and hearing her walk around the house. So he doesn't want to live there anymore, but he never told anybody about it because he thought it would be bad for business. This family literally had no choice but to live there until they made enough money to move out. And it was hell. They've gone through so many messed up experiences, many that they don't even talk about. They even got a dog, which their neighbors advised, and the dog won't even go inside. He lives outside. They even called a Baba from the mosque to bless the house, but they still suffer and they still see the lady in the house. Nothing ever really worked out there. And three months after they started suffering, the mother died and the three of them moved out to a smaller home. That house has just been left abandoned since then. And I think that's probably for the best.
My story is about the house I lived in until I was five. My dad lived there after the divorce, and I visited often. It had been a family house on my dad's side of one kind or another since the late 1940s. It's also a house that's haunted. The whole family has ghost stories, most people more than one, and most of them involve the staircase that goes to the second floor. It's the first thing you see when you walk into the house. The staircase has been replaced six times, and I'm fairly sure that that's not normal in any house. Family legend says that the house, which was built in 1920, was the site of a murder side in the early 1940s. Supposedly, the owners right before my grandparents told them that the owners before them were a young man and his new wife who were hoping to start a new family. The story goes that the husband came home from work early one afternoon and went upstairs looking for his wife. One of the bedrooms has a door that opens directly to the top of the stairs, which was also my bedroom as a kid in the 70s. As he comes up the stairs, he's treated to an ever-expanding view of his wife and the neighbor guy having a good time in the guest bed. Instead of yelling or anything, he quietly goes downstairs into the back room, grabs his hunting rifle, and then goes back upstairs where he kills the wife and the neighbor. Then he calmly gets a length of rope from the garage and hangs himself from the second floor banister in the stairwell. The house sat empty for a while. The next family, the one selling the house to my grandparents, got the house for dirt cheap. They redid the stairwell, staircase number two, and supposedly lived there 18 months before deciding to sell. My grandparents didn't really think much of it, mostly because they were pregnant, had three kids, the house was cheap, and they were poor. They went on to have nine total kids, and every single one of my aunts and uncles has stories about ghosts in that house. I have over 40 cousins, and they all have stories about ghosts and unexplained events in the home. Most of the stories involve seeing a hanged man, or a dark shape in the stairwell, a young nervous woman on the second floor, or an older woman that tends to sleeping children. Some experiences involve strange occurrences, like furniture and items that move or break when no one else is in the room. Some of the stories are scary, some are nice, but everyone has at least one, and usually they have several. After graduating high school, I was in and out of college and in and out of jobs. For a short period of time, I lived in this house during a summer when I was between jobs. My grandfather and my dad technically lived there, but stayed with other family members and girlfriends and were almost never home. A friend of mine was with me on the night that some weird things happened. She didn't officially live there, but she was basically living with me. I had told her about all the ghost stories and paranormal stuff, and we decide to dig out my grandmother's old Ouija board, the same one that I have now, and try to contact the spirits. We get everything out, put our fingers on the planchette, and nothing happens. The planchette doesn't want to move. So we set the mood, get out the incense, light the candles, and nothing happens. By now, I'm bored. It's 3 a.m., it's summer in New York, and it's kind of stuffy and hot inside. So I decide that I want to go to the back porch where it's cooler. My friend agrees, and we get up, leave the board on the bed, and as we're grabbing shoes, we hear something fall off the bed. It's the planchette. We both jump up and then laugh because it was obviously on the edge and just fell, right? Except, we were both pretty sure the planchette hadn't been anywhere near the edge, and had in fact been in the very middle of the bed. We try and nervously shrug it off, and then we're like, ooh, maybe it wants to talk to us. Being silly, we decide to ask one more question before we go out. This time, the planchette wants to move, and starts circling as soon as our fingers touch it. Before we finish the question, what is your name, it goes to no. 
We laugh. Okay, all right, you don't want to tell us your name. How old were you when you died? Planchette slips quickly across the board to no. Fine, all right, all right, what message do you have for us? Again, it goes straight to no. Now I'm figuring by this point it's my friend pushing it, because this is not any weak tentative moving around the board. It's forceful, and she is known for kind of messing around. So I basically grab the planchette and half jokingly, half seriously, throw it next to her on the bed. I was a little bit miffed at her for pushing it around and not giving it a chance. Besides, if you're gonna be so obviously pushing the planchette, you should at least make the answers interesting. I say, I'm done, that was fun, but let's go to the back porch and smoke. As soon as I stand up, we hear the sound of a door slamming downstairs so hard that the windows rattled from the force of it. There are only three doors downstairs. The ones to the front door and back room had been closed and locked for hours, and the bathroom door was a piece of crap that could barely close, let alone slam. My dad and my grandfather were out of state visiting relatives, so I knew it wasn't them coming home. Neither of us wanted to go check on what had made the noise, but we left the room, and we went to see that the stairwell was oddly dark. It was like all the shadows had just collected there, like that part of the room was way darker than the rest. It was just so pitch black in that stairwell that I couldn't see beyond the first step of stairs. The rest of the landing is lit, normally, by some moonlight coming in the lone window on the second floor landing. But it just seemed as if that bit of light stopped at a wall as soon as it reached the stairs. The dark cloud in the stairwell seemed to move and shift, a strange inky blackness that looked thick. At this point in time, the stairs are a wrought iron spiral staircase that my dad had put in. This was the fourth time the stairs had been replaced. They weren't very safe to climb down even when you could see. So I inch to the center of the room and pull the light switch so we can see what we're doing and not break our necks on the staircase. And of course, the light pole comes off in my hand. No light. I look to my friend thinking, okay, the roiling pitch black shadows in this stairwell must be my imagination. She can probably see just fine, so I would just follow her down. But no, she's staring at the stairwell with wide eyes full of terror. She turns to me and says, why the hell is it so dark? At this point, I realize that she can see it too. So I push her back into the room and slam the door shut behind us. I had one of those push button locks, so I quickly locked it. I turned back into the room and my friend is stock still, staring at the floor by the bed. The Ouija board and the planchette are sitting perfectly centered on the floor. The planchette on no. And that would normally be fine, but we were sure that we had left the Ouija board in the middle of the bed with the planchette a good few feet away from it. I have never done a room cleansing and protection and closed a Ouija board so fast in all my life. We went on the rest of the night chain smoking, huddled in a corner, twitching and just trying to tell each other happy stories. Morning comes and of course everything is fine and normal and we laugh at ourselves because it was probably just the nerves and staying up too late. By the time the coffee was done brewing, we had all but convinced ourselves that everything that had happened was due to overactive imaginations. We go to the backyard to check the vegetable garden and hang out on the porch drinking coffee. We find some crushed tomato plants next to the tree by the porch. And then we find some cigarette butts in a spot behind the tree where you can see my bedroom window, but can't be seen in the dark. I guess it's a good thing we didn't go out at the witching hour. Coincidence, overactive imaginations, still freaks me out to this day. In a weird way, it was like the house was protecting us, like it knew that we shouldn't go outside. I've looked for years trying to find any shred of truth to the murder side story. I was able to find that the house was built in 1920, 
And although I can't find any paper evidence of specifically a murder side, a search of the county coroner's records do show gun murders and hanging sides in that town in the 1940s. In town, the story was common knowledge. Everybody in the family knew it. The neighbors knew it. Was it true? I don't know. I would think that there would be more records of something as sensational as that, especially in the early 1940s. However, while researching the history of the house, I did find another true tale that's even older, from a regional newspaper dated March 16th of 1896, which is coincidentally the same day I found the story. It read, killed a woman and himself. Thomas P was enraged because Minnie M scorned him. Thomas P killed Minnie M this morning at the farm half a mile north of here and then killed himself. Both were in the employ of Mrs. M. He was infatuated with her, but she gave him no encouragement. He threatened a few days ago that he would kill her. The farm mentioned in the article is where my house was built, and the street is named for the family that owned the farm. My story is about the house I lived in until I was five. My dad lived there after the divorce, and I visited often. It had been a family house on my dad's side of one kind or another since the late 1940s. It's also a house that's haunted. The whole family has ghost stories, most people more than one, and most of them involve the staircase that goes to the second floor. It's the first thing you see when you walk into the house. The staircase has been replaced six times, and I'm fairly sure that that's not normal in any house. Family legend says that the house, which was built in 1920, was the site of a murder side in the early 1940s. Supposedly, the owners right before my grandparents told them that the owners before them were a young man and his new wife who were hoping to start a new family. The story goes that the husband came home from work early one afternoon and went upstairs looking for his wife. One of the bedrooms has a door that opens directly to the top of the stairs, which was also my bedroom as a kid in the 70s. As he comes up the stairs, he's treated to an ever-expanding view of his wife and the neighbor guy having a good time in the guest bed. Instead of yelling or anything, he quietly goes downstairs into the back room, grabs his hunting rifle, and then goes back upstairs where he kills the wife and the neighbor. Then he calmly gets a length of rope from the garage and hangs himself from the second floor banister in the stairwell. The house sat empty for a while. The next family, the one selling the house to my grandparents, got the house for dirt cheap. They redid the stairwell, staircase number two, and supposedly lived there 18 months before deciding to sell. My grandparents didn't really think much of it, mostly because they were pregnant, had three kids, the house was cheap, and they were poor. They went on to have nine total kids, and every single one of my aunts and uncles has stories about ghosts in that house. I have over 40 cousins, and they all have stories about ghosts and unexplained events in the home. Most of the stories involve seeing a hanged man, or a dark shape in the stairwell, a young nervous woman on the second floor, or an older woman that tends to sleeping children. Some experiences involve strange occurrences, like furniture and items that move or break when no one else is in the room. Some of the stories are scary, some are nice, but everyone has at least one, and usually they have several. After graduating high school, I was in and out of college and in and out of jobs. For a short period of time, I lived in this house during a summer when I was between jobs. My grandfather and my dad technically lived there, but stayed with other family members and girlfriends and were almost never home. 
A friend of mine was with me on the night that some weird things happened. She didn't officially live there, but she was basically living with me. I had told her about all the ghost stories and paranormal stuff, and we decide to dig out my grandmother's old Ouija board, the same one that I have now, and try to contact the spirits. We get everything out, put our fingers on the planchette, and nothing happens. The planchette doesn't want to move. So we set the mood, get out the incense, light the candles, and nothing happens. By now, I'm bored. It's 3 a.m., it's summer in New York, and it's kind of stuffy and hot inside. So I decide that I want to go to the back porch where it's cooler. My friend agrees, and we get up, leave the board on the bed, and as we're grabbing shoes, we hear something fall off the bed. It's the planchette. We both jump up and then laugh because it was obviously on the edge and just fell, right? Except we were both pretty sure the planchette hadn't been anywhere near the edge and had in fact been in the very middle of the bed. We try and nervously shrug it off and then we're like, ooh, maybe it wants to talk to us. Being silly, we decide to ask one more question before we go out. This time, the planchette wants to move and starts circling as soon as our fingers touch it. Before we finish the question, what is your name, it goes to no. We laugh. Okay, all right, you don't want to tell us your name. How old were you when you died? Planchette slips quickly across the board to no. Fine, all right, all right, what message do you have for us? Again, it goes straight to no. Now I'm figuring by this point it's my friend pushing it, because this is not any weak tentative moving around the board. It's forceful, and she is known for kind of messing around. So I basically grab the planchette and half jokingly, half seriously, throw it next to her on the bed. I was a little bit miffed at her for pushing it around and not giving it a chance. Besides, if you're going to be so obviously pushing the planchette, you should at least make the answers interesting. I say, I'm done, that was fun, but let's go to the back porch and smoke. As soon as I stand up, we hear the sound of a door slamming downstairs so hard that the windows rattled from the force of it. There are only three doors downstairs. The ones to the front door and back room had been closed and locked for hours, and the bathroom door was a piece of crap that could barely close, let alone slam. My dad and my grandfather were out of state visiting relatives, so I knew it wasn't them coming home. Neither of us wanted to go check on what had made the noise, but we left the room and we went to see that the stairwell was oddly dark. It was like all the shadows had just collected there, like that part of the room was way darker than the rest. It was just so pitch black in that stairwell that I couldn't see beyond the first step of stairs. The rest of the landing is lit normally by some moonlight coming in the lone window on the second floor landing. But it just seemed as if that bit of light stopped at a wall as soon as it reached the stairs. The dark cloud in the stairwell seemed to move and shift a strange inky blackness that looked thick. At this point in time, the stairs are a wrought iron spiral staircase that my dad had put in. This was the fourth time the stairs had been replaced. They weren't very safe to climb down even when you could see. So I inch to the center of the room and pull the light switch so we can see what we're doing and not break our necks on the staircase. And of course, the light pole comes off in my hand. No light. I look to my friend, thinking, okay, the roiling pitch black shadows in this stairwell must be my imagination. She can probably see just fine, so I would just follow her down. But no, she's staring at the stairwell with wide eyes full of terror. She turns to me and says, why the hell is it so dark? At this point, I realize that she can see it too. So I push her back into the room and slam the door shut behind us. I had one of those push button locks, so I quickly locked it. I turned back into the room and my friend is stock still, 
staring at the floor by the bed. The Ouija board and the planchette are sitting perfectly centered on the floor. The planchette on no. And that would normally be fine, but we were sure that we had left the Ouija board in the middle of the bed with the planchette a good few feet away from it. I have never done a room cleansing and protection and closed a Ouija board so fast in all my life. We went on the rest of the night chain smoking, huddled in a corner, twitching and just trying to tell each other happy stories. Morning comes and of course everything is fine and normal and we laugh at ourselves because it was probably just the nerves and staying up too late. By the time the coffee was done brewing, we had all but convinced ourselves that everything that had happened was due to overactive imaginations. We go to the backyard to check the vegetable garden and hang out on the porch drinking coffee. We find some crushed tomato plants next to the tree by the porch. And then we find some cigarette butts in a spot behind the tree where you can see my bedroom window, but can't be seen in the dark. I guess it's a good thing we didn't go out at the witching hour. Coincidence? Overactive imaginations? Still freaks me out to this day. In a weird way, it was like the house was protecting us. Like it knew that we shouldn't go outside. I've looked for years trying to find any shred of truth to the murder side story. I was able to find that the house was built in 1920, and although I can't find any paper evidence of specifically a murder side, a search of the county coroner's records do show gun murders and hanging sides in that town in the 1940s. In town, the story was common knowledge. Everybody in the family knew it. The neighbors knew it. Was it true? I don't know. I would think that there would be more records of something as sensational as that, especially in the early 1940s. However, while researching the history of the house, I did find another true tale that's even older, from a regional newspaper dated March 16th of 1896, which is coincidentally the same day I found the story. It read, Killed a Woman and Himself, Thomas P. was enraged because Minnie M. scorned him. Thomas P. killed Minnie M. this morning at the farm half a mile north of here and then killed himself. Both were in the employ of Mrs. M. He was infatuated with her, but she gave him no encouragement. He threatened a few days ago that he would kill her. The farm mentioned in the article is where my house was built and the street is named for the family that owned the farm. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that someone had left the oven on, we each denied it, but we knew that someone had to have left it on because it was on. Looking back, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody even had food to put in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, and movements from out the corner of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting. However, myself and another were still not so convinced. It was soon only me that was left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing study, they looked up to see a face peering at them before vanishing. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling making tracks across the roof by the year's end, 
and one of my friend's girlfriends swore she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches that you need to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would send shivers down our spines any time we went in there. There was one night in particular which really scared me. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes telling myself it was just a dream and went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open and so were all the doors in my wardrobe and the guys had told me it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night. So many other things happened in that house, but this has gone on long enough. I just decided to tell this story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate without saying which house I lived in, and he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate, which a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior. When I told him what number it was, and how I knew, he almost fell out of his chair. At least I know I'm not alone. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. We all got out of the house unscathed but it really made believers out of all of us. My name is Jennifer and I live in California. And the reason that I'm telling this story is to tell about my trip to Disneyland specifically the Haunted Mansion ride. I had read so many stories about this ride that I was kind of getting scared of it. It's bad enough that it's dark in there, but I am partially blind. So combine that with only a third of an eye to really rely on, permanent shadows, blurry blobs, and creepy noises, totally scares me. I'm not one to be scared of serial killers or humans who are crazy but I'm terrified of the supernatural. Anything that's dead and is committed to following human beings for no apparent reason scares the cheese right out of me. A serial killer can kind of be dealt with one way or another by improving security at home or defending oneself one way or another, but the supernatural can't really be fought. So I get in line to ride the stupid attraction and then I remember all this crap that I had read and I'm like, Man, by the time I get inside the house, I'm terrified because it's super dark and there are lots of creepy sounds. I tell my friend that I'm seriously scared and she doesn't laugh. She just holds tight to my arm and assures me that everything will be okay. I say nothing else for the rest of the wait. We get on the doom buggy and start the ride. Then I say, well, at least I can't see anything and hopes that it will make the fear go away. Just then, I feel this weird pressure or touch on my left hand. It was like somebody was slowly and gently stroking my hand. I dismissed it as me either being paranoid or as being part of the attraction to scare you. But I'm not so sure, as it's only my second potentially paranormal experience. Has anybody else experienced anything like this? And what do you think? I've heard lots of Disneyland legends based on certain rides and lots of horrible things about it, but I've never really experienced any of it. And anyway, I just thought I would share. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, my dad moved into an old house, one of the oldest left standing in my town. Our town has a rich history with battles and rebellions. Through some research, I figured it was built for an earl back in the day. The house was split into two apartments. When he first moved in, I didn't experience a whole lot, just an overall feeling of strangeness there was a staircase that led to a solid wall. Hollow walls with no doors going into them. Certain rooms that were just freezing cold. 
It just always felt as if somebody was watching. After a few months, I experienced the first thing. What I thought was sleep paralysis. I had fallen asleep on the sofa watching TV. I woke up to feel somebody breathing on my cheek. I could clearly hear the breaths right next to me, and I was frozen. After what felt like an hour, I managed to move. And at that exact moment, a distorted face came flying out of the corner toward me before disappearing. Maybe a month after this, I woke up in bed and I could hear footsteps on the balcony outside my bedroom. I thought maybe somebody was trying to break in. It went on for maybe 10 minutes. I didn't investigate, but the next morning I asked my dad if he had heard anything, but he hadn't. We went outside to see if anything was disturbed, and there was a huge handprint, bigger than either of our hands, on the condensation on the balcony door. I freaked out, but my dad played it down. He's a massive skeptic. The next night, he heard somebody on his balcony and ran out to see who it was. As soon as he got outside, all of our bins under the balcony were fallen over, but no one was to be seen. Another day, I was in my bedroom. I had a guitar in the corner, and out of the blue, it made a noise, as if somebody had strummed the strings. There weren't any windows open, and it wasn't just a breeze or something. I ran, but my dad again tried to explain it away. The next day, he was in my room putting away clothes or something, and it happened again. He ignored it, and it happened again. He said something along the lines of, F off, I don't believe in ghosts. And he said that it sounded as if somebody hit the guitar, there was a bang and it fell over onto the floor. This was the first time he genuinely couldn't explain away what had happened. I think it actually rattled him a bit. A few weeks later, I got home from work at approximately 4 a.m. Nobody was home. I walked in, turned the three living room lights on and the TV, and turned the hall light on and went into the bathroom. I come back out and looked up from my phone and all the lights in the living room were off, and the TV. But the hall and bathroom light were still on. I instantly started texting my friend to come get me, when boom, all the lights turned back on, and the TV too, at top volume. I put it down to some electrical issue. I was naturally scared, but I tried to rationalize. Again, I fell asleep on the sofa, and I woke up to the door handle of the sitting room door, slowly turning. It was loud since it was an old house, and I got out of there. It took me a while to go back to the house after that. When I eventually did, I brought a friend to stay the night. We were sitting in the living room, and the neighbor in the other apartment came onto our landing, just outside the door, and started screaming. Like full belt, high-pitched screaming then just started loudly pacing back and forth on the landing, talking and chanting to himself. We couldn't figure out what he was saying, but it was absolutely terrifying. From speaking to my dad afterwards, he said that the neighbor had just started doing this one night a week or so prior, every single night. Numerous other events have happened. My dad's CD player turning itself on, leaving a room to come back and seeing a door that had been closed was now open, things going missing and appearing somewhere else, weird sounds at night. My dad has since moved from there, but everybody that I've talked to that has been in that house has mentioned that they just feel uneasy there, that there was something else there. I don't know, maybe it's all in my head. But I think something legitimate was happening in that house. A few years ago, I was a CNA, Certified Nursing Assistant, and I worked at a nursing home. I had a few encounters there, but nothing prepared me for everything that would happen 
when I started working at a hospice home. It's essentially where people go to die, people that are very sick and don't have a lot of time. The facility was amazing and worked quickly on getting people in. The point is a lot, and I mean a lot of people passed away in the building and a lot when I was working, which was from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I always opened the window in the resident's room after someone passed away, my way of feeling like the spirit wouldn't be trapped. No one else did this, unfortunately. On to the main point of the story. We have two wings of the building, and each wing has a huge linen closet, Tons of sheets, blankets, comforters, towels, washcloths, gowns, you name it. When you open the door, both walls are lined with racks filled with linen. You can walk down into the room a couple hundred feet and then turn to the right and it's a little area where extra stuff is stored. Things for the bed baths and hygiene things for the residents. You are completely hidden when you're in the area on the right. A resident woke up around midnight and wanted to get cleaned up, so I was going to give them a bed bath. I went into the linen closet and headed to the area on the right. I was grabbing some soap, toothbrush, toothpaste, a little basin, and other things. And that's when I heard the closet door open and close. We have one CNA and one RN, registered nurse, on each wing during the night shift. I figured it was the nurse or the CNA for the other side. Sometimes we grab each other if we need help. I then heard a female voice say, Hello? I said, I'm just grabbing stuff for a bath. Do you need help? I figured it was a nurse. I hear, I'm so cold. I can bring you a blanket, I said. Maybe I'll throw it in the dryer again like last week. I laughed. I turned around and headed to walk back down the main area of the linen closet, and nobody was there. I didn't hear the door open again, so no one left, and there's no place to hide. I then feel someone grab my shoulder. I scream and drop everything as I turn around so quickly, but no one's there. I ran out of there so fast. I tried to tell the nurse what was happening, but I wasn't making any sense until I calmed down. She stuck by my side the rest of the night, and I didn't go back into the linen closet that night. When they grabbed me, it felt like it touched my bare skin, and it was so cold. This was one instance of so many encounters that I experienced there. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there, and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. 
November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, the first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, Hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. 
A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in old house, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. When I was in the fourth through eighth grade, we moved into a century old farmhouse in Straw Town, Indiana. My father was in and out of the picture at this point in my life. So most of the time, it was just me, my mother, and two younger brothers living there. One was only a year younger than I was, and the youngest was zero to four during this time. The house always felt as though somebody was watching you or breathing down your neck. I'm just going to list things that occurred for brevity's sake. Number one, this happened to my mom. She started seeing this black shadow around the house. She said that she could smell him, like the body odor would be smelled in a specific spot, not directly next to it. As time went on, she started seeing the imprint of somebody sitting on the edge of her bed. Then one night, it laid across her legs and she woke up thrashing trying to get it off. Number two, these things happened to me. I had the upstairs bedroom connected to the attic door through a small closet. These were huge rooms. Things were the least crazy for me. I would just hear footsteps run up and down the stairs at night when my brothers would be in bed. The scariest thing that would happen to me was that often the door to the attic would swing open as though somebody had forced it and it would hit the wall then a cold presence would rush to my bedside. When I was 14, I started into a spiraling depression. I painted my walls blood red and I began to write poetry and things on my walls in this really aggressive handwriting. I have never felt or acted that way since. I have, however, had many instances of paranormal activity that have followed me throughout my life. Number three. One of my brothers had a bad. I only know fragments of his story, as what happened to him is something he'd rather forget. One night he was screaming in his room. We checked on him and he had been smacked across the face. We figured it was just him hitting himself in his sleep, but the handprint was upside down. It was impossible that he did it to himself. 15 years later, my mom told me that she found him crying on the stairs one night. He was reluctant to tell her why. But when pressed, he told her that he kept hearing voices, telling him to kill all of us. My mom understandably kept this from us. When I asked him about it, he was visibly upset and said that it stopped as soon as we moved from the house and he didn't want to talk about it. My youngest brother was two to three when he started saying weird stuff. He would talk about the boots walking around the house with no body attached. He'd also hear laughing whenever he would get near the basement steps. I remember the four of us kneeling and praying that this entity would leave us alone, but it didn't. We decided to leave after a morning when my mom and youngest brother were home alone. They were taking a nap. When the bed and dresser started violently shaking, there was no earthquake and no reason for it. They shook by themselves, and my mom described it as feeling as though she was being intimidated. We moved out. We were told by a neighbor that everybody that's ever moved into that house has moved out within a few months. It's empty now. I still drive by it, and I want to go confront whatever's there and get answers. The landlord is an old farmer that doesn't believe us. This has been the first time I've ever talked about it, really, at least publicly. Since I've moved on with my life, I've lived in several different houses. I've heard strange noises of objects moving in other rooms and deliberate knocking. 
Not super frequently, though. In one house, we had a painting of Delight Yourself in the Name of the Lord up in the dining room. We heard this crash one night and found it five feet to the right, blocking the bathroom entrance. We also could hear razors and shampoo bottles being tossed in the bathroom at that house. In another, I had two friends over playing poker in the kitchen. And as we were talking about a shelf that had come off the wall the night before, a plastic blender cup was chucked out of the pantry behind us and bounced off that exact wall. I don't know if something followed me from that house or if it's related at all, but it's been interesting. I was working out and I was on the phone with my dad and we were having a nice conversation. Then I heard this devilish scream. It literally sounded like some kind of demon or devil was screaming in my room. I heard it echo through my dad's line too, but he told me that he couldn't hear a thing. I was confused. I said, what do you mean you didn't hear it? And he said, I just didn't hear it. My stomach dropped. So I took out the butcher knife and started walking to my room. I know, stupid idea. I probably should have just ran out of the house until somebody came back, but I did what I could. And keep in mind, I was home alone and nobody could have saved me if something had come and popped up on me. I searched the room and there was absolutely nothing. I searched the other rooms as well, still nothing. I'm totally confused as to what happened. If anybody does know, Please tell me, because as of right now, I'm never entering that room again until I know what that was. Some years ago, my girlfriend and I were asked to watch somebody's house. They had an old sick dog and they wanted to go on a vacation. I had to study for exams, so I figured it would be a nice, calm place to do that. We were about 22 or 23 years old. The first day that we came in, we got some information about the house. Their kids slept downstairs, so we had to sleep upstairs in the loft. We had this hallway and then a door to the playroom and then another door to the loft so just one way in and one way out. The bathroom was downstairs next to the kids' room. The first thing that I didn't really like was a picture of their dead grandpa standing next to me on the drawer near the bed. I put him away in the drawer so I didn't have to see him every time I woke up. The evening came and we were searching for plates to eat. We couldn't find any plates. We checked the kitchen, yes, every drawer, like five times, Nothing to see. The next day, the first drawer I opened in the kitchen was full of plates. Kind of weird, but all right. The next night, the dog was barking like crazy. Every night, this dog started to bark at random hours. The next morning, random lights would be on all over the house. Then I went to check the aquarium to give some food to the fish there. Half of them were dead skeletons at the bottom. I mean, what the heck? Even if they had died overnight, there's no way that would happen so fast. She said there's got to be an explanation for this kind of thing, but we were already a little bit freaked out. The next night, we're going to the bathroom and just getting ready to go to sleep. Like every night, my girlfriend put her handbag and stuff in the kids' room because the cats couldn't get in there. We checked to make sure all the lights were out and we went to sleep. The next morning, the handbag was standing right next to the bed, right in front of the doorway. My girlfriend freaked out, and for me, that was it. I said I didn't want to stay. We had exams coming up, and I didn't want to deal with that stuff anymore. She stayed for the dog, but didn't want to sleep alone anymore, so her mom came to sleep at the house. After that, nothing more happened. 
We told the owners of the house, but they laughed really hard, and I think they thought we were either crazy or kidding. They said nothing like that has ever happened to them. I don't know. Maybe I pissed off Grandpa because I put him in a drawer. But, regardless, we really felt that somebody was messing with us in that house. So, when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large sensory house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom, and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems, where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV, except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me. So much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with, because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could send supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, 
hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me, and while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal, so I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard and I saw out of the corner of my eye, my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again, and the current residents have stayed there the longest. I bought the house that I'm living in a few years ago. It was recently renovated by the previous owner, who was in his 50s. I found out later, after talking to a neighbor, that the previous owner had passed away from sudden heart problems. Weird things have been happening again lately. The main thing is the fire alarms. There are about four or five smoke detectors dispersed around the house. One of them will go off randomly at like three in the morning, but it's a different one each time and it's only ever one. Sometimes it's the basement one. Last night, it was the one in the guest bedroom. This has happened probably 10 times in the last two years. The smoke alarms will just go off for a minute and then they'll just stop. I've checked the batteries. I've checked if it's the carbon monoxide alarm, everything, but nothing is wrong with them. They'll just randomly go off. But last night, it did something unusual. Usually, it's just a really loud beeping alarm. But last night, in between the beeps, it said, fire, fire, fire. That has never happened before, and I'm not even sure those alarms are programmed to do that. Some other things that I've had happen is that the lights will dim, 
the lamp will turn off and on by itself, and I've heard whistling that I can never find a source for. The fire alarm thing sucks, and it's very startling at 3 a.m. I'm not entirely sure, but I think I might be living in a haunted house. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in northern Maine, along the border of Canada. The house was a small two-story clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long, and sat in the middle of the dirt-floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then you crack the air vent just a tiny bit and the fire would smolder all night with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat source in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping the peeling paint and applying a fresh new coat. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away and found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse, with a lot of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off US Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down that road. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky, a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in the road. The house was a wreck, in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and on the porch. Much of the siding had been removed, exposing mylar backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs in the exterior wall. There was an old dented rusty pickup truck parked closest to the road where we sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown, and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light. A waving hand. There was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck, and he was slowly waving his arm, beckoning us toward him. He was a large, overweight man, late thirties to mid forties, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap-toothed smile and he stood there, still, except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there, watching us, beckoning, reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to me a cunning veneer of harmlessness, belied by a bleary, cold glint of greed, or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness.
I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three-bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms, and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night, I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first, I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again. Until last night. Around 12.30 to 1 in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night, since the very first, because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. I wanted to share some stories about my family's haunted house, so here goes. I'm 19 and I still live with my parents, along with my little sister, who's 14, and my little brother, who's 17. Many, many things have happened in this house, and it's gotten to the point where I feel safer at my boyfriend's house. We got this house when I was around 11. I would cry to my mom almost every night after getting out of the shower because while I would shower, I would hear somebody talking to me from the other side of the curtain. It got so bad that I eventually made my mom stay in the bathroom with me while I showered. A couple of years go by and nothing happens. When I started high school, that's when things started happening again, but worse. I would often hear things. Things would move around by themselves and nothing would ever be in the same spot where I had left it before. I told my parents about this, but they thought I was crazy for like two years. Then, things started happening to them as well. One morning, I woke up with a burning sensation on my leg. I had three upside-down K-shapes scratched into my leg. At first, I thought maybe somehow I had done it in my sleep, but they were perfectly aligned. Plus, at that time, I chewed on my nails, so I didn't really have any nails to scratch myself with. About two years ago, my little sister comes running into my room at 3.30, shaking. 
Once she got me awake, she told me that my mom was screaming. I go into her room and she's hysterical, crying her eyes out with the covers pulled all the way over her head and my dad comforting her. My mom is shaking and she's so scared she couldn't even talk. My dad left for work that morning around four and my mom couldn't sleep unless she had me in there with her. For days, she refused to tell me what happened, but then she finally did. She said that she had woken up and saw a rather short black silhouette standing next to my dad. She said the figure was all black, but she could feel how evil it was, and it had a sort of red-orange glow behind it. She was so scared, she wouldn't let me leave her alone in the house. In 2020, I met my boyfriend, and I had him over to the house for the first time. He ended up staying the night, but I didn't tell him about my house in fear of scaring him off. It's around two in the morning and my parents are asleep. My brother is at a friend's house and my little sister is in the dining room, painting. My boyfriend and I are in the brother's room because he has a PlayStation. I don't. I'm playing a game and he's watching me play, and I look over and he's not really paying attention. He's looking into the living room, and he looks very pale. I asked him if he was okay, what was wrong, and if he was feeling all right. Finally, I started shaking him because he wouldn't reply. Then he said, who's that standing in front of your parents' room? This freaked me out because I looked and nothing was there. I asked him to describe what he had seen. He said he was looking at exactly what my mom had said she saw a couple of years prior. A couple of months later, my boyfriend is in my room by himself, and my parents are outside on the porch talking. I go in to get him to come outside and go on a walk with us, but when I walk into my room, he's under the covers, and my nightstand is completely upside down. He's pale and shaking, and I ask him what happened. He explained he was on his phone waiting for me to come back, when everything on my nightstand flew off and then flipped over. I had glass bottles and a couple of miniature paintings on my nightstand, and there was broken glass everywhere. This was a couple of months after we got together, but there's so much more I could tell. It's already such a long story, but the point is, I don't feel safe here, and I don't know what to do or who to turn to. I don't know what's in my house, but it is definitely not friendly. Part of my mom's job is that she works in a school. She works with kids who have special needs. The preschool she works at is kind of notorious for being haunted. She told me that's what her coworkers would tell her from time to time. My mom has some experience when it comes to this kind of thing. Anyway, I decided I would share some of the things that happened at that school during the couple of years that she was there. She said that from time to time, somebody would knock on the door. She said she refused every single time to open it herself. She always leaves it unlocked and says that she's inside. Usually it's one of her coworkers, but she says sometimes there will be a knock and she would say, come in, and nothing would happen. In the same room during her lunch break, she and another teacher were on her laptop looking to buy a gift for her husband. I should clarify it's for her coworker's husband and it was her coworker's computer. When they were looking, my mom said something about her coworker's husband, and the computer all of a sudden, on max volume, played a song that mentioned her coworker's husband's first name. It didn't really scare them. My mom told me they kind of laughed it off, and they ended up buying a speaker. Now, this speaker was gifted to said husband, and within the first week, it was thrown out. The story was that her husband had it next to him one day at his job, and out of nowhere, just like the Mac laptop, the speaker played something eerie. I forget exactly what it was, but my mom told me that the speaker wasn't connected to anything at the time and was actually turned off. He threw it out pretty fast, so, so much for a surprise anniversary present. 
This one morning, the school had a delayed opening during a perfect spring day. They thought some kid had broken into the school and trashed a couple of rooms. The preschool has cameras, and that was the first thing they checked, but sure enough, nobody had broken in. The camera in my mom's room showed chairs being slid out from tables. Then it showed somebody in the room tossing books off the shelves. This was captured sometime during the night. She said that the lights were flickering every once in a while too, and other classrooms had the same thing happen. This one room, I guess, was the staff conference room, and it didn't have any cameras inside. My mom told me that the janitor said when he walked in, all of the chairs were pushed out and facing random directions. There was a police report, but the police couldn't find any solid evidence of a break-in. They suspected that somebody stayed in the building while it was open, and waited until it closed and then pulled some massive prank. The thing that bothers me, though, is that I know teachers lock their classroom doors when they leave. And how would any person have gotten in without tripping an alarm? In any event, we're pretty sure that school is haunted. My parents have owned a tavern and restaurant for 14 years in my small town. My father is somebody who likes to start new projects and is a well-known person in our town. One day he was contacted by the local realtor to offer him a private showing of a historic hotel that had been up for sale. This hotel had been around for decades and went from a hotel to a restaurant to a bar with little success. Everyone who had ever owned it before had put it back on the market within a year. The bank had the title now, and the realtor told my father, if you don't buy it and fix it up, they plan on ripping it down. A lot of people in the town thought that the only person who could save it was my father, so he bought the hotel. My parents kept the downstairs bar and renovated the upstairs for apartments. That's when odd things began to happen. My father would come home almost every night with the camera footage to show my mom and I. The footage always showed an empty pool room with small random orbs floating in the foreground. My father's a believer in the paranormal, but my mother is not, so she and I both chalked it up to bugs and dust. Although I will agree, the way these orbs zigzagged around the room was weird. It still seemed like nothing though. A month goes by and my father comes home early on a Sunday from working down at the hotel. He walked into the house spooked, something that my father rarely is. He told us how he was behind the bar checking on receipts from the night before when he heard footsteps approaching from the hallway entrance. We don't open on Sunday. But if somebody that my dad knew saw his truck in the parking lot, they would just walk in to see him. So at first, he didn't find the footsteps odd at all. Without looking up from his receipts, he called out, We aren't open, but give me a second. He heard the footsteps enter the bar room and take six more steps toward him before stopping. Taking another second to finish going over last night's shift, he looks up and peers around the wooden support beam, but there's nobody there. There was nobody anywhere. He said he got out of there so fast he doesn't even remember locking the door behind him. My mom obviously thinks he's crazy, but I'm freaked out. That place had always kind of given me the creeps, but my father confirming my fears made me never step foot in that building again. Two days ago, my mom had an experience there that sent her out the door faster than my dad. She was in the bar room before opening hours, collecting the shift money from the night before. She wasn't in there for more than five minutes before she started to hear the faint sound of music coming from the entrance hallway. She said that she ignored it for a while, assuming it was one of the tenants upstairs. After collecting the money, she went to leave and the music began to get louder. She said it sounded like old waltz music, piano-based, and was clear as day. The farther she walked down the hall toward the bathrooms, the more prominent the noise became. As she stepped in front of the women's room, she said it sounded like someone was in there playing the music on their phone. 
By this time, my mom was sufficiently freaked out and ran out of rational reasoning behind what it could be. Just as she was about to open the door, she said that she heard the water turn on and off twice before running out of the building. In the parking lot, she called my dad to come down, certain somebody had to be in there with her. But when he came down to check it out, nobody was there. Now my mom is a believer and we are both properly terrified of that old creepy hotel. Update. The bar and hotel burnt down last week. The cause was listed as undetermined. It's a total loss. Up until the age of 18, I lived in a modest suburban home on the East Coast with my parents and my younger brother. While the home wasn't too old, it was built in the 70s, the house was located less than a quarter mile away from an older cemetery, which is something I have recently considered as an explanation for the events that occurred there. For as long as I can remember, it always felt as if some dark presence was watching me in my house. At night, I would wrap myself in so many blankets that I could barely breathe, only leaving a small hole to peer through into my room. We all lived on the second story too, yet most of the activity seemed to occur in my room and my brother's. The overwhelming fear I experienced almost daily really began when I was seven or eight. At that point, I would often wake up to shadowy figures standing over my bed and even saw my door open and close during the night. However, as I got older, these events worsened. One night, I woke up to a small shadow figure the size of a child, rocking in a chair directly across from my bed. I must have stared at that figure for about an hour until I had the courage to turn the light on. Of course, when I did, it was gone, but my chair was left rocking in its place my window wide open, which was strange because it was winter and I definitely didn't open it, and my books were knocked off my shelf. I began telling my parents what had been happening to me, and they barely uttered a word. My brother had been behaving strangely at this time as well, speaking to the walls, and angrily yelling at my mom whenever she tried to put away his toys at night. He eventually told my parents that he had to leave his toys out, or else the big one and the little one would get mad. He also said that the little one would pull on his toes at night if he didn't do what it said. When my parents finally heard this explanation, they then disclosed what else had been occurring to them. When my mom was alone, her hair would frequently get yanked from behind, or she would hear whispering voices. She'd seen objects such as a bowl fly 10 feet across the room and smash into a wall. While we were not being physically injured, it was clear that these spirits were trying to torment us. At night, we would all hear noises throughout the house. Sometimes it would be a cabinet closing or dishes clashing together. Other times, it would be full-on footsteps stomping around. It had gotten to the point where my parents hired paranormal investigators to look into the house. From what I know, they had picked up slight audible recordings in both my room and theirs. Nothing too major, yet it appeared as if some unexplained activity was spiking their detectors. I'll also add that my family is not religious, so we never hired a priest or any other religious organization to help us ward off any potential bad spirits. Anyway, after the investigation, my mom was so fed up that she'd begun considering selling the house. Then, all of a sudden, all the activity almost immediately stopped. No sounds at night no objects flying, and my brother no longer saw the big one and the little one. Things really did seem to die down until I was about 12, right after my parents divorced. I split my time between that house, my dad's, and my new house, my mom's. I still hadn't experienced anything like I did when I was younger, but something seriously freaked me out whenever I had been home alone there. I always felt like I was being watched. I'm currently living full-time at my mom's house now, but I just can't wrap my mind around what happened to me as a kid. I'd also like to note that strange things have now been happening at my mom's. I'm not sure if I'm just sensitive to these types of paranormal activity, 
but I just can't explain why. My boyfriend doesn't believe a word of this story, but oh well. I kind of think the people don't believe in this stuff until it happens to them. Anyway, thanks for listening to my story. I would love to hear from anyone else who has similar paranormal experiences. Does anyone think that being haunted as a child could make someone more susceptible to future activity? Let me know. For the first few months after my kids and I moved into our house, the house seemed pretty normal. But then one night, my son came screaming down the stairs in what I would call a night terror. I assume he woke up from a nightmare and it just kept going. He finally took a breath and said, I was sleepwalking, I'm okay, and went back up to his room. Then the weirdness started. One night, I was down in the basement doing laundry, and I heard a small child's voice behind me say, Hi there. When I turned around, no one was there. At that point, we started finding toys in the basement in obscure places. My first thought was that the children who lived there before had hidden them in the crevices in the walls. Then one day, I noticed a box of old marbles appeared where I had just cleaned. None of the toys belonged to my kids. I also set up a cheap dollar store alarm system around the office area so that I knew when the kids would sneak into the office to try to find birthday and Christmas presents. Little stinkers. They did it often. One day when I was in the bathroom, the alarm went off. I yelled from the bathroom, Hey, get out of my office! Since my son and I were the only ones home, I heard him yell from upstairs, I'm not in your office. As time went by, we could hear a piano playing at night that I thought might be the neighbors, and sometimes the lights and ceiling fan would go on and off. I blamed old lighting. The front door would sometimes open if not double locked. I told the woman who owned the home before the new landlords bought it as our kids were friends. She told me the reason why she put the double lock on the door is that somebody would open the door at night, and the reason she finally sold the house was because of all the weirdness surrounding it, including the piano. After that, we started looking for another place to live. It was during this time that really strange stuff started happening. My kids would feel like they were getting pushed up the stairs when going up. And then, one night, while my son was asleep in his room, he heard an old woman's raspy voice whisper from the closet, saying, I'm going to kill you. The kids would see shadows of figures going from our back porch area to a small building that belonged to the old house next door that was supposedly a candy store that burnt up inside years before, but the outside remained undamaged. At this point, we moved. A few years ago, my mom went on a solo road trip. She doesn't usually like to travel alone, but I was in college and she wanted to visit some family a few states over. The trip went well, up until the last night on her drive back home. She had booked a room in a B&B &B that looked really nice online, but everything went off the rails when she actually arrived, which I witnessed since I was on the phone FaceTiming her, being informed with texts and photos and so on, for almost her entire night. When she pulled up to the house, it was totally dark. There were no lights on inside, and it seemed almost deserted. When she called the B&B &B to say that she had arrived, she was told to take a key from under the doormat and unlock the door herself, as the innkeeper had been caught away in an emergency, and she would be the only one there for the night. She was already a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but went inside anyway, since she had already paid the fee and didn't have anywhere else to stay. The interior was old-timey looking, with velvet drapes, thick dusty carpets, 
shelves full of photos and trinkets, and weirdest of all, many decorative plates with babies and children painted on them all over the walls. My mom locked the door behind her and went upstairs quite quickly since she was feeling scared. Upstairs was worse though, with the continued vintage furnishings and the unfortunate addition of about 15 ceramic dolls in each room, arranged on the beds and propped up on the tables and shelves. At this point, my mom was really freaked out, but kept trying to convince herself that there wasn't actually anything scary about the inn, or the dolls, or anything else there. So she picked a room and started trying to go to bed. She did find herself turning the dolls around in her room so that they faced the wall, even though she's usually a stark disbeliever in anything paranormal. That's when everything got really strange. She started hearing sounds all over the house, very human-like sounds. It started with creaking, then footsteps, and then whispering. My mom was overtaken with fear in a way that she had never experienced before. She found herself frozen in place, where she quite literally couldn't move, whilst hearing more and more activity. The sounds eventually escalated to screaming, crashing, and banging sounds from all over the house. After a few minutes, my mom managed to shake herself from her paralysis and realized that she needed to get out as fast as she could. She was so terrified that she actually tried climbing out of the window on the second story, but the roof below was too steep and she had to climb back inside. Then she took a fireplace poker, since she said she didn't know if the noise was from some robbers or something, gathered up her stuff, and ran into the hallway and down the stairs. She was quite shocked to see that everything was exactly as it had been when she came in. Except for one thing. A single one of the baby plates had fallen from the wall and shattered on the floor. There were no people in the house. The door wasn't bashed in. All the furniture was in the same dusty spots as before. She booked it for the door, threw it open, dropped the house key somewhere in the front yard, and drove away. She had never been more afraid in her entire life, and had never been less sure in her opinion that ghosts were fake. She drove around the town for a while and ended up in a Motel 6, where she probably slept for 45 minutes, and then came home. Unfortunately for her, though, that isn't where the story ends. She had been looking forward to arriving home so that she could finally be done with the whole frightening occurrence, maybe get some sleep, and watch some reality TV that had been recorded while she was gone. What she didn't account for was the ghostly hitchhiker that seemed to have followed her back. That first night home, she fell asleep on the couch with the TV on. Around 2 a.m., the TV turned off on its own, and she woke up suddenly to hear loud footsteps running through the living room. She lives totally alone in a standalone house. Weird things continued to happen for about two to three months, including a constant problem with the TV turning on and off, changing volume, or changing the channel by itself. She would hear voices, screams, and footsteps throughout the house, and would often wake up to have items in the kitchen or living room moved around, with no explanation, and in odd ways. The most notable was when the toaster was mysteriously moved to the top of the fridge one night. Fortunately, my mom really dedicated herself to 100% ignoring the ghost and trying to avoid feeding negative or scared energy into it, and after a few months, it all went away. She felt like she knew for sure, though, that it was a ghost, and that it latched onto her that night at the inn. She certainly isn't much of a skeptic anymore. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Etal, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. 
My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm all right with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. In this story, Reddit user Pineapple Juice tells us some strange tales about the house she grew up in. Here's the story. So back when I was about to start second grade, me, my mom, and my sister had to move to the next town over because my sister had gotten into a fight. This was the town my mom grew up in and where my grandparents lived. I don't know why, but my mom kept on choosing the much older houses in the town, like before 1900s old. I personally didn't care, until we got to the house. I remember the absolute nervousness I felt when I walked into the house. I felt like I was being watched, and I absolutely hated it. When we got to what was going to be my room, I felt decent, I guess. I stayed in there for most of the tour, I believe. Maybe I was taking in my surroundings, but I remember that I liked the walls, and before I left, I waved and said goodbye. I felt as though I had to say it. When we were leaving, we had to drive across the front, and in the second attic, there was a window on every side of the house. There was this girl who was translucent and very old-timey looking. She was gray, but where her eyes were supposed to be were a dark gray, and what I could only assume was blood dripping down her face. Well, once we moved in, I remember that this is where my talking habit I have yet to break comes in. I would just talk and talk for hours. I would explain what I was watching for absolutely no reason, even when nobody was there. Well, one night after we got completely moved in, I decided to knock on the floor. I got a knock back, and I remember that it made me feel not so lonely. This happened until I was a solid 10 years old, and I think that's where everything began to go downhill. That's where everything started. The feeling of being watched intensified. I never felt alone. When I was about nine and in the third grade, I went to sleep at a decent time. I never really had before. I woke up facing away from the door. 
It was odd, and I felt eyes practically burning into my back. I turned, and guess who I saw? The little girl. She couldn't have been much older than me at the time. I remember my fear, how I felt, how her not eyes followed me. Eventually, I got the courage to walk past her and into my sister's room. She told me that I was dreaming and that I should go back to bed. And when I got back to my room, she was gone. But this is when the activity really began. I would see a female and a male shadow person. I brushed it off at first. I thought I was just crazy. So I would just move past it and stop worrying about it. I swear that little girl played with me. Dolls, superheroes, outside, all of it. No matter where I was, no matter how I was playing or what I was playing with, there she was, messing with things, playing alongside. I swear looking back that I could hear a woman's hum sometimes whenever I would try to sleep. We'll get this. My sister's now husband, at the time boyfriend, slept in my room while I was at my grandparents, and he supposedly saw the little girl. And once my sister heard the story, she was like, oh my gosh, my sister wasn't lying. And her boyfriend was like, that is weird. My sister always hated going past my room to the bathroom, but like everything else, we just moved past it. My godbrother, who's about two years older than me, saw a little boy with me that I couldn't see. Well, one time we were joking around with some fake Ouija board on my phone, and it led us to what we called the front room. I kid you not, there was a little boy who was exactly the same as the little girl in our window, who just smiled at us and waved. We got out of there. I remember that any time I felt sad, I knew I wasn't alone. Any time something was wrong, I always felt safe. I felt loved. But I know that right before I left the house, right up until I was gone at 11, maybe 12 years old, I would always stop if I saw a shadow or a figure. I'd go back to where they were and wave a hello before I continued. Before my mom and I moved out, because my sister's a grown woman now, I knocked on the floor one last time, and I got a slight tap. And just then, I said goodbye one last time before we moved out. That house had a lot more things happen to it as well. For instance, the old owner once came by to check it out and ask questions, but nobody remembers the guy before us coming to the house. I remember him vividly. All in all, the house I grew up in was very haunted. I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time, though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room, which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? A 
I started going to a new school in the second grade. The cafeteria was downstairs in the basement, and then there was a long, empty hallway that led to the two bathrooms. I remember the first time I went to the bathroom there. Nobody told me it was haunted, so on the first day of second grade, I ventured down the hall to go to the bathroom. As I made my way toward it, I kept hearing this noise. It was like, ooh, ooh, over and over. When I approached the doorway, so much negative energy hit me that I knew not to go in there. I ran back to the cafeteria, told some girls about it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's haunted. We were all terrified of this bathroom. The boys said that their bathroom was fine, but that the girls' bathroom down there also freaked them out, even to be near it. It got so bad that we had to have the principal come and talk to our class about it. Everyone knew it was haunted. Flash forward to third grade. It was Halloween, and I was the first student in the classroom. Every Halloween, we had a parade outside where we would all march around in our costumes. I began putting my costume on over my clothes and I noticed a piece of paper folded up on my desk. It caught my eye. I don't know how to describe it, but it was folded strangely. I picked it up, unfolded it, and in a faint handwriting was, if you dare go to the bathrooms downstairs, I'll kill you. I can't make this up. I was the first student in the classroom. The previous day, I had left school in line with everyone else. Once more kids came into the classroom, I told my friends and they were more scared than I was. They made me tell the teacher. You could tell that she thought it was odd, but she crumpled up the paper and threw it away. And that's the last time I saw it. I went in the bathroom again, but only in large groups. We used to have a thing called field day where we played outside all day at the end of the school year. One day on a field day, about 10 other girls and I had to go to the bathroom. So we all teamed up and went to the one downstairs. I remember leaning up against the wall and feeling and hearing something. It was like somebody was banging on the wall with an ax. We all heard it and it was uncomfortably loud. I also have to add that no one ever went into the last stall, but this day a girl did. I mean, it had cobwebs all over it and everything. Literally nobody would use it. Then one night I was at the school for a concert. This was toward the end of fifth grade, so I was brave enough to go there by myself. I was kind of curious. I went down to the hall and as usual, that ooh, sound could be heard a mile away. I went into the bathroom, but I just kind of stood around. I didn't actually go into a stall or anything. Suddenly, I just got scared and I ran toward the door, but I was rather surprised when I bumped into a strange lady with long gray hair, a scarf partially covering her head and face. I just brushed by her and ran. Also, the lights have turned off when I was in that bathroom. The energy in there is just insane. You just feel in danger. Girls would cry and sob because they didn't want to have to use that bathroom. The loud, overwhelming sound and the occasional banging noises, that unused last stall, the scratches on the mirror, the old poster on the wall, all of it was just creepy. That note might have been a prank, but that bathroom is haunted. We bought a house intending to use it as our second home, but after just a few months, we decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Long story short, we're pretty sure it's haunted. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are both aware of the claims and have made an informed decision to purchase it anyway. They probably think I'm nuts. The home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. 
We've gotten an air quality test done in the home, and both my husband and I have both received physical examinations. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We bought our winter home last year. Originally, we're from Canada, but we've spent the majority of the last couple of years between the United States and, more recently, Costa Rica. My first experience there was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom. When you enter the room, if you go to the left, you'll go toward the bathroom. If you go to the right, you'll end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon, while I was showering, I watched my husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. That's when I saw my husband enter the room again with the same glass of lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked him if he had re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said no. He'd only ever come into the bedroom once and that he'd been there the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed that he saw me leave the kitchen and walk toward the mudroom. He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty. I had been out for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car scraping on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block, and every time he parks the car, you can hear this distinct dragging sound of metal on the driveway. Whenever I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard this sound, unlocked the door, and he isn't home. We've both heard whistling sounds that we can't explain, that stop once we acknowledge it. I guess it could just be the vents, but for the last three weeks, our thermostat hasn't been working, and we still hear it. There have been other trivial occurrences. Once I woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. We also have one of those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those keep going off on their own too and opening up. I understand that with modern upgrades, there are going to be some malfunctions. So I put those experiences under the questionable category, but there have still been quite a lot of them. We've spent the past week packing our things. We're one of those people that just don't store anything in the garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that we have in there is the water softener tank, and that's it. So one night, the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police, and of course, the neighborhood security also comes by, just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of that house three days before closing. We couldn't bear another day there. The neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I told her that I had no idea what she was talking about, because we don't even live there. I know this sounds insane, but we have lived in so many houses, and we've never experienced anything like this. Even though our house was built in 2019, it was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that was built somewhere in the 60s, I think. So who knows what we might have inherited from that. I'm a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts, and I've had a handful of experiences but I've never experienced anything at that building before, until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor, from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. 
Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m. and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing with the light shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open, and I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m., and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night just in case I need to go back into a room. I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finished the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed, especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times, not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door. No knobs or levers to turn. But the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in, when suddenly the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped, and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room 
certain that nobody's actually in there. But just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully, and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. I must have spent 10 minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut, and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms, and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights it's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come, so I did just that. I turned to look, and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure shaped like a person walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again. But I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building. But I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late. And there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall around the corner and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul, no people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, but unfortunately, I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights, other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes. But who really knows for sure if those are spirits? They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before. But she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see, 
and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bull. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention. Almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts. But up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted, and maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here.